Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to Powering Net Zero. I'm Joanne Wade. I'm the Chief Strategic Advisor at the Association for Decentralised Energy in the UK, and I'm also a Fellow and Member of Council at the Energy Institute. It's lovely to welcome you all to our webinar today, which is designed to discuss ways in which clean electricity and electrification are going to be essential in reducing global emissions to net zero. So for those of you who might not know us, the Energy Institute is an independent network of professionals spanning the whole energy system. By convening and facilitating debate, we bring together expertise so that energy can be better understood, better managed and better valued. We articulate the voice of energy experts, taking the know-how of around 20,000 members and 200 companies from around 120 countries and taking it to the heart of the public debate. We're an independent, not-for-profit, safe space for evidence-based collaboration, and we aim to be an honest broker between industry, academia, and policymakers. The Energy Institute is here for anybody who wants to better understand or contribute to the extraordinary energy system on which we all depend. If you're not already familiar with our work, I do encourage you to visit our website, where you can learn more about the technical work of our Knowledge Centre, about our annual Energy Barometer Survey that communicates the views of energy sector professionals to a wide audience, and of course, to understand how you can join us and become a member and become one of us. So before I start the proceedings in full today, um, I really would like to take the opportunity to thank the Energy Institute's knowledge partner, IBM, and also our conference sponsors, Accenture, EDF Renewables, and Hitachi ABB Power Grids. Without them, today wouldn't have been possible. So what have we got on today? Well, we've got sessions on what a net zero energy system could look like, on how demand for energy services might be different in a net zero future. What do energy consumers think about the upcoming transition? What elements of the supply system are going to be there in future? And also, how do we take a whole energy system approach and look at the system in an integrated way? Now, we've scheduled plenty of breaks in for you. Um, you can use them to network with other delegates through the online platform. You can grab a coffee. And of course, if you feel like it, you can jog, jog up and down your stairs a few times to you know, reinvigorate and refocus yourself. We'll be finishing at 4.30 this afternoon, UK time. And if there's anything else you want to know about what's going on today, please do refer to the online program for all the latest information on the sessions and the speakers. We really would like to encourage you to ask questions throughout the conference. Um, you don't need to wait until a specific Q&A session to do so. You can do it at any time. Uh, you'll notice that your microphone is muted and your camera's off. That's to make sure that this runs as smoothly as it possibly can. So if you want to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A window that you can see, you can access through the bottom of your screen. Please use the Q&A, not the chat, because those of us who are moderating sessions will be looking at the Q&A to, uh, to pose questions to our speakers. Also, if you put a question in there, um, other people who see it and like it can upvote it so that it really brings it to the attention of the moderators. We will do our absolute best to answer as many questions as we can during the live session. And we've also invited our speakers, once they finish their session, if they want to go into the Q&A and answer in writing some other questions, they're perfectly welcome to. Today's conference is being recorded and you'll be sent a link afterwards so that you can re-watch the best bits or show it to your friends. Um, so please note, therefore, this is not Chatham House rules. You are very welcome to quote anything you hear today and say who said it. So it really is a very exciting time for our sector, isn't it? Achieving net zero is non-negotiable and it's gonna need all of us to change. As energy consumers, we're going to be asked to be more proactive, offering our electric vehicles as system-linked storage, learning new ways to optimally heat our living and working spaces. You know, some of these new technologies or even not so new technologies we're introducing like heat pumps, can efficiently and effectively provide what we need, but only if we learn how to use them properly. As energy producers, we'll be challenged to take risks with new technologies, whilst at the same time maintaining exceptional levels of service delivery. The best solution for the future energy system may well include both millions of active prosumers around the world and, at the other end of the scale, super scale offshore wind farms. And of course, the range of technologies at various scales in between. 
but how are we to develop the technical and regulatory systems that ensure that actors at all these very different scales have got an equitable chance to participate in our energy markets? How do we develop the systems that ensure that this new world delivers better energy services for all consumers? Decarbonisation through electrification can offer us the opportunity to improve whole system efficiency. It also offers the challenge of managing an increasingly complex system of intermittent distributed generation, new patterns of demand that present more stresses to the system, but also potentially more flexibility and storage at transmission, distribution and consumer scales. The transition that we're aiming for is going to require major capital investment, major financing for that, not least in emerging economies. And the business case for that investment is not only to ensure adequate returns for investors, but also to ensure that everyone has access to affordable energy services that support their fundamental needs. And this just transition that we're looking for also needs to involve ensuring that we've got skilled supply chains with high quality, attractive jobs, both for people who are moving from high carbon energy sectors and also for those who we're newly welcoming into our industry. Today's sessions are going to offer insight into these and I hope many other relevant issues. And so I think it's time to get on with it. I'm excited to see what everybody else has to say. I don't think you need to hear any more from me. So um, without further ado, I'd be delighted now to introduce our first speaker, Tom House. Tom is Head of Energy Environment Division at the International Energy Agency, and he's previously held positions in the Australian, the UK, the EU government, so he's got a wealth of experience to draw on. And today he's going to offer us his view of what a net zero energy system will look like, and also how do we get from here to there? So Tom, over to you. Thanks, Joanne. Good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. And thanks very much for the chance to be here today. I uh, hope my sheet screen sharing is, is working well. Um, and uh, to start with, um, let's. Uh, sorry, my screen is playing up. Um, let me start with a giving you an overall picture of, of, of what the IEA considers to be the, the, the pathway to, to, to net zero by 2050. It's, uh, it's on everyone's lips these days. Um, and certainly the, the, the COP discussions are, are building up to, to more and more declarations of, of, uh, of taking net, net zero objectives seriously. Um, but what might it actually mean? Well, to turn to first to the, to the look of what, uh, what total final energy consumption looks like, um, there's two big messages that come out. One is the, the fairly in, intuitive reduction in the use of, of, of fossil fuels. And here you see the top half of the graph is a reduction in the use of, of oil, uh, of gas as final uh, final energies uh, across all sectors, across the, the industrial, transport, in buildings and so on. And the other key thing which uh, is has emerged from uh, everyone's analysis, I think it's a fairly consensual opinion of the growing electrification of our energy consumption. So you see in the bottom half of this graph, the growth in electricity use. Uh, and again, that's being picked up in our heating systems and moving away from fossil fuels to heating systems. Uh, in buildings, uh, the growth of electric cars in, in transport, uh, and the growing use of electricity in, in industry. So great trends there. Um, and within the electricity sector, of course, the, the growth is dominated by renewable electricity electricity, um, and uh, the decline, decline in fossil fuel consumption. So that's a, a snapshot picture of, of what happens to our fuel consumption over the decades as we build up to a net zero by 2050. All of that has major um, cost and, and investment implications. So the next thing to look at is quite what that means in terms of the, 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 the capital we need to invest in the energy sector. Uh, again, across all, all, all sectors, all, all aspects of, of buildings and industry and so on. And here in this graph, you see where we are today, the, the recent trends of, of annual capital investment in energy and what that needs to do over the coming decades for us to reach uh, to reach net zero. So clearly there's a, there's a huge jump in investment needed um, across all the different sectors. Largely this is driven by, by the fact that renewable energy is more capital intensive uh, than traditional forms of energy investment. So there's 
much more significant upfront capital costs to, to cope with and then lower operating costs thereafter. But uh, the, the, this has major implications for the way we, we finance our energy system. Uh, there's a growth, there's a role for, for, for private, for, for public sector investments. And clearly there's been major stimulus uh, in the energy sector from governments around the world. But a large chunk of this will be uh, the firms around the table today uh, who are having to invest in their own, uh, own energy consumption uh, to build the products and the equipment and the technology for energy consumption in buildings and industry across the economy. So major implications for investment. So these are the, the big pictures of, of major jumps of giant strides. And uh, we need to get a start to feel for whether governments are buying into this, to whether uh, everyone is around the same table, everyone is starting to talk the same talk. And I would say that we're, we're on our way there. We're not yet there, but we're on our way there. So if you look here, this is a story of, of where governments stand in terms of their, their agreements under the, the, the COP arrangements, under the Paris Agreement arrangements. Now, practically every country in the world signed up to the Paris Agreement. And we have here uh, about 109, over 190 uh, uh, NDCs. NDCs are the nationally determined contributions. These are the government's commitments of what they intend to do to address climate change and comply with, with the Paris Agreement. So practically every country has offered an initial uh, NDC, a nationally determined contribution. But in terms of updating those and increasing the ambition, there's a, a major drop. Then when it comes to the countries who've actually gone to to focus on net zero emissions uh, and make pledges to deliver on net zero, uh, the numbers shorter still. Uh, the numbers in terms of preparing a, a long-term strategy consistent with all of this are lower. And then when you look at those who are actually putting net zero into national laws, the numbers are lower still. So uh, we've got a lot of uh, interest, um, but uh, as you get into the detail, as you look from the the, the broad commitments to the net zero commitments to the net zero laws, um, we've still got some work to do. Hopefully every government is, is focusing on this uh, in these, these days so that when they come to, to Glasgow, they'll be able to make some uh, pleasing, ambitious and strong announcements in favor of, of net zero goals. Um, and the IEA has been mapping these, these out at, at national and regional levels to show what's, what's what's possible, what, what we, we can do, and indeed giving a, a feel for what are the actual measures that governments and private sector and citizens can actually take. So we also put forward this in our, in our net zero report of, of, of uh, earlier this year, saying that there are many milestones that governments can introduce to, to make credible their, their goals and their, their pledges. And, and these can start as of today, basically. Um, across any sector you care to name, whether it's buildings, industry, the electricity sector for sure, um, there are major efforts we can introduce in terms of changing the, the, the uh, appliances we use, making more use of electric appliances, making more use of energy efficient appliances, changing our building materials, our building uh, rules, uh, and uh, electrifying transport. So in every sector, there are measures we can be taking from today on to ensure that all of this happens. Now, yes, all of this will need major investments, but there's also the upside. And I guess a lot of the speakers around the table today will also talk of this upside, um, by which I mean the, the economic opportunities, the, the new industries that we're developing, the new business models that, are, uh, that we need from, from first movers, and the jobs that get created with all of this. And uh, jobs, of course, are a particular concern to government. So we explored what this might look like. On the one hand, we acknowledge that there's the, the decline in, in jobs in the traditional high carbon sectors, that's, that's, uh, that's inevitable, um, but there's lots of things we can be doing to help, help those sectors transition or help the, the workers in those, session, in those sectors transition. And at the same time, there are, there are major job opportunities and, and growth and economic opportunities for businesses in the sectors that are expected to grow in the, uh, in the electricity sector in particular, uh, whether that's in infrastructure or in generation, uh, on the bioenergy side, um, but in, in all of these areas, there's, there's uh, a net growth uh, across, across the economies. So that's my opening uh, story to set the scene for, for today. Uh, net zero uh, ambitions are perfectly feasible. They can be mapped out at a global, at a regional, at the government level. 
Um, there's major implications for the, for the financing and for the investment needs of the energy sector in all of this. And our financial models are also going to have to adapt. And that will be another thing that gets picked up and discussed uh, in great depth in, in Glasgow. And we need the government commitments to make this all credible as far as industry is concerned. Industry will move when it feels that uh, the carbon prices are going to be sending the right signals, when the, the government frameworks, the regulatory frameworks, the administrative regimes are all supportive of undertaking this energy transition. And so that's something that governments need to provide through their, their planning, through their strategies, and through their laws. And with that, we get major change and we get major job opportunities and growth as well. I think I leave it there. I'm happy to take questions, but I hope I help set the scene for the discussions in today's panel. Thanks very much. Tom, thank you very much. Um, if I can encourage our delegates to submit their questions now into the Q&A, then I can put them to Tom. Um, we've got plenty of time to answer questions and have some more discussion. Um, Tom, I've got, I'm going to abuse my moderator's privilege, and I've got a couple of questions for you to start things off. Um, you've talked about um, how with starting to make progress towards having targets in place and, and, and that sort of things, but we've still only got a very small minority of energy use covered by actual legally binding targets for net zero. You also talked about um, the need for near term targets to get us along the road there. Have you, any, have you any sense of how much of global energy use is actually covered by those sort of near-term targets, the things that really drive action yet? And also, alongside that, what do you think is more important, a legally binding target or a, a plan with, with near-term goals? Uh, I'm, I'm just going to share my screen again to go back to my chart because mm. that gives us a, a feeling of... of uh, of quite what the, 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 the gradual steps in the energy transition might look like. If you look at just the, the movement from, from 2020 to 2030 on this graph, you see that, yes, we do start to get a reduction overall uh, in, in total energy consumption. Um, and that's largely, it's, it's driven through a growth in the in electricity consumption, um, but uh, a decline significantly in, in in the transport sector. Perhaps that's one area where we're, we're there's starting to be quite a bit of buzz in terms of the, the, the growth and the interest in uh, the electric vehicles, at least for, for, on the small vehicle side. Um, there, we're already seeing several countries announcing plans to stop selling uh, small vehicles of, with internal combustion engines and moving towards uh, electric vehicles. So that's one thing where uh, the technology is already there. The, the, the markets are there, the, the, um, the different, a range of different uh, vehicle companies are, are producing electric vehicles. So that's something that can start. Um, it can also happen, it's starting to happen in, uh, in household heating systems. And there again, we flag up um, uh, uh, fossil fuel boilers as one of the first uh, appliances where you can switch to um, either to electric or to, to, to heat pumps that you mentioned. Uh, old but, uh, but known technologies that are increasingly efficient. Um, so perhaps those are two areas in transport and in, um, in, in buildings where we can start to see the, the, the growth of electrification and the first steps moving away from, from fossil fuel consumption. So it's, uh, it is gradual um, if you look at it decade by decade, um, but um, there's still a lot, a lot of adaptation needed in, in mindsets of, of everybody, certainly of, of government, I'll come back to your question on government, mm. but in industry and of course, in persuading households that this is, is an appropriate regime, uh, a, a, an appropriate future to buy into. And when it comes to um, plans and laws, I think they're both needed. When you look at the, the, the history in, of developing um, environmental regulation and, and, and legislation, it does start with a plan, it does start with a vision of, of, of where we want to get to. Perhaps that's, that's just important for people to have a, a focal point to understand the direction of travel. Um, and it's also easier to, to, to get a broad sense of this before buying into the detail of, okay, this is what the law says, and this is what you have to do next year. So we've got to, if you like, warm people up, uh, convince them that it's fundamentally a credible pathway through spelling out the strategy uh, or the plan, 
And indeed, that's exactly why we produced our net zero report, just to show the feasibility of it all, to give, to give people a sense of the order of magnitude of the change in the different technologies in the different sectors and the, and the timing of it all. Once, once people feel that they have that, and, one, and indeed, each, each country is now digesting this kind of idea and producing their own roadmaps. We see that we've, we've just done a roadmap with China, and we're doing it for others. Uh, other countries are preparing their own. The EU has done one for the whole of the EU. And this is, is necessary to, to build up the sense of credibility. Uh, and you need that before you can actually come forward with legislation. Um, now, again, to take the EU as a, the example, they've produced their draft legislation, which uh, uh, the European Parliament and others are, are now in the process of discussing. But I think that's, those are the steps you need to take. Um, of course, for, for business who, who have a bottom line and, and, and need to be sure that this is actually going to stay there, um, they, you, we do really, really do need the, the, the lock-in that's provided by legislation. That's what yeah. makes it fundamentally credible. Um, but the planning and the strategies are, are steps on the way there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think this this issue of credibility is 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 a really key one. Um, we've we've got a question here from Dan who says, which milestone is most essential for policies to meet in order to progress to net zero? Um, I think that's an interesting, and very broad question because it could be a sectoral milestone or a technical milestone or I just wondered if you've got any thoughts on that what needs to move first to really make this credible well it's a bit like when we're asked the question of what what technology is is is, is going to to be the technology and I'm afraid the answer is there isn't the technology and there isn't the milestone and, and policy measure it's such a, a big task the, the gap from where we are today to where we need to be is so great that uh, every single one of the, of the 400 measures that we're proposing in our report will be, will be necessary. Um, for me, what's important is to, on the one hand, acknowledge that it's a big, uh, a, a big effort that's got to be made and there are major changes to every aspect of our economy and of, of our sectors. But to, as, ev as with everything, we've got to break that down into bite-sized pieces. Uh, we've got to realize that despite that, that big goal, uh, it's manageable step-by-step. Step. So whether it's, mm. it's uh, I mean, my, my favorite is the, the, the building certificate regime that we have for our houses today. Uh, it's it's uh, not widely used, it's not widely respected, um, we have these certificates for our houses, but they don't mean necessarily very much. Yeah. They may or may help change decisions. Um, they're a bit weakly enforced. So with, this is a, a measure that we've already got in place. Let's make it work. Let's, uh, let's take it seriously. If we can build up that, um, again, the baby steps, um, there, are, there are things we can be doing with the laws that we've got today. Same with, with yeah. um, things like echo design on, on household appliances. Um, we, we our, all the echo labels. We've got the labels there. We've got the regimes. We can be tightening those up bit by bit. Yeah. Small steps like that are, are ways of just getting us on track and getting used to the idea that practically every aspect of our our lives is going to be changing with the with each yeah. of these. So all the measures needed, but let's get started today. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's important that we we acknowledge success as well and show that it is that it's very doable. I mean, you mentioned echo design. Energy labeling on appliances has achieved an enormous amount already. And I don't think we're we shout about that enough and, you know, say to people, look, we're already we're already on this journey and it's already working. We need to just take more steps. So I think that that is very important. Um, We've got a question here from Emily who says, I see there are still fossil fuels in 2050. So does your modeling rely on offsetting? If so, how does it and will it really work? I keep reading reports of how many earths we need to plant the promised number of trees. I think that's a very a good question and something that I think a lot of people have concerns about. We're, we're expecting, are we expecting too much from offsetting? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess the, the clue is in the title. We talk of net zero and not absolute zero emissions. Um, so that means that in, in some sectors where 
it's uh, particularly expensive or particularly difficult to decarbonize, there will still be emissions. So here we're thinking some element of maybe of, of the aviation sector, if not everything can be fueled through uh, advanced biofuels or, or, or hydrogen and ammonia. Um, similarly, in, in long distance transport, there'll be uh, some elements that where alternative fuels aren't, uh, aren't going to reach. Um, and in some industries, um, of, of highly uh, energy intensive industries where the, there aren't necessarily um, sufficient alternatives in, in some instances, in some, uh, some sectors. So yes, there will be some fossil fuels still being used, um, but uh, the, the, the net side of that is that we do counter that, not necessarily with offsets because we talk a lot more about uh, carbon removal technologies, um, and that's uh, talking of, of CCUS, uh, of, of, of BECS, of, of, of biomass use together with CCUS, um, uh, as, as well as natural sinks. And we've, um, in this report, we've probably relied less than most on these technologies. We, we really drive the decarbonization as, as, as far as we possibly can. And when we compared ourselves to other scenarios in the IPCC reports, we were pretty, pretty conservative in, in our assumptions. Um, but that said, we do still see uh, a, a strong role for CCUS. And there is a lot of talk of, of CCUS again, um, with some flagship projects being launched. There are about 50 odd projects around the world now um, where people are, are really seriously planning the development of, of CCUS projects. Um, and there's, yeah, there's the, the whole growth of biomass, uh, the use of biomass as a fuel, but also the use of biomass as a sink. Now, again, we've been relatively conservative because there are concerns around the edges of, of quite how much uh, one can rely on, on this as a, as a permanent thing. Um, so I guess that's, that's the starting point where there's so much we can do to decarbonize in the first place. And that's getting us a long, yeah. long way there. At the moment, with today's understanding of the technologies and the pathways we expect, there is still a need for carbon removal technologies. But who knows how the technologies will advance? We know they'll advance, but just the speed at which they'll advance, the degree of the efficiencies involved, these will change over the coming decades. So let's, uh, let's start with this picture. It will change. We know it will change in coming decades, but it's, uh, it's a perfectly sound picture just to get the ball rolling. Yeah, absolutely. You just answered my next question, so which was about the risks of these new technologies. So that's great. Thank you, Tom. Um, and and just to clarify, I think from from one of your slides, um, Catherine's asking the energy consumption chart shows a big difference in total energy from fossil fuels versus electricity. What's happened to the fossil fuel use which hasn't been electrified? Are you basically saying there's a big reduction in total consumption that is being predicted? Is 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 she reading your chart correctly there? That, that's right. There yeah. there is that overall overall reduction. Um, uh, so the, the reduction in fossil fuels is a mix of reduced consumption overall through greater efficiencies and through massive electrification across all the all the different sectors. That's that's where that reduction is coming from. Super. Thank you. Um, We've got a question here saying the changes and targets outlined in your presentation seem like they're evolutionary and incremental. Is there a danger that this is not going to have a timely impact against the global target to limit warming to one and a half degrees? Um, do we need more revolutionary ideas and, and are there some revolutionary ideas being explored to move the needle within the current decade? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, this scenario was built to deliver net zero by 2050, which is consistent with a 1.5 degree scenario. So in that sense, um, it, uh, it's consistent. Um, I guess once you start looking to the detail, it might not seem quite so evolutionary uh, and rather more revolutionary um, when you get down to uh, what, what your business or, or what you as a consumer need to do over the uh, next 10 years. Um, in terms of changing the cars you drive, the, the ways you travel, uh, the food you eat, the, 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 the heating of your house, um, your supply chain, your log logistics cha chain of your, your company. So there are changes there which might not feel evolutionary once you get to them. Yeah. Um, 
I guess for uh, re revolutions are, are, can sometimes be bloody um, and can often be alarming. So in that sense, I think in terms of getting people to, to understand the issues at stake and to, to, to get a, a, a some degree of comfort with the changes necessary, I think uh, an evolutionary approach or something that at least seems an evolutionary approach is more digestible. Um, but if, uh, as I say, there's, there's, there's the uncertainty that comes from how technologies are going to advance, uh, how fast the cost, costs are going to come down of some technologies or some materials. Um, so there's, there's room there for things to speed up. Uh, if, that's, if, that, if that's revolutionary, then great. Um, but, uh, and certainly we've known for a decade that the faster we do things, the, the cheaper, the, the, the more guaranteed we are of avoiding the worst effects of climate change yeah. and the, the, the cheaper the overall costs will be. So speed is great if we can manage it. Um, indeed, let's hope that uh, the scenarios that people are producing now are on the slow side at the, at the end of the day. Absolutely, absolutely. And in terms of speed, we've got another question here um, that um, asks, it looks like we're talking about annual investment almost doubling every year between now and 2030. Um, and I, you know, I think you mentioned um, we need investment to be at four and a half percent of GDP. Um, are there any precedents for this? I mean, how do you see this happening? What needs to change to actually drive that massive upswing in investment? Uh I don't think there are precedents for, for this kind of change, certainly in the energy sector. Um, but um, we, in, in different ways, uh, whether it's been through dramas and crises and, uh, or, or other elements of, through history, we, we, we have made such changes. I mean, who would have thought um, that the world would have been producing trillions and trillions uh, of public sector uh, stimulus to uh, restart our economies after COVID or, or after financial collapses. Those both even in 2008, and certainly now with, with, with the, the COVID stimulus packages around the world, we, we wouldn't dream of it. We, the, the 1970s scared us off of, of, of this of, of major public sector investment. And yet we are now seeing that the, the, tri the trillions being spent uh, and markets accepting that the trillions are needed and yeah. the public stimulus is, is there. So we've, return to a point where major government stimulus is possible without scary markets. Now that's already uh, astonishing, um, but it, it's where we are today. So that public expenditure will play a role, um, but it's, it's always going to be a, a, a small share of, of the total. So there's also the need for private sector uh, investment incentives to also change. That comes through partly the normal functioning of the market insofar as the market is starting to recognize the, the risks of carrying on with today's pattern of investments. Uh, the risk, that, and again, our scenarios help illustrate the fact that if you carry on investing in certain technologies and power plants today, there'll be stranded assets in a decade's time, or there'll be defunct yeah. technology, or your shareholders or your consumers will not want to buy from you if you're using those fuels and those technologies. Yeah. And so these are uh, normal market responses, which are, are changing, which will alter investment signals. And then there's a regulatory framework for investment as well, which can be adapted. And there again, uh, around the world, different jurisdictions are producing sustainable finance frameworks to, to help steer investment towards uh, the low carbon and the green. Um, we're seeing this particularly with um, multinational development banks. Um, the US, Janice Yellen said that the US doesn't want uh, the World Bank and other IFIs be investing in, in coal power, for instance. So we're seeing changes uh, and the signaling of change through these regulatory regimes, as well as through normal market uh, responsiveness to, to consumer and shareholder preferences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm just, we've got a few questions coming in now. I'm just having, having a quick look to see, to see um, which one to go for next. Um, so the nationally determined contributions slide, Mike has said he likes this slide, 
Um, as the subject is likely to be at the heart of the Glasgow conference, have you any further comment on global regional aspects, particularly on the 10 or 20 countries that are represented at the right hand side, the ones with legislation and plan in place? What can we, how do we spread that out? What, how do we bring them to the fore and learn from them? Certainly there's, I mean, the, the, the countries themselves will be there proudly waving their, their, their legislation or their draft legislation or their ambitious plans. And I think uh, a lot of us at, at, uh, at COP will be there um, pr promoting this best practice and, and explaining that this is, is demonstrating to others that it's feasible, uh, that countries have actually gone through all the steps needed to to, to, to plan the strategy, to, to look at the implications, to look at the costs, to, to go through the different instruments that we need. So these countries are, are really demonstrating the feasibility of it all. And that message has to be conveyed uh, across the world. It's, <clears throat> it's got to be conveyed sensitively because an easy response to, to, to Europe or to Scandinavia, uh, to the UK is to say, well, thanks very much, but we're in a different place. Our resources yeah. are different. Uh, we're not as rich as you, um, and it's it doesn't read across. So we've got to uh, adapt our messaging to be sure that uh, the the that we are conveying the credible messages that, that fit in different circumstances. So I guess that's also important. We flag up our roadmap is is one of almost an infinite number that are possible, um, and that every country's roadmap will differ depending on their resources, their capabilities, yeah. and so on. So we've got to have the discussion. Um, countries are aware they need to do more. The whole Paris framework is about regularly updating your NDC to make it more ambitious each time. And uh, I guess the discussions, negotiations in, in COP and, and happening even now uh, are to explain why, um, why that's what you've come up with is good, but these are the ways you can do it better or faster. Indeed, we just did this with China. We produced a China roadmap we published yesterday. And, uh, and there, again, we've said it's, China's ambition is fantastic, um, but it, there are ways uh, through the use of different technologies, through different measures, uh, it could be faster. So um, sensitivity to be aware of yeah. all the different circumstances but to really not let the ball drop, to realise that every country can be doing something. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it'll be interesting uh, for us to think about how we bring in uh, experience from the subnational level, where experience from one country might transfer to another at a, at a regional level, say. There might be something that's more um, useful to other areas from within a country, not just a national level. So I think we've got to be... We've got to be cleverer about how we share knowledge and experience in, in that way. Um, there's an interesting one here, actually, certainly from the perspective of the EI, which is a, a very much a collaborative organisation. Uh, Jahan asks, what's your view on the role of collaboration across the industry to meet the targets? Currently, competitive behaviours can be seen as a barrier. Um. Partly it's, it's, it's getting the, the idea of a buy-in from everybody so that if you accept the common baseline, um, then uh, that's, that's, that's already a, a starting point. Um, and perhaps I return to the examples of, of echo labeling and echo design where we, we've seen uh, collaboration uh, and industry agreement across a, a sector on, um, on, the way, on the way to make progress and, and buy into to the, to the right framework. So, there's there's room for for, for competition. Um, for instance, I mean, the the, the echo labeling is a good one. Um, yeah. You've got the framework there. Uh, everybody has bought into the framework, and then everybody is trying to become the top of the class. So that's a way of getting some degree of collaboration and using the competition to to up the ante. Um, apart from that, there's uh, there are different models of, of collaboration. I mean, a lot can be done upstream. Um, here, even at the IA, we host a number of, of, of technology collaborative, collaborative agreements uh, with uh, research institutes or, or universities or laboratories yeah. around the world just to, to share those ideas that, that can uh, safely be shared. So there's every, every, everything should be done to facilitate 
if you like, normal traditional academic uh, or technological collaboration. Um, so there are, there are different uh, institutional arrangements we can come up with. Um, we share as much as we can. We get a, a common buy into the vision. Um, so there are steps we can be taking. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think there are many of us who, who work in that way, a safe space where collaboration that is possible can happen and is encouraged, and it is very important. Um, right, so we're, we're, we're getting close to the end of time. We've got a few questions there, so I'm just, just making see if I can, I can group a couple. Um, so, Obviously, this is about a transition to net zero, but it's about more than carbon. We, we know that we have to have a sustainable system in the broadest sense. Um, so we've got it. We've got a couple of questions here about uh, a couple of people. Peter and Emily are interested in in waste to energy. And is that sustainable? Is it clean? Are there not other toxins that are an issue? Um, is the polluter responsibility transferred from waste creator to fuel fuel user? Are there elements of the system like potentially waste to energy that worry you in terms of their overall sustainability? And also are there elements of the electricity system that we need to think about? So we've got a question here from, um, from Christopher who talks about um, other greenhouse gases in electrical transmission equipment. So SF6, things like this. How do we broaden out from just carbon and think about all these other issues around broader sustainability? Um, well, just to, to pick up the, the last bit first, yes, I mean, the, the, the nature and the quality of the, the materials and the investment we use in the transmission system uh, also has to be low carbon. Um, and indeed, I mean, everyone emphasizes growing electrification, the, the, the massive investment needed in electricity infrastructure. Um, and this, this is one of the first areas where we'll see the greatest change um, as, as renewables deploy and as the investments, uh, the infrastructure is adapted to, to, to absorb the, 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 the renewable energy. Um, but in terms of the, the overall story of, of, the, of, of, of the waste from, from different materials or the pollution impacts, for me, um, it's not a new uh, aspect. Um, we have yeah. environmental legislation, we have waste legislation, we are increasingly talking of the nature of the circular economy, the need for recycling, uh, the, the, the liability arrangements with, with waste are getting stronger uh, in, in jurisdictions around the world. Yeah. So in that sense, the, the, the framework that we've had to, to deal with the, the polluter pays principle that we've been discussing for, for decades uh, is the same framework that will apply whether we have a, a high carbon or low carbon energy sector. The, yeah. the, the regimes are robust. Uh, they can deal with the, uh, the pollution, whether it's from traditional mining, new mining, uh, critical minerals mining um, for, for uh, renewable energy technologies. Whatever it is, yes, we do need to make sure we have a robust circular economy and strong recycling and waste management regimes, but that's not a new story. That's something we, we, uh, we have already. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Um, we're running out of time for this session. I suspect we could carry on discussing this for the whole day. Um, so uh, thank you really very much for sharing your thoughts with us this morning. I think it's a really great stimulating start to get everybody thinking and to set the scene for the rest of the day. So once again, Tom, thank you so much for your time and your, your insight. Um, and um, I hope you can you can continue to to contribute through the rest of the day or or later on um, as fits your schedule. Um, so thank you, Tom. I'd now like to uh, hand over to Michael Lewis, who's the chief exec at Eon UK, and Michael is going to be leading our next session. So, Michael, over to you. Many thanks, Joanne, and uh, thanks for an outstanding session, which I think has really uh, put the foundations underneath uh, the rest of the day. Um, yeah, good morning from my side. Um, I'm hosting the next panel, which is demand in a, a net zero future. This is a, a subject which is very close to my heart uh, as CEO of Eon UK, because we are now actually the largest electricity supplier in the UK, and our aim is very much to help our customers decarbonize electricity. I also think it's very, very important that uh, 
uh, we, we focus on the demand side. I think there's been a huge amount of talk over the last years, and I've been involved in, in, in renewables and the energy transition for 50, 15 years. There's been a lot of focus on decarbonizing electricity generation. Is it onshore wind, offshore wind, solar? What's the role of nuclear, hydrogen, carbon capture, et cetera? But actually, um, the demand side is just as, and perhaps if not more, important in this energy transition. If you think about the macro picture of energy, uh, the old system, the system certainly I grew up in, was essentially smart, flexible generation and dumb, inflexible customers. The system we're moving to is dumb, inflexible generation and smart, flexible customers. And that means the customer side has to change in many, many ways that I think no one really understands uh, right now. It needs to not only decarbonize, probably through electrification, but also other things, also massively improve energy efficiency, and of course, make demand much more flexible. So I'm delighted to say we've got a, a, an outstanding panel to take us through various aspects of this discussion from public sector, private sector, uh, and uh, different industry organizations. Um, to start with, um, and they'll all, by the way, give a, a, a 10 minute uh, uh, talk just to crystallize the subject they're discussing, and then we'll go to a Q&A. We start with Brian Denver, who is the European Energy Markets Lead for Google, and he'll be talking about 24 seven carbon free energy or electricity. Then we'll go on to uh, uh, John Holland Kay, the CEO of Heathrow Airport. I think I'm right in saying, John, that you have the largest uh, electricity meter in the entire UK. And, and John will be talking about net zero flying, the thorny question of how do we decarbonize uh, aviation. We'll then move on to Councillor Susan Aitken, who is leader of Glasgow City Council, very much in the eye of the COP26 storm. And uh, Susan will be talking about decarbonization from a local government perspective. And then finally, Trigva Skjotskift, he's an associate partner of Energy, Environment and Utilities at IBM, another big technology company. And he'll be talking about the key enablers of net zero from a technology perspective. So without further ado, over to you, Brian. Thanks, Michael, and good morning, everyone. Um, as Michael said, my name is Brian. I'm responsible for European energy markets and policy at Google. And I'm really delighted to be speaking this morning uh, on the topic of demand in a net zero future. And really, I want to talk about the role that large energy consumers can play in decarbonization through how they transact and contract for energy supply, whether it's a tech company like Google, which is operating a fleet of data centers, or any other industry, public sector, body, or institution. And I fully agree, Michael, with your comments there. It's clear that we need to expect more from the demand side. We can't solely look to the supply side of the equation to deliver uh, the clean energy resources that are needed. And large energy buyers can make an important contribution through their energy procurement strategies to deliver the new additional uh, clean resources that are needed. So I'm going to speak about how Google is doing this uh, uh, in the power sector uh, through its corporate energy procurement strategy. And I'll speak in particular about our new sustainability goal, uh, which is to operate entirely on carbon free energy in all places and at all times by 2030. And this is what we call 24 seven carbon free energy. Um, this is a lightning talk, so I'm going to keep it uh, honor the title of the session, keep it short. Um, so let's dive in. I wanted to start by talking about 100% renewable energy matching. And many of you will be aware of 100% renewable energy commitments from corporate electricity consumers and other energy buyers. Uh, it's a goal that has driven a huge amount of new renewable energy capacity additions across the, goal, across the globe, uh, thanks to procurement mechanisms like corporate PPAs, power purchase agreements. Um, Google alone has uh, PPAs in place uh, for almost six gigawatts of wind and solar projects worldwide. And these projects have helped Google to hit this 100% renewable energy target uh, in 2017 and then maintain it every year since. Um, it is important to be transparent about what achieving 100% renewable energy matching means. Um, so this is an annual match. So for Google, this means we add up all of the gigawatt hours of electricity 
uh, that we consume across all of our data center sites and offices over the course of a year. And we make sure we're buying enough renewable energy globally over the course of the year to match that. And so the renewable energy doesn't necessarily need to be sourced at the same time that we're using it or from the grids, the same grids where we have that demand, um, which means that we can do things like procure more wind energy in the US Midwest um, than we can use there uh, because it's cheaper uh, to compensate for having less renewable energy on certain grids where we operate and where renewable energy projects are just not accessible or affordable. So this means that while we match 100% of our annual demand with an equivalent amount of renewable energy purchases, we're still relying on fossil resources on the grids uh, in which we operate uh, at times when our assets are not generating. So 100% renewable energy match is great. It helps lower the cost of renewables, it drives new additional deployment, but it doesn't allow a consumer like Google to operate in a way that actually doesn't result in emissions in the first place. Um, and it doesn't always help to decarbonize the grids where we're operating. Um, and, and frankly speaking, we can do better. Um, and this is why we wanted to expand our energy strategy beyond simply 100% renewable energy matching to something that would be more impactful. Um, and this is why we set this goal to achieve 24 seven carbon free energy by 2030. Um, so this is about running on carbon free energy in all places at all times. And the big change here um, that you can see from the slide is rather than matching at a global annual level, we're switching to matching at uh, an hourly level using clean energy from the same grids in which we operate. And this means that rather than emitting carbon and compensating for it at another time in another place, we're able to serve our users in a way that doesn't emit carbon in the first place. And I guess the question is, why would we do this? Like, why add this complexity? Uh, and really, is the answer the answer is that as a large energy consumer, uh, we want to pursue a clean energy strategy that maximizes our decarbonization impact and accelerates the decarbonization of the grids in which we operate. Um, and our analysis has shown that we can we can maximize emission savings from procurement. Uh, if we optimize the portfolio for hourly and on-grid matching. Um, and what this does is it ensures that we're supporting the development of the right clean energy technologies on the grids where they're most needed and when they're most needed um, and avoiding things like overdevelopment of certain technologies just because they, they happen to be cheap to develop but not necessarily as impactful. Um, this strategy we hope will also support the development of more innovative technologies like geothermal, long duration storage and green hydrogen um, that will need to be part of a portfolio to maintain this round the clock matching. Um, so there are a lot of advantages. Um, this slide, I hope, demonstrates how 24 seven carbon free energy compares to other sustainability goals that we see in the corporate world. Um, I, I think what's clear from all of these strategies, these three strategies here, is that if they're executed well, they will deliver emission reductions um, and already corporate public sector consumers are making material emission reductions from pursuing these first two approaches. But we believe that if a consumer wishes to actually operate in a way that doesn't give rise to emissions in the first place, 24 seven carbon free energy is the optimal strategy. Um, carbon neutrality offsets emissions, 100% renewables reduces emissions, but 24 seven carbon free energy actually eliminates our operational emissions if it's done correctly. Um, and I think that the row in this table that I would draw your attention to is, is the third one here, um, encouraging full scale transformation of the electric grids on which a consumer operates. And this is really the ultimate goal we have in mind with 24 seven carbon free energy. It's about engaging the demand side, engaging consumers to seek out a decarbonized grid not just through their energy buying, but also through, through other actions like policy engagement and really working to transform the markets in which they operate. We've already started measuring our progress towards this goal. Um, and this map shows what we call carbon clocks for each of Google's data centers, which show the, the level of carbon free energy supplied to the site in each hour of the month of January, 2020. Um, so there's a lot of data behind this. There's a lot of um, analysis that goes into this. 
Um, but what we can see is that even though in 2020, Google was matching 100% renewable energy on an annual and global basis, on a site by site and hourly basis, it looks very different than varied. And in fact, if we only count clean energy from the same grid on an hourly basis, our average carbon free energy score is 67%. Now we do have um, some sites that are performing very well, thanks to our renewable energy purchases um, in those grades. Um, so we have five data centers that are operating at over 90% hourly carbon free energy over the year. Um, so some of the cleanest data centers in the world. But you can see that um, what we, when you bring a 24 seven lens to buying, um, we have to work much harder in some markets. Um, the bubble here in the middle shows how Google data centers in Singapore and Taiwan have a very low hourly carbon free energy score. So in Singapore, for instance, we don't currently have any renewable PPAs in place and the grid is still largely served by fossil gas. So what a 24 seven strategy does here is it compels us to work harder in these markets where the grid is not as clean and where renewable PPAs, for instance, could deliver much more impactful emissions reductions. Um, so that's what we're tracking. I wanted to finish with an example that explains how a 24 seven carbon free energy goal changes how a buyer kind of thinks about and procures clean energy. Um, so in August this year, we were very excited to announce a deal with Engie, uh, which will bring about more than 140 megawatt of wind and solar capacity to the German grid to supply our data centers there. In the past, we would have just gone to the market in Germany and sought to execute individual renewable PPAs to deliver a certain volume of renewable energy. But in this case, we asked NG to put together a portfolio of projects that would deliver to our German data centers a certain guaranteed level of hourly carbon free energy uh, over the course of a year. So in this case, um, at least 80% hourly carbon free energy on average uh, by 2023, um, with a view to then ultimately building out this portfolio adding more projects, adding more technologies uh, to reach 100% hourly CFE carbon free energy by 2030. So it's a more complex transaction for the supplier and for the buyer, but by focusing on optimizing for hourly carbon free energy supply, we can make sure that the right generating assets that are most impactful on that grid get developed. Um, and so by evolving our transactions in this way, adding new technologies like battery storage, geothermal and green hydrogen into our portfolio, we have a pathway to, to reach this goal at every site. And so I hope that gives you a flavor of what 24 seven carbon free energy is and why we think it's a more impactful strategy for buyers. I'll just close by saying that we want and need 24 seven to be accessible to, to all buyers. Um, that are interested in it. Um, and we're working hard to make sure it can be made more simple, more accessible to others. Um, but the only way we can do this is, is through collaboration and partnership with energy suppliers, solution providers, system operators, policymakers, basically the whole energy value chain. Um, and so we're working to build those partnerships uh, to help make sure the data, the tools for measurement and certification and the market offerings are developed to make 24 seven accessible to more buyers. Um, so if you're interested, um, I'd encourage you to log on to the UN's Energy Compact website. Um, an address has just appeared on the slide. Uh, so S S Sustainable Energy for All recently launched, launched a 24 seven carbon free energy compact, which is a coalition of energy stakeholders committed to work together to completely decarbonize grids and make 24 seven uh, accessible to energy consumers. So do please check that out. And we can help maximize the impact that the demand side plays in getting to net zero. Thank you. Michael, I think you're on mute. Over to you, John, uh, with your uh, stimulus talk. Thanks. Well, thank you. And I, I have to admit that as an airport person, I'm a little humbled by being here talking to experts about energy. So please bear with me as this is probably more your expertise than mine. 
But I, I suppose my starting point is that aviation is a force for good in the world. It underpins our global economy, it delivers trade and tourism around the world. It's a wonderful thing that I, we have all uh, enjoyed. And while we may not have enjoyed, uh, we may not have missed sitting on a plane over the last 18 months, we've definitely enjoyed, uh, missed the things that we enjoy that come out of aviation. Uh, seeing friends and family, seeing colleagues, just going on holiday. It's such a joy in life. But at the same time, those benefits can't come at any cost. We all know that climate change is an existential threat to all of us. And if we can't tackle it, none of us will be flying anywhere. So this genuinely is an existential issue for our sector. And that's the way that we look at it. So our challenge is to protect the benefits of flying in a world without carbon by decarbonizing global aviation. Now, aviation isn't covered by the COP climate treaty process. It's governed by ICAO, which is a different part of the United Nations. So it's always been carved out of these global climate deals. And that understandably has been antagonizing to many environmental groups. And I agree with them. Uh, we need to play our part. And that's why Heathrow was the first aviation business in the world, I think, to sign up to the Paris Accord. And we've been working since then to try to get a global agreement and a plan for decarbonizing aviation. So 18 months ago, the UK sector, airlines, airports, energy companies, manufacturers, became the first in the world to commit to net zero by 2050. And we published our roadmap to get there. But since then, others have followed our lead in Europe, the Middle East, the Americas, even in Asia. As of last week, around 75% of the airlines that fly into Heathrow have made the commitment to net zero by 2050. But on Monday, IATA, which is the Global Trade Association for Airlines, made a commitment to net zero by 2050. Now that is a huge landmark. It's the first global industry, I think, to make that commitment. And it's significant because it's not being driven there by a government agreement. It is the industry taking the lead because we are not captured by COP. And our aim is to get that global political agreement to net zero aviation at the ICAO General Assembly, which takes place in September next year. And COP26 will be an important stepping stone towards that. Now, aviation represents about two or three percent of global carbon emissions, and 95 percent of that is from the planes in flight. So that's where our focus has been. And we have to change everything we do in the aviation system. And the first bit is the easy bit, if you like. It's about reducing energy use. Um, we can cut uh, fuel burn by simplifying the airspace that we use so that planes fly more directly and aren't kept in a holding pattern before they land. Now that's complicated to do and involves government agreements, but it can be done. Second is changing the engines and the aircraft design. Something that's been happening for a long time because of course, the more efficient the, the, the plane, uh, the less the cost of fuel. So there's a real win-win here for both carbon and for uh, competitive uh, aviation economics. Um, if you think about the new 787s that uh, maybe the, uh, the planes you've started to fly on, they use half of the fuel per hour than the 747s that they're replacing, which have just been retired from the fleet. But of course, it's not just about reducing fuel burn. If we're going to decarbonize flight, we need to change the fuel that the planes use. That's going to take longer, but we are getting started. And I'll see if I can share my screen to just show you uh, what we are doing on that. So this is a graphic which shows the plan out to 2050 and the different types of, of flights that are needed from commuter through regional uh, all the way to long haul and the different energy sources that will come in at different times. And I'll just uh, walk you through those because uh, we uh, tend to jump to conclusions on what the right solution is on each of them. And um, the first of those, which tends to get a lot of attention, um, is around electric. Um, this is already happening on two-seater planes. They could be in service in uh, 50 to 100 seater regional planes in the early 2030s. But because of the weight, it's only likely to suit small planes with a short range. It does require new planes and significant infrastructure change. And you, you will probably understand more than I do uh, the kind of uh, energy and, and uh, power grid that's going to be needed, uh, as well as the stands that we'll need for charging planes. And the significant thing is that this needs to be in place at both ends of the route. 
Um, so you, you can quickly see that uh, not only do we need to develop the plane technology, we need to, to really plan some significant changes that will take uh, place further down the line. So it definitely has an important role to play, but it can't be the only answer. The second change is around liquid hydrogen. Um, this is coming. You might have seen last week that Airbus announced plans for a short to medium range plane in the mid 2030s, which is just fantastic. It's also like electricity going to require new planes as these are only replaced every 25 to 30 years. And that means that hydrogen will only be part of the solution for 2050. It will also require major new infrastructure at airports. So just as an example, uh, the tanks that hold the high liquid hydrogen will need to be four times the size of the equivalent tanks that hold liquid kerosene. And we'll need that in parallel with the kerosene uh, uh, infrastructure. So you can see that this is quite a big change that needs to be made. And again, it needs to be put in place at both ends of the route. So there's a lot of logistics that go behind those. And that's why the most immediate op opportunity is for sustainable aviation fuels. And you'll see on the chart that this applies to all uh, uh, kinds of aircraft. It's made from domestic and agricultural waste, fuel crops, or can be made by synthetically combining hydrogen and carbon. It's actually been around for over 70 years, was developed, uh, I think, uh, around the time of the Second World War, and is in use today. And in fact, all the British Airways flights from Heathrow to Glasgow during COP will be powered by SAF from BP. The great thing about this is it is a drop in fuel. It can be blended with kerosene. It's certified up to at least 50%, but I think that will uh, uh, quickly increase and can be used in today's planes. So it doesn't require any changes to the planes or the airports. And of course, it means you can fly with SAF from Heathrow on the outbound flight and return with kerosene if the other airport doesn't have a SAF supply. So it's very flexible. And that means that the faster we can scale up the supply of sustainable aviation fuel, the faster we can decarbonize aviation. So this is a solution that can meet the 2050 target, but only if we move fast. And if it was easy, we'd have done this already, of course. Uh, and there are some major hurdles we need to overcome. We've got to scale up supply. We'll need around 450 billion liters of SAF by 2050 compared to only around 250 million liters produced today. This is an entirely new industry that we're creating and it will take hundreds of billions of dollars of investment, but will create thousands of new green jobs. And then the second challenge is to get the price down. Uh, this is a very competitive market for aviation and fuel is one of the biggest cost elements um, in your ticket price. And SAF currently costs two and a half to five times as much as kerosene. Now that will come down as uh, the market gets going and we start to see some economies, economies coming in, but we have to get over that hurdle. So what we've done uh, in the UK is to set up a Jet Zero Council, which was launched by uh, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, uh, back in June of last year, with the vision of guilt-free flying within a generation. It's chaired jointly by the Secretaries of State for Energy and for Transport, um, and has come up with a plan for how we deliver all this. And we're looking at uh, a couple of measures that we're going to bring in, um, which are being consulted on at the moment. The first is to set a mandate for a minimum of 10% sustainable aviation fuels by 2030, and then scaling up uh, to a higher proportion, and to put in place a price stability mechanism that will help to incentivize investment and bridge the gap, price gap to kerosene. And as the supply improves, the cost should come down as learning and scale economies kick in. Around two thirds of the airlines flying into Heathrow have already committed to a minimum of 10% SAF by 2030 on a voluntary basis. Um, but the mandates that are coming in in the UK and the EU will help to give investors the confidence that the demand is certainly coming. And the UK government has concluded that if we meet those goals, it's possible to grow aviation while still meeting its legally binding commitments to net zero. And this is critical to securing global support for net zero aviation. Because if you're a developing country, you're relying on aviation to grow your economy and raise your citizens out of poverty. And you will only commit to a net zero plan that allows you to fly more. This can't just be seen as something that is, a, is for the, uh, the wealthy Western countries. Now, all of us in this room can help. We can encourage our governments to commit to net zero aviation. 
if you're an energy company, you can start investing in supplying sustainable aviation fuels and the technology that goes with it. If you're a corporate traveler, you can tell your buying team to pay the premium to your preferred airline so that all of your business travel is powered by SAF. Uh, not only will that, that help to uh, scale up the sector, it will also help you to tackle your scope three emissions. And if you're an individual, you can pay a premium for SAF when you're offered it such, by airlines such as BA and Lufthansa. And we partner with a, a company called Choose, which will allow you to do the same thing. So that's the 95%. The remaining 5% of our carbon footprint is on the ground. And as, as you'd expect, we already buy all of our electricity and gas from sustainable sources. But we need to convert all of our vehicles and aircraft ground operations to zero carbon. We're aiming to get those emissions down uh, by 50% uh, or more by 2030 and to get to zero by 2050. And that means we'll need uh, a net zero surface access strategy for passengers and colleagues. We're investing in public transport and encouraging a switch away from cars. And you might have seen that from next month, we'll introduce a terminal drop-off charge, which will help to manage that transition. And then of course, we're shifting all the vehicles on airport to zero carbon. Um, electricity will be the solution for a lot of the smaller vehicles, but we're also looking at hydrogen for some of the larger vehicles, such as the, uh, the fire tenders. So some people think that aviation is just too hard to decarbonize, and you'll, have, you'll get the sense from what I've said that it is definitely challenging. But the answer to this is not to stop flying. I think we need to be more ambitious than that. Ten years ago, no one would have believed that we could use energy from wind and solar to power our cars, but that is what we are doing today. In 10 years time, SAF2 will be mainstream. There'll be many more production plants in development and it will be the fuel that is flying uh, at least part of all of our planes. In 20 years time, it'll have gone from about 10% to 40%. In 30 years time, it could power all conventional planes. And all of us in this room can help to make that a reality. We can work at pace so that our grandchildren inherit not just a world worth living in, but are also able to enjoy the benefits of flying that we enjoy today. Thank you. Many thanks, John. And, and I think I was one of those who felt that uh, uh, aviation was one of the uh, almost too difficult categories. But I think you've, uh, you've given us some real food for thought there about how we get there. So many thanks um, and covered a huge amount of ground. Uh, Susan, uh, if I could now hand over to you. Morning. Hi, morning. Um, yeah, um, thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to, to join um, such a prestigious panel. Um, and I'm delighted to be here from the city of Glasgow, uh, the host city for COP26, um, to talk a little bit about what we're doing as a city um, to kind of live up to our uh, responsibility and opportunity that we have as uh, the host city for COP26. And um, it is an unprecedented opportunity for us to tell our story as a city and um, but also to make our pitch um, to the world I suppose as a almost a quintessential city in transition but also a city with a plan to get to in our case net zero by 2030. So we would say Glasgow is the place where modern Scotland is made and remade um, and where the manifestations of global change, be they good or bad, make themselves felt first and most acutely within Scotland. And we've got an opportunity now to become a place where um, the modern post-carbon city is also made. I don't know how well um, all of you know Glasgow, so a very quick potted history. We think we've got a compelling story. Uh, James Watt, whose steam condenser was a catalyst for the first industrial revolution, had his kind of eureka moment on Glasgow Green, which is one of our main city centre parks. Our proximity then to natural resources and our location as a port city really thrust us to the forefront of that industrial revolution. Um, and we built the ships which enabled the British Empire. For almost 200 years, the term Clyde built was synonymous with quality and innovation. But in the post, war era in the 20th century, industrial decline heralded one of the darkest chapters in our history um, and industry and employment really gave way to, to dereliction and abandonment and we live with the legacy of that to this day. 
We have re-emerged though, we're a vibrant, outward-looking, diverse and dynamic city. We play our part on the international stage um, this coming November more than ever. We're a gro global leader in, in new low-carbon economies within digital science, technology, life sciences, precision medicine, the creative industries, um, and culture, sport and events, which is perhaps what we're most known for now. I would say we are again in the 20th century, that centre of innovation and invention that we were in the 19th and early 20th. But as I said, the legacies of our past do remain both physical and social. Um, we have vacant and derelict land more than any other city in the UK that blights too many of our communities and it is a barrier to both prosperity and well-being. We've got the busiest motorway in Scotland carved right through the heart of our city um, and still around 300 deaths a year in the city attributed to air pollution and um, that's in the city with the lowest car ownership, uh, ownership rates in the UK. And entire neighbourhoods that were abandoned in that post-industrial transition live still with the effects of generational unemployment. But while it might seem counterintuitive, we believe that one of Glasgow's greatest assets right now is our flaws and our challenges and how we still contend with and respond to the legacies of our past. We are, as I said, a typical city in transition in many ways and as such an ideal host for this most crucial of COPs. We want to use our host status to show the world that Glasgow can be the city where the solutions to the urban challenges of sustainability can be found. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with um, the city's agenda within the uh, discussions around responding to the climate emergency, so I won't labour the point on that, um, other than to say, obviously, over half of us now globally live in cities and many more are dependent on urban systems. Um, as the source of 70% of the world's emissions, cities are where the greatest gains for investment and um, carbon reduction lie. And COP26's success is obviously going to be judged on a number of fronts, but a critical area will be agreement on the practical solutions um, and the, the delivery of actions to decarbonise. And cities have to be involved in shaping those solutions. What do they look like? How can they address our other long-standing challenges? And how do cities stimulate the finance to invest in transition? So in Glasgow, we've got a plan for what comes next, um, Glasgow's Green Deal. It will be delivered in partnership with business, government, uh, our universities and colleges and with communities. It will be going to um, a council committee um, through the democratic process in a couple of weeks time. But in its broadest terms, it will put in place the, the frameworks required to bring forward the solutions to the climate emergency at scale and at pace embedding change and innovation within our systems, our policies, our investment choices and our institutions to deliver action on the ground. And we know where action is needed. It's around our energy systems, our transport and mobility, the emissions from homes and businesses, um, providing the jobs and skills for the new green economy, green infrastructure, and of course, behavioral change. And we know the scale of the opportunity. The Treasury's own Net Zero Review has already highlighted Net Zero as the pro-growth strategy for the long term. Um, and just yesterday, in fact, I took a paper to the um, Glasgow City Region Cabinet, which oversees our city deal. Um, a feasibility study for the retrofitting of almost 450,000 homes across the city region and the, the, the cost benefit analysis of the economic case for that is really quite striking. Um, a cost benefit of, of around uh, six to one in terms of um, investment in uh, the decarbonisation and the energy efficiency of our homes across the city region. So within Glasgow's Green Deal um, lies the, the roadmap 
for how we accelerate decarbonisation in the city. Um, and that's our green print for investment, where we really get to the core of what the next decade is going to demand from us reducing emissions, adapting to and mitigating climate change, modernising the systems on which cities like ours depend, and addressing social challenges from fuel poverty to poor transport connections. It spans £30 billion of investment and development opportunities, and we are inviting international investors um, and, and indeed domestic investors within the UK uh, to come and talk to us about, uh, um, about these opportunities. So just to give you a few of the headlines, um, the City Region Home Energy Retrofit Programme, which I've already touched on, a 10-year £10 billion programme to upgrade the insulation of really all but the most modern homes across the city region um, to achieve net zero carbon emissions, give greater energy security, lower household energy bills, and in um, for what is a large part of the year, uh, a rainy and quite chilly city, um, give all of our citizens war warmer homes. Uh, a district heating network, uh, renewable source heat networks, focused on transforming energy production and scaling up our existing achievements to kickstart a wider district heating network and specifically to harness the power of the River Clyde for the city's heat demand. And we think that our river could potentially um, power 50% of the, the city um, as a renewable source. Um, a green infrastructure cap on the M8 um, at Charing Cross in the west end of our city centre. Uh, Scotland's busiest motorway, as I've already uh, mentioned, a scar really through our city centre since the late 1960s. Uh, an opportunity not just to contain the very significant emissions that that produces, but also to reconnect the city and provide us with new green public realm. Um, perhaps comparable to Boston's big dig and, and what they've achieved there um, in scale and in the, the kind of outcomes that we want to achieve from that. And the Glasgow Metro, um, new transport provision to improve connectivity right across the wider city region, providing accessible and affordable um, con um, low carbon public transport for our wider skilled labour force for uh, businesses and for visitors, of course. So as the host city for COP, we've got a responsibility to ensure that this talented, innovative and globally connected city really grasps that opportunity and accelerates the redirection of global capital flows into net zero and climate resilient activity. The green print for investment is our way of making this happen in Glasgow and in our wider metropolitan region. We've already got, uh, we think, a global reputation as an attractive, nurturing and investable international location. We're a city of flourishing partnerships. We've got a strong and growing skills and talent base. And we've got existing ecosystems of cutting edge firms utilising advanced technology. But one of the biggest issues facing cities, not just here in the UK, but globally, is the financing of this transition. And it does raise some really core and quite difficult questions. Who is going to pay for all of this and who shoulders the burden? How do we connect local democracy and place-based solutions with global finance and regulatory frameworks? And crucially, how do we do all of it at a scale and pace that probably few cities, certainly in the global north, have experienced in the modern era? So I'm delighted to have been asked to take part on the board of the UK Cities Climate Investment Commission, um, a new development which really um, it brings all of the, the UK core cities plus the London boroughs together to, to try to answer some of these questions to address the deficit of poorly developed pathways help to mobilise finance and to drive investment into low and net zero carbon projects. We recognise already that finance in itself isn't necessarily where the main blockages are. 
rather it's in the ability and the capacity of cities to create the robust business cases and business models at a scale that allows private finance to flow. Um, and by bringing the plans of cities together, we can present investment propositions uh, at the scale and volume that are much more attractive to investors. And by engaging with the private sector, it can also help us to better understand and address the opportunities and the challenges that, that global finance faces as well when it's exploring where and how to invest double digit billions uh, that we're talking about in sometimes relatively untested technologies in a fast moving environment. I talk a lot, uh, as you might imagine, about the focal point that COP26 provides of the important to importance to cities like Glasgow of the leading um, and the follow up um, almost as much as the event itself. Um, it's entirely appropriate to me that Glasgow should serve as a critical milestone in, in this agenda. So I'll, I'll leave you with a phrase that resonates uh, well among peer cities uh, when I've been talking and engaging with them on the road to COP over the past 18 months. Cities like Glasgow is where the race to net zero will be won. Nation states make pledges, but cities deliver. So I look forward to welcoming many of you, um, I hope in person uh, in just a few weeks time to Glasgow, where you will experience our renowned hospitality, friendliness and ambition, but I hope also will be witness to a pivotal moment uh, that really will reset the course for humanity and for the planet. Um, that's probably um, a bit beyond uh, the direct influence of many of us who will be attending, but certainly we will aim to make our influence uh, brought to bear as much as possible on the decision makers who will be in Glasgow next month. Thanks very much for listening. Many thanks, Susan. And I, I think you highlight that the, the real challenge again of, of, of cities is the complexity uh, of, of, of organizing the decarbonization, but in many ways, the, the prize is, is one of the biggest if we can achieve it. Uh, there are some questions coming through. Please keep them coming and we'll get to them after Trigva's final talk. Trigva. Thank you. So. And thank you for in inviting me to um, to share some uh, some insights on on how we actively are basically changing the game of of, of how we can um, utilize uh, all consumers in the market to deliver uh, flexibility services. Um, I uh, am um, working out of Copenhagen and 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 been for the last. Uh, 15 years been working to engage consumers in, 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 the, in the power markets. And for the first time in, in my career, uh, we are now seeing a, a huge demand uh, for basically activating and, and creating an opportunity for consumers to contribute to one of the, the biggest challenges we, we have um, by infusing a lot of, of, of wind power, uh, renewable power into our system. Um, as well as we are electrifying our society. So the challenge really is here that, that we are going from conventional stable uh, power production to, to a, a very fluctuating uh, method of, of, of infusing um, uh, power into our, our power systems. Um, if we're taking Denmark, so at now we have about 60-70% of our production coming from, from renewables. Um, and um, we are to increase our consumption uh, about uh, with, with, with three fourth uh, going forward, as well as we are going to decrease our um, conventional production uh, by, by 40%. That is creating a, a big challenge and, uh, on, on the network to balance that. Um, and, and there's a big urge and that's basically what we are unlocking now that, that consumers can help balance uh, and, and contribute to the stabilization of, of the network and by there um, reduce their energy costs because they basically are getting the we're democratizing the the um, the payments that, that we are paying to the to the reserve power plants basically to do this work um, 
this will support the green transition uh, and, and tap into many of the U UN SDGs. Um, and, and that will yield some of the investments that they're facing in, in their um, uh, renewable uh, or uh, retrofitting their buildings. So what we're basically are doing is that we're democratizing uh, the role of, of the reserve power plants. So basically the power plants that are uh, used to stabilize the grid and, and, and giving that uh, renomination back to the consumers in order to, to give the payments that, that we are paying for, for these power plants. Um, and, and also um, uh, challenging the, the, um, uh, the, the CO2 reductions uh, that, that we can create while, while we are eliminating these power plants uh, back to the consumers. Um, uh, we have uh, built a quite advanced technology to do this because it's, it's not trivial. Um, what we're doing is basically that we are connecting uh, thousands of, of assets uh, from, from different types of consumers. Uh, in, in first-hand large consumers, I think we met some of them today, so we are working with uh, long work with, with the city of Copenhagen, uh, airports, supermarkets, um, large consumers who have fleets of assets, fleets of buildings um, that, that are basically already instrumented. So it was also mentioned uh, the city of Copenhagen uh, have been in, in, in a project of retrofitting uh, their 3,600 buildings across the city. Uh, and, and, and thereby they're basically centralizing the controls of, of those buildings. Um, if we imagine that, that each building or property have at least 10 assets, we're then talking about 36,000 assets we can easily instrument by, by integrating to those uh, existing control systems. Um, so, so with this technology, we're addressing two main barriers for for these for engaging consumers. One has been been uh, been cost. So, so by utilizing the existing infrastructures, we can reduce the cost by a factor of hundred. Um, and and the other thing has been trust. Um, so, so when we are beginning to operate cities and airports and 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 supermarkets as virtual power plants, uh, there is a trust that needs to be established uh, to the energy system. And there we are building a, a virtual meter so that we're basically locking uh, when we are adjusting a, an asset up and down uh, on a blockchain that will serve both as the the settlement purpose but also to the trust to the system. So, so what we're basically doing is that we are making a, a digital re representation of, of the assets that sits in, in all our properties. Um, this digital uh, representation is, is what the consumers define. Um, so they define how many assets they have, which type of assets they have, uh, how much load they basically are representing. Uh, and, and then they are uh, defining how this load, uh, the flexibility in this load, how much we can turn it up and down, uh, how often we can do it, um, and, and, and how fast we can do it. When we basically are having these profiles, we can utilize and optimize uh, across uh, the, 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 the fleets of buildings, the fleets of assets, the, the fleets of, of, of pumps, uh, batteries, uh, et cetera. We can optimize um, the, the flexibility uh, that, that these thousands of assets represents and, and offer that into the markets for balancing for congestions. Uh, we are facing big congestion services uh, in the cities, especially uh, when all of us are to, to, um, to invest in, in EVs and heat pumps. So, so in, in, in this case, we, we can, can easily um, or in, on an efficient way uh, optimize and, and, and package the flexibility of, of, of all these assets. So where does these, this flexibility resides? So if, if we look across cities, 40% um, uh, of our buildings um, uh, or, or buildings makes up 40% of our energy consumption um, and, and as well as about 25% uh, of, of our CO2 emissions. Um, but, but more interesting is that, that about 25% of, of, of this consumption is, is basically uh, flexible. Uh, but until now, it's, it's not utilized, it's not unlocked. Um, and, and, and that's basically what we are, uh, are doing, uh, especially where we started with, with the city of Copenhagen. Um, and, and the, the case, uh, if we take a, a, a large building, uh, it could be a warehouse, it could be an airport, um, 
there's a lot of inertia in, in, in the indoor climate in, in buildings. That means that we can easily turn up and down a ventilation system, a heating, a cooling system for 10, 20, 30 minutes to help uh, the system uh, operate. Um, so if, if there's a fallout of, of wind, uh, then we can easily drop uh, the consumption across all these assets and, and help the system. Um, and, and thereby unlock the flexibility and, and hand back that flexibility uh, or that, that uh, ancillary services um, cost uh, or payment to the consumers um, and thereby making it cheaper to, to operate uh, these fleets of buildings or supermarkets or, or airports. Um, so so in, in this way, we are basically changing the game on, on how we are utilizing the, the cities and, and, and the, the, the assets uh, for, for, um, for balancing uh, services, both for uh, the operations, but also for the foreseen um, uh, congestion services that we are looking into. So, so this is an, a, an example of, of how we can utilize the um, the, the emerging technologies in, in a smart way to, to untap and un unlock uh, and help the, the green transition. Back to you, Michael. Excellent. Thanks, uh, Trigvi. And again, I, I think uh, I, I've learned an enormous amount of, over the last 40 minutes uh, from the different uh, speeches covering all elements of, of the downstream energy transition. We have got a number of questions. I'll, I'll try and cluster them and, and take them in sequence with, with each speaker. Um, so I'll, I'll come back um, to Brian uh, to start with. Um, Brian, I think, um, you know, we all know Google as, as a technology company and uh, clearly in this 24 seven matching data information and the way in which uh, we certify 24 seven is key. And presumably Google is drawing on a lot of its technological capability to do that. Um, can you just give a bit more uh, uh, of, of a context of how that data is being used and indeed whether that can be used as a service for other companies? Uh, and I think uh, Mark has a question as well, which is, to what extent does demand side management play in, in your 24 seven strategy? Brian. Yeah, thanks Michael. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I guess on, on the first piece um, in terms of how we're, we're leveraging Google's technology and data expertise, um, what, we, what we typically see in our modeling is that uh, we can maybe get a data center or an office to you know, above 90% hourly carbon free energy match, just relying on traditional renewables, solar, wind, hydro. Um, getting to 100%, we do need to rely on, um, say, emerging clean energy resources like you know, battery storage or geothermal. Um, but we are also leveraging some of our own technologies. And one example um, that's, that, that, that um, answers Mark's question is, uh, what we call carbon intelligent compute. It's basically a platform that allows um, allows us to to move both in in time and in location uh, some of the kind of computation jobs at our data centers um, from times whenever there is say a lot of uh, fossil resource on the grid to times when there's more renewable resource on the grid. Um, so it is sort of related to what uh, Trigby was presenting, a, a type of flexibility. Um, although in this case, we're really optimizing for uh, the sort of the carbon intensity of the grid or the, the availability of our own renewable resources. Um, and with that, um, that gives us some additional flexibility uh, and helps us to, um, to get, maybe squeeze out those extra couple of percent to get to, to 100%. Um, of course, that relies on a lot of data, um, as you mentioned, Michael. Um, and we are leveraging a lot of data and working with others in the industry to try and make that data uh, more accessible uh, because you need data first and foremost to, to evaluate your transactions, to figure out you know, what's the impact of this portfolio of technology is going to be on emissions and on our carbon free energy score over the course of 15 years, say. Um, you also need to, in many cases, you know, track what's happening in real time. So for this carbon intelligent compute, we need to know what are our resources doing? What is the grade carbon intensity? 
Um, and then of course we need to be able to evaluate um, our progress um, and we need data to understand you know, what actually happened um, in terms of dispatch. Um, so there's a lot of data there and we are working with partners um, to make that more accessible and the tools that are needed to, to kind of use that data more accessible to other buyers. Um, so we're working with companies called uh, Tomorrow and FlexiDAO um, who are really kind of shepherding this data and making it more accessible. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot. There are other technologies we're using. Our colleagues in DeepMind um, are applying artificial intelligence to, to better forecast uh, the output of wind farms, um, you know, we're leveraging that. So, so yeah, it's kind of a, a huge portfolio that we need to get right to 100%. So I think you're on mute, Michael. Oh, yes, I have two mute buttons. <laughs> if you can solve this problem of 24 seven renewable energy, we get away, or at least carbon free, we get away from this debate. We often have, at least in the UK is, is 100% renewable really renewable because it's matching over a, a, over a one year period and it causes quite a lot of confusion amongst consumers. So I think this is absolutely critical for unlocking uh, you know, the, 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 the whole renewable as a product for consumers as well. Um, there was one, one, one last question actually from Emily about to, uh, a quirk on demand side management. Should we, be, uh, uh, should we be deleting more data rather than storing more data? Um, a, a lot of things may be stored on people's devices or in the cloud are, are, are maybe things that we shouldn't be storing. Is that something that, that could play a role in reducing demand? Um, so yeah, I think, it, uh, I guess, reducing demand and being as efficient as possible in say how you know google and others operate data centers is is absolutely the first port of call before we look at anything around um uh, sourcing clean energy and um, i think in terms of deleting old files i i don't have the, the data on, on what kind of impact that is i imagine it's it's very low compared with um the much more kind of energy intensive computation jobs that are ongoing from delivering cloud services to, um, you know, to businesses and, um, consumers. Um, but, but I think to that point, it is critical that first and foremost, we look at the efficiency, um, how we deliver, um, those computational services and, and store data and make sure that, you know, we're minimizing the demand first and foremost before, um, for cleaning it. Thanks, Brian. And, and John, maybe if I can, I can move on to you. I think you've uh, probably stimulated the most questions. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll try and cluster them. I, I think there's a, there's a <clears throat> of questions from Mark, Emily, and Melissa around um, how do we secure the volume of bio waste for, for aviation? Will there be challenges in securing it uh, uh, or competing with food supply or competing with other transport sectors? And has COVID been a help in that respect? And maybe it will mitigate some of the demand growth in aviation over time. Can you give us a few views on that? How do we secure the supply? Yes, and if we take, uh, if we, if you think about the feedstock for sustainable aviation fuels, and this is to cope with all the global growth in demand that is likely to be over the next 30 years, there is enough feedstock from second generation um, waste um, so uh, this is waste from agriculture, forestry and domestic waste globally to meet all the needs of global aviation and, and, and a little bit left over, but not enough for us to also provide the needs of all the other sectors that could use it. So uh, we, we need to avoid wasting that scarce resource on cars, for example, where there is a better alternative to using biofuel. Uh, and we don't need to rely on first generation um, feedstock, so it shouldn't be competing with, uh, with uh, feeding people. So, uh, so the, the, the plan uh, works together like that. And if you want to look at the Energy Transition Commission's uh, reports on Mission Possible, you'll see how the needs of all the major hard to abate sectors of cement and steel and shipping and aviation can all fit together. Um, now, in terms of uh, of uh, demand and uh, have people changed their flying patterns because of COVID? Um, the sim simple answer is we don't really know what the impact is, of COVID has been yet. Uh, there's actually a lot of pent up demand at the moment because so many people haven't been able to go and see their 
grandmother they haven't seen for two years and and uh, make those uh, journeys they've been looking forward to. So we'll have to see how that uh, settles out. We've also seen that uh, that the our love affair with uh, Zoom um, has uh, uh, is unlikely to be a permanent one um, because uh, we all miss the connections and the personal connections that we make. And no matter how good Zoom is, I'm sure that uh, the networking that we get even from a meeting like this is far more effective in person than doing it um, remotely. So people will still need to travel. And we need to see this as a global issue um, because that's the nature of aviation. Any individual country, and, and it tends to be Western European countries who think this way, can make decisions to constrain aviation, put taxes up on it, uh, limit expansion. It has no impact whatsoever on global demand for aviation because there are a billion people in China and India and uh, more in Africa and South America who have had not, not had their fair share of travel and the benefits it gives them to, to lift their countries out of poverty. So that is why we need a solution for decarbonizing aviation that isn't about telling people not to fly. It's about finding a way of enabling them to fly and get the benefits of aviation without burning fossil fuels. And that's where our plan comes in. Uh, many thanks, John. I think we, we're just going to go slightly over, but um, uh, if that's okay with, with our panelists, uh, uh, we, we have a couple of questions outstanding. Um, for Susan, I think um, key questions for you, Susan, are what, what would you see as the, the key legacy of COP for the city of Glasgow and the city region of Glasgow? And I think the other one is how you, you touched on the thorny issue of, of how you get financing to, to fund all of the investment that was required. And you talked about decarbonization and energy efficiency in homes and so on and so forth and using the River Clyde. How do you see the, the or what model would you see being useful? I know Bristol is looking at a, a, a private sector partnership that the, the city lead. Is that something you could conceive of for Glasgow or do you have a different model in mind? Um, so on the legacy question, I, I suppose the, the big thing is if there is a, a Glasgow pact or a Glasgow agreement that's talked about in the same way that the Paris agreement is, um, then, you know, um, for, for a, a relatively small city in global terms, we'll be on people's lips for a long time. And um, obviously, um, for, the, for the sake of the planet, but also for selfish reasons, I would uh, I would then like it to be um, a success, uh, you know, for the, whatever that agreement is to be worthy of the name of the city. But in terms of profile um, and, and uh, the, the international reach that the event has given us, it is absolutely unmatched. We've hosted big events before, but nothing on this scale or significance. Uh, but crucially, I think it, it does give us that platform and, and we have definitely, by being host city, we've moved much faster than I think we would have done otherwise um, in really putting our plans in place. How do we get to net zero? We already had um, a target um, and a climate emergency action plan in place, but we've we've turned that into um, thinking about about the practical delivery and getting into these questions like finance. Um, so we we've actually been working very closely with Bristol uh, on on having discussions um, with. Um, with global finance, with with organisations like the World Bank, with with other investors, we in Glasgow are pretty much, I would say, open for anything. We would we would go into partnerships, definitely, um, you know, joint ventures. I think we all understand this is it's a different place for cities to be in. Certainly, most UK cities, perhaps um, London as a, as a, a, one of the world's mega cities, would be an exception. But most of us have not dealt with. Um, inward investment or infrastructure investment of the kind of scale that we're talking about. To put it into context, the biggest deal that Glasgow has ever done, and we, you know, it's the biggest of any city in Scotland, any local authority in Scotland, was our equal pay deal back in 2018, and that was half a billion. Um, and we're talking about 30 uh, to, to deliver um, the, what, what we think we need in terms of decarbonisation um, over the next decade. Um, and, and across the UK cities, it will be in the region of 200 billion. So very few of us, 
And as local authorities, we don't really necessarily have the capacity. Um, and that's why, first of all, we need to work together. We need to partner with each other. But it's a different kind of investment relationship, I think, that we're looking for. It is very much about partnership and collaboration. Um, it's not a, you know, thanks very much, we'll take your money and we, we're never going to bother to deal with you again from our point of view um, and nor from the point of view of the investor is it um, is it quick buck stuff it's much longer term it's it's patient capital but it is also the expertise the technical expertise I think it's much more likely to be um, discussions with consortia rather than with with single investors for example um, because it's not just that we don't um, necessarily have the the, the capacity, um, although we, we have invested to grow capacity in Glasgow, we've appointed a green economy manager, for example, who's helped us get to, to where we are now. Um, but we, we don't have the delivery mechanisms either. You know, our, um, with the best will in the world, our city building DLO is not going to be able to retrofit 450,000 homes in a decade. Uh, we're, and, and, and we need the expertise on that as well. Um, so. I think it definitely partnership, definitely collaboration, and we will see cities um, move into that space um, and really be seeking, um, it, as I say, not not just finance but help um, and and expertise and advice from uh, from from investors out there. Um, and, but crucially, national governments have to stand behind us on this. It will be cities who deliver it. National governments need to give us the assurance um, and the confidence that we, we can deliver net zero without impacting on our public services, because we also have to give our citizens the reassurance that we can do all of this while protecting education services and social work services and all of those things. Thanks, Susan. Uh, I think uh, a very comprehensive answer and uh, I think uh, real ideas how we can make it happen. Finally, maybe for the last question, uh, Trigvi, I think um, what you presented was compelling in terms of how we can mobilise um, flexibility and demand side management, but we've talked about it for a number of years and there seems to be something preventing consumers participating. What would you see as the key barriers to actually making this happen? And are they things that are barriers at a local level, at a country level, or even a, a pan-European level? And, and what's your recommendation into how we can activate this market? So um, we, yeah, we, we, we have been working with that challenge for the last uh, five years dedicated in um, talking with all the stakeholders and and there's basically been two main barriers uh, so so one is definitely a, a cost issue that's derived on trying to apply too many new technologies in 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 the system uh, instead of utilizing and 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 building it in in for example if if, if glasgow is to make a retrofit of, of their buildings it should be factored in, um, so so that's part of, of the basically the the renovation wave uh, and and minimizing then the complexity, but also the the, the initial and, and maintenance cost of that. Um, and the other challenge that or barrier that's been is, is basically a trust issue because when you are to start relying on consumers delivering balancing resources, uh, you, you want to be sure that that they basically are. Are helping the system and, and not, um, I mean, forgetting it or, or counterproductive uh, working against it. Um, so, so um, and, and, and those securing mechanism has also been expensive and, and immature. And I think with our um, critical mass now and, and, and maturity around uh, Western Europe, at least uh, on, on, on IoT and, and connecting assets and, and systems, I, I think there's a lot of things we can start leveraging of, of those investment already made. And, and, and that's what we're trying to do um, with, with, with the technology that, that we're proposing here. Thanks, Trigvi. And maybe one, one last question to all of the panelists, we've just got a bit of time left is, um, are you confident that we can uh, really deliver a meaningful global agreement at COP in Glasgow? And maybe Susan, I come to you first. Um, I'll maybe say hopeful and optimistic rather than confident. <laughs> John. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would also say hopeful. And uh, uh, 
and we we as business people need to make it easier for politicians um and uh you know that that's that's why we've taken the approach we have in aviation the industry needs to lead the solution rather than um leaving it to politicians who uh who are very worried about um jobs in their their economies we we that, that's why we need to show that there is a solution and um i i hope it'll be a bigger role for uh for business at cop than that normally is thanks john brian very little to add same um hopeful but um i agree with john that we uh, on the demand side on the business side we just need to get on with it anyway um and, and give that signal um and increasing the business is um is you know has to complement the efforts of um of member state governments um across europe and across the world um you know taking action so um yeah hopeful and i'm very disappointed susan after your potted history of glasgow i'm disappointed i'm not going to cop with the member <laughs> thanks brian and trickery final word to you yeah i i, I echo what's been said and 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 i also think it's important to to try and look and and what what are i mean what are the 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 low-hanging fruits here so instead of, of trying to build a, a, a lot of new stuff and and looking into 10 years investments Let's look at how we would policies and 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 in good frameworks can can un unlock the potentials that that we we are already having, um, and and one of that is, is of course flexibility, but but also in in as 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 Google are doing looking into how we can optimize some of the the processes that that we are having. Um, the same for the airports. Uh, I think it, it it's good to to look very short way to to see how we can tackle this. Thanks, Trigley. And I, I would only add from my side, um, after having the benefit of hearing this panel for the last 40 minutes, I feel more optimistic and more confident that uh, we can get a meaningful agreement because there is so much uh, uh, effort being put into these solutions and you can see the outline of a solution emerging across various industries, cities, public, private sector, uh, I think it's truly remarkable the innovation going on. So uh, I think we can all be confident that uh, there really is a pathway to net zero in 2050 and we all have a major, major role in delivering it. So may I thank the panel for an outstanding session and uh, a virtual round of applause from our audience. It's been a tremendous uh, session and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I should say now we will be taking a break for uh, 35 minutes back at 11.45. And just to let you know that you can navigate back to the RD mobile platform now, uh, the web page or the app, and network with other attendees and speakers. And then please come back at 11.45. Thank you.
Hi everyone, we're going to kick off the next session in just a moment. Okay, so welcome back um, to this morning's session. Um, my name is Dara Vias. I am Head of Future Energy Services at Systems Advice. Um, Systems Advice is the statutory energy watchdog um, for consumers. And we have a role in providing both advice and um, advocating on behalf of people across the energy market, whether that's kind of network systems, pipes, wires, retail energy market, which I'm sure you can understand has been quite busy these last few weeks, um, and also future energy consumer issues and things like energy efficiency, decarbonising heat. Um, it's really great to be here with you all this morning. This session is a um, demand deep dive, and it's about... Um, consumers. Um, we are going to do some interactive polling, which I hope you'll all enjoy. But first, we're going to kick off with a um, bit of an introduction. Our speaker is Stephanie Jameson. She's a Senior Managing Director um, and Strategy and Consulting Lead across Europe for Accenture. And Stephanie, over to you. We're going to see some slides and then we're going to go straight into some polling. Thank you so much, Dara. It's really good to be here. Um, Dara, let me know if my audio is okay. I have had a bit of a disruption, so just let me know if it's okay. Sounds can... good to me. Sounds okay, good. good, good, good. So thank you for the introduction, Dara, and um, hello to all of you in the audience. As Dara said, I'm with Accenture, and I'm really looking forward to diving into the consumer in the next 30 minutes um, together here with you. So just to let you know that the findings that I'm about to share come from a 10-year research program that we at Accenture have led. I think we might have lost Stephanie. I'm going to check. Okay, bear with us. We're just going to try and get um, Stephanie back. Give us a moment. At this point, we'd normally say talk amongst yourselves. So Dora, Dora, I just sent her a message. This is Melissa, I just sent her a message. Great, thank you. Um, we'll try and get Stephanie back and someone else will put her slides up. Can you still see her slides? I've got her slides up. Is it... I can see the first slide, yes. Okay. We can there she is. Great. Back now. Can you hear me, Tara? We can hear you. Yep, Stephanie. Let's see. Let's see. Dara, are you able to hear me? I can hear you. And Melissa has your slides up, so I don't think you need to share. Um, maybe she's having problems hearing us. Let me just. Yeah. Stephanie, we're just going to see if we can get your sound back on. Thank you for being so patient, audience. Go with us and we'll just see if we can maybe we can try and get her back audio only melissa yep okay let me give her that message yeah it's usually my wi-fi that's dodgy so <laughs> Yeah. 
Thanks again for your patience, everybody. I'm sure we're gonna have Stephanie back as soon as we can. Oh, she's on, but she said, can you hear her? Um, we could hear her. It's settings. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Yeah. Can you see okay. your slides, then, Stephanie? I am almost there and I should be able to see Great. Okay, Melissa's casting. I can see them you. now. Great. Okay, great. Okay. All right. So then, if you can hear me, I'll jump in and do this by phone. Um, we can. So in yeah. any case, great. Thank you, Dara. And so the the context here is uh, the basis for everything that I'm about to share is based on ten years of research, um, specifically in the energy industry and specifically to end consumers. So then, without further disruption, let's jump in. Um, Let's go on to the next slide, Melissa. So we, we as consumers, we know we and others are becoming increasingly demanding. Our life is becoming more and more connected and dependent on electricity, whether we realize that or not. Power is taking a bigger share of mind. And because of the elect electrification initiatives going on locally and around the world, this is only going to increase. So that means engaging with consumers is mission critical. Electricity has to be easy, it has to be cheap, and the investments that we ask them to make have to be worthwhile. If I think back to the past, I ask myself, how often did I actually think about electricity? Whereas today I think about it frequently throughout the day. I'm practically every day I'm trying to find space to charge my, my iPad, my iPhone, my laptop, my headphones, we walk around with battery packs in our pockets just to keep things going. My, I live in London, in central London, in a, in a building, so my husband is constantly driving around the neighborhood trying to look for charging points for our car. Energy has become more important in our everyday life, but if we think about back to the 90s, it was all about my power and light. I worked in the U.S. for several years. I worked for a utility. I worked with utility companies there. I worked for companies called Dayton Power and Light, Pennsylvania Power and Light, Florida Power and Light. And all of those companies have changed their names. They've changed their branding because the industry, the industry moved on and consumers were no longer thinking just about power and light. Today, we're thinking about so much more. And then, of course, in the 2000s, the concept of the iDevices were introduced, which was really exciting. Those, those were platforms for us to to um, interact with and there were you know the I meant intelligence the I meant information but today we're thinking and talking much more about electricity about e about you know people say my ev and solar panels will be managed by my e assistant i say and i believe very strongly we are entering a time when e is becoming the new i so with that context as, as background um Dara, let's get into, let's hear what, what, let's take a pulse of those here in the group. Let's move on to a poll. And if you wouldn't mind leading that first poll, yeah, I look course, forward to yeah. seeing their results. Yeah, absolutely. So Vicky's going to launch the poll. And the polling question is, by 2025, what share of your company's profit do you believe will come from net zero carbon services? You have one choice and we'll give you 20 seconds to respond to this poll. Okay. Okay, Vicky, can you show us the results? Can you see those, Stephanie? I can see it. Great. So we can see that um, the majority of people think that between 10 and 25% of their company's profits will come from net zero carbon services. Um, and between 25 and 50%, um, 18% 18, 18 of people who responded said between 25 and 50% and 18%. So the, the clear winner is that nearly half of our audience thinks that between 10 and 25% of their company's profit will come from net zero carbon services. Um, Stephanie, 
do you, how does that line up with the sort of thinking you've got at Accenture on, on the future? Yeah, I think it's, I think this paints a very positive and realistic view for the industry and um, the potential for value added services coming from net zero. So it, it basically means that this group is very positive about the growth potential in the industry for net zero carbon carbon services, which, which aligns very much with what we're finding with consumers. So if we go to the next slide, I will share um, what we mean by new sources of customer value that are emerging. You can see here, um, these are just examples of the type of services that customers are demanding and that companies and that companies are providing. And I will share a couple of examples that I really like about, you know, practical, simple, easy to understand solutions that different companies are providing the customers and the value that those are delivering. So when we talk about new sources of value emerging, this means new sources of value for the customer and for the companies. And here you see a range, um, a number of services ranging from energy efficiency and energy management, consumer generation and storage, e-mobility relating to electric vehicles, charging on the go, and a number of other related services, demand side flexibility, and even alternative financing as, as a proposition. And I'll just highlight two, two examples in the market that are, are doing quite well and are really two of my favorites because they just, they just make sense and they deliver value to the company and to, to the customers. So first in the energy efficiency space, EDS, that operates in multiple countries, but looking at their, their business in France and in Belgium, they offer a program known as Adalia. It's for energy management and it's offered to their 12 million customers and it's offered to those customers free of charge. The customers who use it receive personalized insights via that platform. And over the course of a year, on average, they were able to realize 12% in energy savings thanks to simply the insights and control better control of their energy consumption. And for the company, or for EDF in this case, a platform like this provides the opportunity to reduce churn, to create better customer satisfaction and stickiness, and even to deliver um, cost reduction through the sales process. So that's, that's a great example of a, val a source of value to the consumer and to the company. Another one that I really like linked to alternative financing is from EDP in Portugal. They offer distributed solar and storage as a service to small and medium-sized business clients. The company takes care of the full end-to-end -end process, meaning installation, leasing, maintenance, it's, it's all in, and their fees are paid based on the savings um, of their clients in energy consumption. This approach combined with a digital platform allows companies like EDP and others who have deployed this to significantly reduce the cost of sales it also gives them a sales platform. So these are just great examples of win-win opportunities in the market, Dara. And if we go to the next page, I will just highlight here some of the some of the findings that we that we saw in our most recent survey, our most recent new energy consumer survey. Um, what we see loud and clear is, and hear loud and clear, is the consumer interest in the energy transition has accelerated as a, as a result of through the through the time that we've been. Um, in COVID and recovering from, from the COVID lockdowns and transitioning through that process. So looking on the right side of the page, I'll highlight some of those, those points here. Um, this we call the COVID impact. 60% of the consumers have become more aware of climate change and environmental impact since the start of the outbreak. And that might seem obvious to us, to us who are joining into an event hosted by the Energy Institute, but these are the things that we study. These are the areas that we work in. This data represents consumers in a number of countries um, of all ages, of all economic backgrounds and professions. And 60% is quite a, quite a big increase. So showing what um, some of the results of COVID has, has put in the front of the customer's mind. In addition to that, 50% of the, those who responded are likely more likely to invest in energy efficiency today than before, and more 33% are more likely to invest in solar panels now than ever before. So we see this increase, dramatically increasing pace um, in demand for these types of services, which is which is great for society, but it means the companies need to be ready. Let's go, um, Dara. I think it's a good time to do another poll. So I'll turn it back to you, and we can get through yeah. another poll and check the polls. Absolutely. I think this slide's fascinating, Stephanie. So the next question is, 
what do you see as the most impactful barrier to consumer adoption for net zero connected energy services through 2025? Do you think it's consumer awareness and knowledge? Do you think it's a lack of transparency and real costs and benefits? Do you think it's a lack of financing options or do you think it's uncertainty about data use and privacy? And again, we'll give you 20 seconds. Here we go, Vicky, can we see the results? Ah, it's kind of very close on the top two, Stephanie. So. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the, there's a, around a third of people think it's consumer awareness and knowledge over a third think it's a lack of transparency and real costs and benefits um, and then a quarter of people think it's a lack of financing options interesting about the data use and privacy being quite low down there on a barrier that people think um, is, is there is there anything you can share or anything you'd like to reflect on that I think that's a really interesting poll yeah I do too um that one surprised me as well. I would have expected it to be a bit higher uh, and actually a bit more, not quite on par with some of the others, but we typically see it in double digit as a percentage, at, you know, teens to 20s in terms of this kind of, this kind of question. Um, the, com the consumer awareness and knowledge, you know, just too many choices and being confused is, is always a big one. And then lack of transparency and, and even linked to lack of trust about the real cost and benefits are, are another theme. And in order to, to bring that to life a bit or provide a bit more detail behind these questions, if we go to the next page, I will share some recent research that we did with Euroelectric. And many of you know Euroelectric represents the power industry across Europe. They represent um, the power industry in 32 countries. And we did a piece of work with Euroelectric. It was a joint collaboration between Euroelectric and Accenture. We set out to understand what could be done to partner with, with customers on the quest for sustainable, inclusive, and the smart energy future. In order to do this, we conducted eight workshops with people from nine countries. Those representatives, there were 120 people in those workshops, and they represented government, consumer associations, the electricity industry, automotive, tech, the tech industry, as well as academia, policymakers, and regulators. So quite a diverse group of people around the table and all of the right representation around the table. Our goal was to identify the barriers and opportunities for engaging consumers in the drive toward the net zero carbon, carbon society and economy. And what you see here is this is from that research. So we asked the question, the polling question is linked to, to these adoption barriers and experience drivers. And uh, you know, just summarizing, the experienced drivers are on the right side of the page. Customers in this space are looking for what we, what we look for and what we would expect them to look for, simplicity, transparency, affordability, and trust. And that, was, that work was done within the past year. So it's recent and it was done in a time that was, um, you know, dur during COVID recovery, if you will. So then let's go. I think we've got one more poll left. We do. Let's yeah, go we, there, Dara. We have one more poll and just looking at those experience drivers really makes me think about the conversations that must be happening about, um, you know, the future shape of the retail market in Britain and how you embed those experience drivers. I think it's going to be fascinating. And um, so poll number three is what should be the number one priority for energy retailers to focus on in order to create an enabling environment for businesses and citizens to participate in the energy transition to net zero. Do you think it should be customer centricity, agility, and a culture of shared success? Do you think it should be powering the workforce with deep digital expertise? Do you think it should be energy tech leadership to connect customers with the best solutions? Do you think it should be cross-industry collaboration with established and new players? And do you think it's working closely with regulators to shape policy? And I can just imagine everyone in the audience kind of struggling with this because it's a really tough one because you kind of want them all. <laughs> <laughs> but they only get to pick one. So let's see. Let's see what comes let's out see. of it. There we go. Ah, nearly, nearly half of our audience say energy tech leadership to connect customers with the best um, services for them. I think the interesting one here is that nobody thinks that we need to be powering the workforce with deep digital expertise. 
And we shared, we shared across the fifth on customer centricity and cross industry collaboration as well. So exactly 20% for each of those. What do you think, Stephanie? Let's see. So I'm surprised at the at the percentage related to energy tech, but I but I can absolutely relate to that. That's something that I you know I focus on every day. Mm -hmm. um, and then the 20% at customer centricity, agility, and culture of shared success and cross industry collaboration um, being equally represented. I think this it shows a, a savvy group that we've got here, especially around the cross yeah. industry collaboration to have come out yeah. so high because that is that is something that all of us who work in the industry recognize that will that area will only increase and the need for in cross industry collaboration um, will only increase and and my position is I think the the power industry the utility industry the energy industry is in the position to really lead that in the future and it's an opportunity for us so mm -hmm. so I love, I love, you know, taking the pulse of this and seeing what's here, but I'm, I'm, I agree with you, Dara, the powering workforce with deep digital expertise. Um, I think we still have work to do within, mm -hmm. within businesses and government there. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Okay. I think people are going to need and want help, aren't they? Um, and so you need the person at the end of the line to be able to help them. Um, Stephanie, over to you to wrap up. Yeah, and to that point, Dar, when you think about some of the solutions that are required to get to, let's say, net zero in buildings, um, requires technology integration, artificial yeah. intelligence, linking data, that requires a tech workforce. So, so more to come in the future. So, as you said, um, you know, the, the poll, while we didn't plant that response, it teased, teased things up nicely for me to just share some stories about those who are creating an enabling environment for the energy transition to net zero. Starting with, I'll start with Octopus Energy because they are really tech led. And for those of you, um, those of all of us who, who are in the UK, you will, you will know Octopus Energy from their advertisements. Maybe you're a customer of Octopus Energy. And I, I, there are so many things that I, I like about them. They, they, they are disrupting the incumbents here in the local market but they're also doing the same in other markets around the world. And I'll just highlight some of the things that they're doing as um, you may be aware of some, but not all of, of, of their business model. So Octopus Energy has successfully combined simplified product sets with agile operating models and cloud-based technology platforms. So that gets to that, that tech-led aspect of the solutions. Um, they're really a great example of this. They offer a number of net zero propositions that combine, many of us know about their 100% their renewable energy offer, but they also offer net zero services such as EV charging, time of use tariffs, combined with even EV leasing options. And this connects customers to the wider ecosystem for the best solutions. If you follow them in the media like I do, you know they put the customer at the core of everything they do. I, I say they have a relentless customer obsession. They've really started as, you know, with a tech platform, more of a tech company, but they have evolved and become such a diverse company. And I think they're really a really important part of the ecosystem here. And then I'll use, um, you know, my own company as an example of, of things that we're doing to create an enabling envir environment for energy transition to net zero. A year ago, our CEO, and we're a company of 600,000 people, our CEO made a commitment to the market that by 2024, we would embed sustainability in everything we do, not just our own business operations, but in all of our services. Meaning it, by 2024, every service we provide in the energy industry will have the concepts of sustainability, whether it be um, measurement and reporting, net zero carbon services, just at the core of, of our services, not a special project, not on the side, but really in, in what we do on a daily basis. In addition to that, she made commitments about our own net zero reduction of our own operations. And this sustainability quotient that I highlighted here is an example of actually enabling the workforce. Um, as I said, we're quite a big organization. We have 600,000 people and all of us are offered but also required to take sustainability training. That's just one of the many, many things we're doing to embed sustainability in everything that we do. We call it sustainability quotient. We track everyone's progress. We all get a quotient score. Um, and that's publicly available to the rest of the company. In addition to that, 
the um, level of requirement for this training is on par with our ethics and compliance training, which is, which is absolutely required training, non-negotiable. So it's just an example of what we're doing and many other companies are doing to embed sustainability into everything that they do. And then I'll just close, Dara, with um, uh, highlighting another recent collaboration. This is very recent. Free to Move Solutions is a joint venture between Stellantis, a global car manufacturer, and mobility service provider. They have brands like Fiat, Jeep, Maserati. They formed a joint venture with NG. Many of us know the large global utility. The JV was created just in the spring of this year, so spring of 2021. And it's a prime example of cross-industry collaboration between automotive players and, and the utility industry. They, they're accelerating the net zero transition through sustainable e-mobility are the words they use. And they offer a subscription-based electric vehicle charging proposition that has a really nice, simple, intuitive customer experience. So many companies out there creating this enabling environment. These are just three that I chose to highlight here. Um, and with that, Dara, I'll turn it back to you to you know, add comments, questions, and, and close the session. So those are some really great examples. And I feel like um, there's a couple of things. You have four minutes. So there's going to be two things I'm going to ask you, Stephanie. One is you've been producing this report for 10 years. What's been the biggest change? Are there any big surprises? And also another question, are you able to reflect a little bit on how you could maybe take all consumers with you, given energy is an essential service, how do you make these sorts of offers not exclusive to people who can afford them? Sure. Okay. So in four minutes, um, let's talk about the biggest change and surprises. Um, I will say two things in that regard. Looking back on the research when we started it 10 years ago, it, it's a global piece of work and it always has been, but 10 years ago, nine years ago, eight years ago, you know, in the early days, we had to produce a data set country by country and share it with, with companies in the market country by country because the behaviors and the needs were actually different. Today, I call this a global phenomenon. So those themes that we've seen, um, the findings that, that come through in the research are truly global. That means the customers around the world, regardless of the regulatory framework, regardless of whether they live in a competitive market for energy or not, are demanding flexibility, demanding net zero services. So that's, that's something that it, we don't even produce the local data anymore. It's that different, actually. The surprise wow. was, um, the pleasant surprise, I would say, comes from yeah. the, the acceleration toward the net zero interest and the consumer's willingness and interest in, in those services. So, so that's what I've seen over the last 10 years and a huge acceleration toward net zero in the last two years, Dara. And I feel like that ties into the second part of my question. Do you think all consumers can, can get involved? I think there have to be financial propositions to allow consumers to get involved. And that is why I chose um, the financing alternative that EDP offers as, as a good example, because yeah. companies, businesses have to provide viable solutions for all of their consumers in order for, to us to get, in order for us to get to where to where we need. So I do think it's possible. I think we have a long way to go, but I do think it's possible, Dara. Yeah, I think that's a really positive note to end on, Stephanie. And thank you so much for persevering through those tech issues. <laughs> um, the irony of talking about advancing tech while struggling with this sort of thing is never going to be lost on me, despite 20 months of us <laughs> doing this. <laughs> I thought that was super, really useful and interesting. And I hope that um, people in the audience enjoyed it as much as I did. I learned a lot. Um, you have a couple of minutes if you want to uh, stretch your legs. And I'm going to welcome Kate Turner, who is Policy and Regulation Director at Scottish Power Renewables. And she's going to lead the next session. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, um, Dara. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been a fascinating morning so far. Um, some fantastic presentations and interesting speakers, and I'm sure we will follow that up now with this next session. Um, so this session is entitled um, Energy Supply in a Net Zero Future. Um, I think we've, we clear that net zero is driving a fundamental change in the energy system. And certainly from my own perspective, um, 
uh, there's a need to go much further and much faster and uh, uh, with policy needed to drive that change. And we're going to hear today uh, from three different speakers who will bring a different perspective about the future of that energy mix and what needs to happen next. Um, so to introduce our speakers, um, we have um, Tristan Zipfel. He is Director of Strategy and Analysis at EDF Renewables UK and Ireland. Uh, following that, we have Caroline Longman. She is Account Director for the National Nuclear Laboratory. Um, and then last but not least, we have Harmeet Bawa, who is Group Senior Vice President and Global Head of Government and Institutional Relations at Hitachi ABB Power Grids. Um, after the three speakers have, have each covered their presentations, we will, like the other sessions, have an opportunity for Q&A. So please do um, put your questions into the Q&A and I will facilitate those after we've heard from our speakers. So over to you, Tristan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate, for the, for the introduction. Uh, let me just uh, share the slides. Here we go. Hopefully you can you can see them by now. Um, it was it was fascinating, uh, as you said, uh, uh, Kate, to to hear uh, the previous roundtables um, and and especially the ones uh, I saw uh, from from the consumer side, for instance, were extremely interesting. And I think we we're going to to shift to the other side of the equation, I guess. Uh, now we're looking at uh, uh, the issues around uh, generation and supply. Um, and uh, I wanted to uh, briefly use this time to um, put a bit of context there, um, what are, uh, you know, the scale of the challenges and, and some of the issues uh, that, that underpin this. Um, let me just, yeah, so um, it's a busy slide, apologies for that. Um, but on, on the right hand side, I, I would like uh, to, to start with the right hand side. Um, it really shows that uh, on the road to net zero, while we have made considerable progress, in particular in terms of uh, decarbonizing the power sector, um, uh, we are still a long, long way to go. And uh, we are a long way to go uh, still on, on the power sector, uh, even though I think we, we have a clear road uh, that is now defined um, with, with policies in place, uh, strategies in place. The big challenge ahead is to obviously decarbonize uh, the other key sectors of the economy from transport to industry and buildings. And on, on, on those, we are uh, far off the mark yet. Um, in some cases, we have uh, high level strategies in place, um, but a lack of policies, a lack of funding and, and a clear, clear challenge ahead in terms of uh, tangible progress on, on, on these fronts. The important thing there is that to decarbonize sectors, a lot of it will be down to electrification. A lot of it will be down to electrification. So um, uh, uh, what this will result in is an increased share of uh, uh, electricity and in particular, uh, low carbon electricity in the overall system. Uh, and obviously this is looking at on, on the left hand side on the top, uh, top corner, uh, we're looking at, at the, the, the total energy demand in the UK. And electricity is expected to, um, to represent a, a, an increasing share, um, and quite substantially so. Uh, it's the dark blue patch shown on, on, that, on that graph. And as you can see, you will go from somewhere around 15% today to uh, nearly 45% uh, in 2050. And that's according to the, the scenarios uh, published by the Climate Change Committee. It's a tremendous increase. Um, and and the, the, obviously this will require a, a massive increase, not only in decarbonizing our existing capacities, but in providing additional capacities of low carbon electricity in the system. Uh, the same scenario plans for um, uh, an increase by seven of uh, the renewable energy production uh, between today and, and 2050 in, in the UK. And a, a lot of it would be uh, happening in the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, this just gives an idea of the challenge we have ahead of us. It's considerable. Um, in, in, 
the good news, I, I, I suppose, is that we have we have technologies that are delivering uh, today. Um, and I think you know, from solar to wind to uh, battery storage, um, some of the the the, the cost reduction uh, already achieved by those technologies are, are staggering. Uh, but it's not the end of the road. Um, the, the experience curve um, uh, plays its full effect, and uh, we, we still expect further uh, decrease in cost coming uh, in the next uh, decade. Um, some of the numbers quoted here are coming from, from Bloomberg. You have various estimates around that. Um, and I'm sure that the next uh, CFD auctions next year in, in the UK will, will, will show again uh, how uh, cost competitive uh, these technologies have become. Um, the scale of the challenge uh, also provides an amazing opportunity, I think, for the UK to, to really become uh, a, a leading market um, uh, on the future technologies, uh, including floating wind, because uh, we know that to deliver the numbers we're talking about, uh, we'll have to look at the potential of floating wind, especially uh, beyond 2030. A lot of it will, will come from floating capacities. And obviously, battery storage. Uh, battery storage is, is expected to uh, really ramp up significantly in, in all the scenarios that underpin uh, net zero targets. Um, and again, the, the UK has the potential to be a, a leading market there. And surprisingly so, because we don't always attach uh, the UK to, to sunshine, um, uh, solar is a, is a huge opportunity as well um, uh, in the UK. And, and um, we have seen staggering growth in the past couple of years, and it's probably only the beginning of the story. And, and the, 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 we, we should see solar taking a, a large uh, share of the capacities, for instance, at the next uh, CFD auctions next year. Um, what is for sure is that there is still a lot of uncertainty around uh, the actual numbers, especially beyond 2035, how you actually deliver net zero from a generation perspective. Um, if you look on the left-hand side of the, of the slide, the, the, the light blue patch is the range of numbers you can see. If you look at the different scenarios out there, it just shows you how uncertain it is at the moment. Um, uh, what is for sure is that uh, the challenge is, is tremendous. But again, the technologies are delivering, which is, which is the good news. However, and that, that will be my, my last and final slide, uh, you know, this, you know, achieving anywhere near uh, uh, the ambition that we have um, in terms of delivering net zero in the UK will require uh, key enablers to be met. Um, and, I've, and I've categorized them around three big buckets. The first one is around um, lifting some of the key challenges that we face currently in the renewable uh, industry. Um, and if, if, you, if you remember some of the numbers we looked at in terms of growth that needs to be uh, met, uh, that, that presents clear challenges. Um, give a couple of examples there. One is grid, um, you know, the, the, the massive considerable investment will be required in, in the grid uh, to, to achieve uh, the, 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 the numbers uh, we are talking about. An example of that is uh, the offshore grid, uh, um, uh, the, the, sorry, the, 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 the grid set up for offshore wind currently uh, based on, on a system that was uh, made, meant to deliver around 10 gigawatt of offshore wind. And we are now talking about 40 gigawatt by 2030 and, and a lot more in, in the coming decade. And the way uh, the grid is, is structured um, needs to be considerably adjusted. That will require a significant investment. Planning is obviously another key issue because you have the issue of acceptability. We see that a lot on onshore wind at the moment. Um, a lot of projects uh, facing really difficult planning processes. Uh, in Scotland currently, I think our average is, is three years to get through the planning process. A lot of projects fail to secure planning consent. There is issue around uh, the, 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 the height of the turbines. It, it is a challenging uh, area, and uh, that could also uh, become a problem eventually for, for solar as well. Um, innovation will be absolutely key. And uh, you know, innovation will come in different forms. Technology, obviously. Um, we've talked about storage. We've talked about floating. Business models uh, we will be key as well in terms of how we uh, find revenue models for uh, our projects, how we 
also provide services directly to our customers. Um, a, a lot will happen on that front, and it will be absolutely essential to reach uh, the numbers we're talking about. And, and finally, flexibility, which is the right-hand side of that slide. Um, it is clear that to accommodate for so much um, renewable uh, capacity in the system, we need uh, considerable investment in, in, in uh, both supply and demand side flexibility. Um, those numbers quoted here uh, come from uh, the energy white paper from last December and, and others from, from um, a, a recent report from the Carbon Trust. They're just indicative numbers. You, you see various uh, floating around at the moment. Uh, the bottom line is we need a lot of flexibility, both on the demand side and on the supply side. Uh, again, this will require a lot of innovation, a lot of funding, and, um, uh, and, and uh, also uh, innovation on the technology side. Um, and, and that covers things like carbon capture and storage, uh, interconnectors, uh, hydrogen, uh, obviously battery storage, uh, and uh, demand side flexibility. Um, so um, a, a challenge that is uh, absolutely uh, significant, um, technologies that are delivering, but, but key, key transformation that will be absolutely essential to uh, put us on the right uh, track for, for delivery is, is my key message. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, and my role at Scottish Power Renewables absolutely agree with everything that you have said. Um, and it's great to see, you know, renewables in such a positive place in the UK at the moment. But there's clear there's some real challenges to deployment that we need to be able to overcome and at pace. Um, so thank you for that. And can I remind people, please do take the opportunity to um, input your questions into the Q&A. Um, so we'll move on now to Caroline Longman um, to give her perspective um, on um, commercialisation in the nuclear industry. Thank you, Kate. If I can just share my slides. OK, so um, so, yeah, hello, my name is Caroline Longman and um, thank you for the introduction, Kate. I'm speaking on behalf of the UK's National Nuclear Laboratory. So, so we're the UK's government owned uh, national lab for nuclear fission. Um, what that means is we develop, deliver programs of work on behalf of government to ensure that um, nuclear energy makes its contribution to a future clean energy system. So just by way of background today, nuclear power is the second largest source of low carbon electricity in the world today with over 450 operating reactors. Um, uh, in 2018, and that's 10% of the global electricity supply. Um, here in the UK, nuclear has long been the largest source of low carbon electricity. It provides around 40% of uh, our clean electricity supply, um, but almost half of uh, the current capacity is, is due to be retired by 2025. So, so where does that leave us for net zero? So nuclear is a 24 seven low carbon technology. It's demonstrated at scale and, it, and it's provided clean, safe, secure electricity since 1956. So su supplying us with electricity for, for many, many years. Um, so in terms of energy security and, and cost to the economy and the ability to meet a net zero target, planning, planning a future net zero energy system without significant nuclear energy is going to be a very high risk. So I'll just move on to the first slide, if you can see that. Um, so historically, nuclear's contribution is through provision of reliable base load electricity to support a, a wide range of sectors. But the fact is that it's gathering, gathering interest in the nuclear industry is, is that nuclear energy can also contribute to the production of heat and hydrogen to decarbonize other energy vectors, in addition to generating core base load electricity. And nuclear has technology pathways, as you can see here, to hydrogen, ammonia and district heating. Um, so just, just for picking up on the, the UK's hydrogen strategy uh, recently published by Bayes, um, nuclear energy is in fact included as, as one of the primary energy sources to support a variety of hydrogen production technologies. And, and the opportunity to pair nuclear and hydrogen production technologies is not a concept to just consider in the far off future. There are technologies that exist and are proven now that can contribute to the government's clean hydrogen production targets. Um, so there's potential to produce cost competitive hydrogen from all reactor technologies, from gigawatt scale to 
small modular reactors and that they can enable electrolyzer technology to be deployed in, in much greater capacities. Um, and that could be economically attractive for large scale plants. Um, also, uh, potentially excess heat from these plants can be used to drive steam electrolysis, increasing um, electrolyzer efficiencies. So in addition to this, um, high outlet temperatures that are afforded by advanced reactor technologies further unlock the potential for hydrogen protection technologies, which can be driven by nuclear heat directly. So there is a growing international interest in this area and, and growing international evidence that, that we can deliver affordable hydrogen at scale from high temperature reactors. The IA recently um, uh, modeled that you could potentially achieve price, price points of less than $2 a kilogram of hydrogen um, if uh, we can deploy these, these systems in, in time um, for, for to, to, to deliver on decarbonization challenges. So ultimately what differentiates nuclear technology is the high capacity factor and the ability to use both the heat and the electricity to drive down costs. So therefore the nuclear, has, uh, nuclear energy has got the potential to enable hydrogen to re the reach those, those price points by which it can, can displace oil and gas. So there's something else before I just move on that's really important to mention too. Um, and that's the importance of nuclear energy and habitat conservation. So nature's declining globally at rates unprecedented in millions of years through habitat degradation, loss of, and overexploitation. So nuclear energy in that regard has a real potential in respect that it can support a carbon neutral energy system, but, but with that low land usage. So just moving on to the next slide, um, there's been a lot of government activity in the last 18 months. So the, in, the, the independent board that is uh, charged with advising government uh, on, on nuclear innovation um, said we really quickly need to generate the technical and economic evidence to support down select and at scale demonstration of those nuclear technologies that can deliver on net zero. Um, and then following on from that, the direction of government policy uh, uh, for, for nuclear energy's role in a net zero system was outlined in the 10 point plan uh, with the announcement of funding for advanced nuclear uh, in the form of an advanced nuclear fund. Um, and that noted, again, the potential of nuclear energy to provide this high grade heat that could unlock efficient heat production of hydrogen synthetic fuels. So as policy develops in this area, the government has issued a call for evidence and it look, as it looks to build its first advanced modular reactor demonstrator in the UK. And again, the justification behind this is that these systems can be built at lower cost and, put, and both provide the grid with low carbon electricity and generate hydrogen at, school, at scale. Um, so uh, additionally as well, given the high temperatures that they create, um, AMRs uh, could, could potentially power district heating networks by, by uh, 2040. Um, in particular, just narrowing down, the government is looking to explore high temperature gas reactors, um, which it believes could be the most promising model for the demonstration program. So 170 million is gonna be invested in potentially developing these technologies uh, by, in the early 20, uh, by the early 2030s. And what's important here is that we've already in the UK got the skills and capabilities to operate these reactors. Uh, we've, we've, you know, nuclear has, has for many years supported the UK economy through provision of high skilled jobs and the socioeconomic outcomes across, across many regions of the UK. It really supports the levelling up agenda and places UK as a, as a real international leader with our own IP that we already have. So we're in a good position to export the products and services that that this industry uh, help, has helped us create. So we've already got the skills and in infrastructure to deliver on this. Um, the role for nuclear energy in scale hydrogen production is included in the recently published hydrogen strategy, as I mentioned before, and also in the recent sustainable aviation fuel mandate consultation by the Department for Transport, which also proposed that nuclear energy is a, a eligible energy source um, to produce SAF due to the, the, the low land impact and the high carbon savings we mentioned earlier. Um, the other one is the industrial decarbonisation strategy published in March this year. That stated global examples of nuclear use in many industrial processes, including chemical processing, desalinisation, and as well as wider applications such as district heating. So more recently, designers of new, new and advanced modular reactors focus on systems with smaller power outputs 
and they can offer flexible power generation and storage as, as well as further applications or beyond the grid, so to speak, such as sort of industrial process heat and, and low carbon hydrogen production and, and, and synthetic fuel production. Um, so our own organisation and uh, the National Laboratory, uh, we, we're leading a nuclear hydrogen programme and that's there to deliver the evidence base that is really going to enable us to understand what needs to be done for nuclear enabled non-electric applications to achieve the price points that it needs to deliver on the government ambitions. So we're delivering things like te technical ev evaluation of coupled nuclear hydrogen technologies and identifying applications of nuclear generated um, hydrogen in the future energy uh, systems and supporting investors and developers make those informed decisions about the energy system and, and the inclusion of hydrogen production in it. So just on the last slide in summary, you know, while renewables like wind and solar will become an integral part of where our electricity will come from by 2050, we're always going to require a stable low carbon base load uh, form of nuclear. But in addition to that, and, and I hope uh, you know, the message has come across really strongly here, that there is real potential and many routes for nuclear energy to produce cost competitive hydrogen at scale. Um, so the opportunity is evolutionary. Hydrogen from nuclear energy can be generated now at scale, but newer technologies, including advanced nuclear reactors, offer increased benefits due to those higher efficiencies and higher operating temperatures. And these systems can be deployed alongside, alongside gigawatt scale reactors, and they can be deployed commercially, contributing to a 2050 net zero target. So we've got challenges to overcome to realize this opportunity. Nuclear can be low cost, uh, and the regulated asset based model due to pass through parliament next month could halve the cost of nuclear um, versus, versus what's predicted at Hinkley Point C. So if, if nuclear can achieve these costs, then, then the energy systems catapult predicts potentially in excess of 50 gigawatts of nuclear deployment to, to support electricity, hydrogen and um, SAF production by 2050 in, in a lowest cost energy system. Um, so Nuclear energy has got a critical role um, to play net zero. We've discussed its role in base electricity. It's reliable, operating 24-7, generally operates 80 to 90% of the, the time of its lifetime. Um, it's incredibly energy dense. So, so to put this into context and a, and a real just a ballpark kind of order of magnitude, if you, if you repurpose all the land currently devoted to fossil fuel refining for nuclear sap production, you would produce a volume of fuel of a a similar order of magnitude as we use today, carbon free today from the same land area. Um, generates no life, type, life cycle carbon emissions at the point of generation and has the lowest life cycle carbon emissions um, according to the IPP, IPCC equivalent to wind and it's commercialized technology already. Um, so, so really, we, we, we really got to move forward quickly to enable nuclear energy to, to, to play uh, its part in a net zero energy system. So I have to say, Kate. Thank you, Caroline. Um, that was an um, extremely useful presentation and um, it's interesting to see how the different parts of the energy market are evolving as well as we look at that future energy mix um, to deliver our sort of net zero carbon future. Um, and of course, with this increase in demand and um, all the different types of supply, um, we can't actually um, have that net zero system unless we have the infrastructure to get that uh, electricity to the, the points of demand, um, which takes us, um, I think, neatly on to Harmeet Bawa, who is going to talk to us about that uh, infrastructure investment that's needed for that net zero energy transition. So over to you, Harmeet. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, let me just get the slides on. And... Okay. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, um, the, the, there's, there's a distinct advantage and a disadvantage in, in, in going last because so many important points have already been made. And uh, I think Tristan and Caroline I really set this up uh, perfectly for me. Uh, just a couple of points for, 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 for any of uh, the people that don't know us. I mean, Itachi ABB Power Grids is, of course, 
uh, <clears throat> the joint venture of Itachi and ABB. Uh, we are specialists as far as technology is concerned, uh, primarily in the grid space. Um, so we are committed to making the grid stronger, smarter, and greener. Um, I think to, to, to sort of kick off from um, some of the points that were made, uh, the latest IPCC report, uh, which calls us in a code red situation or IEA reports and REF are all quite clear in terms of the urgency to, to, to address uh, the unprecedented uh, <clears throat> climate change challenge that we have. Uh, what I will also try to do today is, is bring a bit the global perspective um, and then, of course, <clears throat> you know, uh, come back into the UK. Uh, so, as I said, we are headquartered in Switzerland. We operate in about 90 countries. Uh, and uh, we are now seeing a, a, a pattern and a consistency of many topics around the world, which is why I thought it would be useful to, to share those at this forum. So, I think it suffice it to say that the case and the urgency to accelerate the energy transition is quite clear uh, and, and quite Quite honestly, I think the discussion now has to move on from the why and the what to the how and how fast, because we know what needs to be done. Um, and we know that, you know, time's running out. So I think it's now going to be a question of how we get about it and, and how fast we can do it. But it's encouraging to see that countries around the world are now definitely stepping up the game in terms of the efforts, the ambitions. Uh, and But what's needed now, of course, is to, to turn that vision um, into action. So moving on, um, what I want to, to, to share on this slide is basically, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that since the energy sector represents nearly 70% of the emissions, uh, obviously the energy transition uh, will be key to achieving the overall carbon neutrality vision uh, that, that most countries are now setting up. Um, I think it's also evident now that electricity will be the backbone of this uh, emerging energy system. Um, and when it comes to clean energy transition, in addition to the kind of growing demand from the current sources, uh, we also see a clear trend in terms of growing electrification of transportation sector, uh, from industry, from buildings, and so on and so forth. So I think um, there is a compounding effect taking place in terms of uh, demand for clean electricity, uh, <clears throat> which is uh, unarguable. Um, it's also obvious that renewables will play the central role as we shift away uh, from the fossil fuel-based uh, generation. Uh, and uh, with there will, of course, be evolving energy carriers uh, we, we talk about hydrogen, we talk about other areas, uh, which will complement the direct electrification and also help to address the hard to evade sectors or those sectors where we cannot um, immediately get electrified. Um, the one important point that I will also dwell on later is that technology will be absolutely critical in order to achieve the speed and the scale uh, that is required uh, for the net zero uh, ambitions to be fulfilled. Uh, and I think it's also important to understand that this new energy system is, 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 is going to be very, very different from the one uh, that we've been used to seeing. And I, I'll also dwell on that uh, on the next slide. But I think it's also important to point out that, that as IEA clearly states, that avoiding new emissions is not going to be enough. And if we don't do anything about uh, emissions from existing infrastructure, uh, then we will definitely fail to, to, to achieve the climate goals. And from a government perspective, I think there is a clear need uh, to adapt and adopt policies and regulations that can enable the deployment of this technology uh, and facilitate business models that can help us to achieve uh, secure, sustainable, and scalable uh, energy infrastructure. So as moving on, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the grid is evolving quite rapidly. Of course, uh, I won't go into every element of, um, of this uh, particular uh, slide, but I think it's quite clear that the, the, the sort of the, the very elementary flows that we used to see 
which then moved into you know multi-directional flows uh, and now we see of course uh, a huge amount of distributed power coming on board uh, we see intermittent power in, in large quantities etc so i think uh, you know the, the complexity of the grid is is definitely increasing uh, way more than than it ever was which is again making the the hard case for uh, technology uh, deployment. Uh, and as, as Kate mentioned as well, I mean, it's no point uh, looking at generating more and more renewables and setting huge targets, etc. Uh, if, for example, we don't take a holistic view of the power value chain, um, and um, yeah, uh, as I describe it, I mean, if, if we don't pay attention uh, to the grid, uh, which is a significantly under-invested sector in the past, uh, you know, it is a vital link in the chain, and 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 so uh, it 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 will be a case of all dressed up and nowhere to go. Um, and we're already seeing that in in some parts of the world where they've generated a lot of uh, uh, you know good clean power, but the grid infrastructure has fallen behind, uh, and therefore uh, we're not really being able to maximize uh, the use of that. Uh, it's also important to mention that in this grid, we need to build resilience, uh, capacity, flexibility, uh, and of course, strive for greater reliability and efficiency. But at the same time, we, we see also a lot of new demand and supply complexities. Uh, I mentioned some of the supply complexities with distributed power and renewables. Uh, but again, on the demand side, we see uh, huge demands coming from electric mobility, data centers and these are all adding uh, if you like to the to the load and the quality of power required uh, therefore i mean it's quite clear that uh, without significant grid investments we could definitely end up jeopardizing uh, uh, the, the the climate goals the last point i want to make on on that slide is that we need to bear in mind the long gestation period involved in building tnd infrastructure uh, which is a further impetus or a warning that we need to start acting fast um, if we are to distribute uh, or transmit and distribute these uh, hundreds of gigawatts of renewable energy that we plan to produce uh, and reach it to, to, to where, it's, uh, where it's needed. So moving on from there, uh, I, I just want to refer here to a study that's being uh, carried out at the moment with the World Economic Forum and Accenture is also involved, uh, where you know we've been looking at a kind of a global picture. Um, and in this focus report, uh, we came to some conclusions uh, which uh, really cut across geographies, but of course certain specific challenges and opportunities as well uh, to consider when expanding or reinforcing the grids. Uh, in this map, not to go into a lot of details, but I just mentioned a few. Uh, I, I use the example about places where you know we have generated a lot of renewable power, uh, but, but now we need to, to think about actually reaching it. One example is in Germany, uh, where we've got a lot of offshore wind power now in the north, but the load centers in the south, and now we're looking at how to kind of uh, get that power to where it's needed. Uh, similarly, uh, there are some positive examples as well. We recently uh, commissioned the Nordlink project, which connects Germany and Norwegian hydropower, uh, variable renewables pushing through to Norway and, and bringing in hydropower. So these interconnections don't only help to maximize renewable penetration, but uh, they also enable electricity trading and relieve bottlenecks. Uh, and increase power security. Similarly, Japan has announced uh, ambitious plans for 45 gigawatts of offshore wind power, uh, and they are also expecting to add about 23 gigawatts of new transmission capacity. Um, and in addition to this, of course, in Japan, we have to address the issue of two different um, frequency levels with 50 hertz and 60 hertz uh, in terms of optimizing the grid and, and getting the cross-regional electric electricity flows going. Uh, again, US is an example where uh, they want to add a lot of renewables, but also need desperately to upgrade the aging networks and to develop new grid infrastructure as well uh, to be able to decarbonize, uh, keeping in mind, you know, the resilience factors and the reliability. I'll come back to UK later, but I think uh, it was uh, interesting that just yesterday um, the announcement was made that uh, uh, UK is going to target all its um, electricity from clean energy sources by 2035. 
Um, and, and of course, uh, through a major boost in renewables uh, to cut the carbon emissions by 78% as, as the target that, that's been set by the UK. And this, of course, includes the plans to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. Now, in the world of grids, 2030 is, is tomorrow, if not yesterday. Uh, because, I mean, we're only sort of nine years uh, away, which is not a, a great length of time uh, if we need to build that capacity. Again, Australia is focusing on simplifying its planning processes to speed things up. And so all I would say here is suffice it to say that accelerating the clean electrification and the massive influx of renewables needs to be supported by significant and timely reinforcement and expansion uh, of the grid network. So my last slide here, uh, I, I indulge, as I said, in, in, in talking about uh, technology. Uh, uh, and, and I singled out one type of technology. Um, of course, uh, we are extremely proud to have pioneered uh, HVDC. Um, and HVDC Lite, of course, is the VSC version of this uh, uh, HVDC technology which is now um, you know, a much sought after solution uh, for basically a lot of applications, including integrating offshore wind, including uh, enabling inter interconnections, et cetera. The good thing is it can be deployed underwater, underground, and it's highly compact uh, with low energy uh, losses, uh, which, is, which is the sort of value proposition. We have really increased the capacity and capability of this technology now. So we can actually carry up to 5,000 megawatts of power uh, across up to 2,000 kilometers at 800 kV voltage levels uh, with really without compromising on the losses. And, and the interesting thing is that based on life cycle assessment, compared to previous generations of this technology, we can also cut uh, significantly over the lifetime uh, CO2 impact by two thirds. Um, so I think that's uh, a big bonus. What I have on the right hand side really is just to bring in, as I said, the UK perspective. Uh, we have of course been very heavily involved uh, in, 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 in the evolution uh, of the grid in, in, in the UK and at present, uh, we are working on a number of uh, key significant projects, uh, many of which, by the way, if not all, are deploying this uh, HVDC solution. Uh, so without going into all of them, of course, the Dogger Bank, uh, AB and C, uh, you know, we're building the, the uh, integration of, 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 of these wind farms uh, offshore. The interesting one I also want to mention is Shetland, uh, which incidentally is Europe's first multi-terminal HVDC link. And this in a way is a forerunner uh, to the topic of offshore grids, which Tristan mentioned as well at the start. Um, and so the other topic of course is interconnections. And as you can see here, uh, you, you know, the UK has always been sort of ahead uh, on, on, on building these interconnections all the way back to the East-West uh, interconnector we did many years ago in Ireland, Wales, and recently IFA2, which is the UK France one, and the North Sea Link uh, connecting UK with Norway. And I think going forward as well with Europe, uh, trying to have a more uh, connected and uh, interconnected system, uh, this would be a, a, a key area uh, to focus on. So let me conclude by saying that in addition to technology, of course, there will be other enablers and catalysts that are required to facilitate the acceleration of the energy transition. Uh, but one thing is quite clear, that if we don't see collaboration at the scale that is required, um, and the previous speakers also mentioned that, when I talk about collaboration, it's ex across stakeholders, across sectors, across geographies. Uh, we just also need to ensure that, you know, the overall energy transition is a just one um, and, and work together to kind of uh, power the world uh, without uh, consuming the earth as such. So thanks a lot. And I uh, hand back to you, Kate. Thank you, Harmeet. Um, uh, that was a, a 
superb presentation uh, and I particularly like your point at the end there about the collaboration that's needed across stakeholders um, and across geographies. I, I also agree that's absolutely essential for this massive transition that we're having to make um, to create that net zero future that uh, we all believe in and is, is necessary to be delivered. If I could ask um, all the speakers in this session to switch their cameras on, we'll move now into um, a session of Q&A. Um, and there are a number of questions coming through. But if I could perhaps start um, with with Tristan, um, there is there's been a, a lot of coverage in the press recently about power prices and, and that the impact that, that how that's felt across the market. Um, that's created a lot of disruption and certainly a lot of press coverage. Do you believe those high power prices are here to stay? And if we think ahead to that um, new goal that's been set out by the Prime Minister this week on the decarbonisation of the electricity system by 2035, what impact do you think that will have on the, the power prices that we see coming through the system? Thanks, Kate. Uh, I, I feel that, uh, in fact, uh, the net zero challenge that we've described earlier um, is also an opportunity to be uh, more um, independent as a as a, as an energy market from uh, geopolitical or macro factors like the one that we observe at the moment. Um, if you look at what's happening currently on the market, um, uh, the, the primary source of that um, is uh, the, the uh, a supply and demand. Um, uh, issue or in particular uh, materializing around gas. And it's a global issue. Um, it has been, uh, I would say, aggravated is true by the fact that uh, there's been low wind uh, through the months of September. But fundamentally, uh, the, the price crunch is linked to our dependency as a market uh, to gas and the fact that the gas is currently the, the, the marginal price. Um, and I think, you know, we've talked about, uh, obviously, renewables. Uh, we've talked about nuclear. Uh, and uh, as EDF, we, we very much believe that uh, nuclear has a key role to play in uh, the net zero future. Um, these are the technologies that can enable um, an electricity production mix that is uh, both cost competitive and less exposed uh, to uh, global and systemic uh, risks, um, uh, in addition to creating uh, tremendous opportunities, I think, for uh, the UK in terms of uh, jobs and regeneration of territories. And I think uh, nuclear is, historically has been a, a major provider of jobs. And I think renewables are increasingly seen uh, that way as well. And, and I think hydrogen could also tomorrow be one. Uh, and we see that in areas like the, the Northeast, um, with very large projects being put forward, uh, really key to uh, regenerating large parts of the country. Um, so I think, uh, the, in a nutshell, net zero is, is also an opportunity in, in, in many, in many aspects. Thank you, Tristan. And do, do you see, just to, to ask a follow up to that, um, as we deploy more and more renewables into the system or, or look to increase the amount of nuclear that there is um, in the market, do you see um, the demand being able to keep up with that um, as that supply increases? And, and where where do you think that crossover is between demand and supply as we go on that journey to, to 2050? That, that's a great question, Kate. And, and you, from what we see at EDF, we have also a big supply business and we uh, have, uh, as you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of um, uh, B2C clients, but also a lot of business clients of all sizes, uh, both large businesses and small businesses. And um, the, the demand is, is already considerable. And, and, and for us as a business, um, uh, uh, the challenge is to find enough low carbon uh, electricity to meet the demand of our customers. And that's, that's happening today. Uh, and I think that that is only going to um, to strengthen in, in the in the in the coming years, and and when you when you hear um, you know the roundtables of this morning, you, you can see how uh, decarbonization is now at the heart of many uh, corporations across the UK, 
um, of all sizes. And I think, uh, as was mentioned earlier uh, in the polls that were run uh, just before the session, uh, uh, suppliers have a key role to play in terms of you know, bringing and almost evangelizing the right technologies to deliver uh, uh, decarbonization of, of businesses across the country. Um, and, and I think, uh, I think the, 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 so I think it's already there and I think it's, it's, it's going to increase in the, in the, in the, in the coming years, uh, quite significantly. So. Thank you. Thank you. And then, um, so to Caroline, um, with respect to, to nuclear, you talked about the, the 24 seven reliability of a nuclear, um, supply and the introduction of the regulated asset base model that will help bring down the kind of well touted high costs of nuclear. Um, but what do you see as being the main barriers then to the deployment of nuclear in today's market? Okay, thanks Kate. I think that the, the three, the, the, there's three main barriers, isn't there? There's, there's, there's the public perception of nuclear that we need to be open about and address. There's the, the, the question around what we do with the waste, which is, which is often a question that we find ourselves, you know, answering. Um, and, and predominantly, there's the how we address the cost of nuclear. And, and I think in terms of, of that, the latter, it's what makes nuclear expensive is, is two main things. And the first thing is we, we don't, we haven't, we haven't built a nuclear power plant for, for 20 years. So, so we've lost the some of the benefits of learning. And uh, as we start to, you know, the effect of building a fleet means we can access those cost reductions um, that, that you don't get from doing something once in a generation. Um, and the key actually in that respect is nuclear energy is totally proven technology. We know it works. We know the UK can deliver it. And it, it's not, as expensive as most people think, a large portion of the cost is in is in the financing. So we need to take a long term view. These these assets last for many many years, um, and you know if the finance rate can be can be reduced to to, to gov government borrowing costs, then then you're reducing the cost significantly overnight. So that's the cost of nuclear. Um, in respect of you know what we do with the waste, it's often quoted as a as a really strong argument against nuclear. But, but the, fact, the fact of the matter is that nuclear waste is highly compact for the amount of energy generated. Um, and, and really, just to put a bit of perspective on that, uh, the total amount of waste is, is um, just 5 million tonnes of nuclear waste estimated to be produced in the next 100 years. And for context, the UK produces over 5 million tonnes of hazardous waste every single year. So we do need uh, a very tight policy and uh, long-term plans for managing, uh, managing nuclear waste, but we must consider the waste argument in context with, with, with our other industries. And the, 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 the last one I think is really the, the public perception of nuclear energy. Um, and of course there's risks and drawbacks with uh, all types of energy gen generation, nothing is risk-free. Um, safety is a number one priority across the nuclear industry. And, and, and in fact, uh, there was a report, uh, Barclays Nuclear Report for a Decarbonised Future, um, uh, stated that nuclear is the safest form of, of um, power generation out there in terms of annual deaths per amount of energy generated. So I think we really need, we've got a lot of work to do to address that public perception issue. Um, and, and that's recognised and there's activities going on in the industry, outward facing activities to address that. So I think these are the, these are the, main, the main barriers to, to, to deployment. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, and Hermie, you talked about um, the need for a, a stronger, smarter, greener grid. Um, uh, uh, great three ways to describe the infrastructure investment that we need to of the future. Um, but I, I'm interested to hear what do you see as the most important imperatives for that to happen, the key enablers and ca catalysts that can really accelerate that transition in that infrastructure and investment? Yeah, uh, Kate, let me, let me try and sort of uh, keep, it, keep it concise because I think, you know, anything that runs beyond two or three, uh, we tend to forget. But if I was to single out a couple of uh, the most important imperatives, it would be speed and scale. Uh, I think given where we are at this point in time, uh, if we don't pay adequate attention to speed and scale, 
uh, we're going to miss the bus. And, uh, you know, obviously, when we talk of speed and scale, we need to bear in mind that, you know, it's the social angle, the economic angle, and the environmental angle all go hand in hand. Uh, but in terms of, of, of some of the key enablers uh, that I mentioned, in addition to, you know, the, the technology uh, piece, I think they, 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 the obvious ones are the urgent acceleration of the investments in the right areas and the right parts of the world. Uh, the secondly, I think the uh, you know uh, when I mentioned the right part of the world, that you know a, a ton of CO2 is a ton of CO2, uh, and and the cost of abating a ton of CO2 in Indonesia might just be a fraction uh, of what that is going to cost us, let's say here in in advanced Europe. So I think overall, as as uh, when we look at it as a global picture, uh, we need to kind of uh, make sure. Uh, that that angle is taken care of. The second thing would be the deployment of technologies where digitalization will play a big role if we need the flexibility in the energy system and so on. Uh, I think from a government point of view, the policy regulatory framework, they really need to move on this because some of the regulatory pieces are really of another era, as I described, in terms of how things are evolving in the energy system. And we just cannot afford those kind of timelines and permitting processes and so on and so forth. Uh, if the regulatory process does not keep pace with it, we're not going to get it. And that includes new business models, et cetera. The collaboration piece is a no-brainer, and that includes the policymakers, the regulators, technology providers, utilities, uh, you know, consumers even, and so on and so forth. Uh, which could be a big catalyst. Uh, and, and, and finally, as I said, I think the, the just and inclusive uh, transition, uh, you know, so that we're taking a holistic view on it. Thank you. Um, let's see so if we can just ask a follow up to that then. So in terms of the role of technology in facilitating turning um, that vision into action, um, what do you think the key technologies are that will help shape that energy transition piece from, from a power grid perspective? Uh, yeah, thanks, Kate. I think, you know, here I go back to the speed and scale and only technology can get us there uh, because there, are, there, are, there is no shortcut on that. But I think the most important point that I want to make here is that, you know, while it's important to, to continue to talk about innovation and development, and we are at the sort of cutting edge of this, and of course we are going to bring in offshore grids and we're going to bring in all these things. But I think the good news, and as this often gets lost, is that most of the technologies that are required to achieve at least the near and medium term goals, even if you take 2030, for example, we already have these technologies. So really it's not an issue about, you know, that it hasn't been invented yet. We just need to kind of focus on deployment of these technologies uh, on speed and scale. And I think that is what is most important. You have, you know, obviously the HVDC piece and, and, and the evolutions, but you also have a lot of focus now on interconnectors, on fax technologies for, because, you know, power quality is much more a topic now than it was. Uh, you know, energy storage was mentioned. Uh, we also can do a lot in terms of limiting greenhouse gases. We're already looking at, you know, uh, alternatives to SFs. Uh, we're looking at, as I said, digitalization solutions, which is the only way we'll bring the flexibility and efficiency to the grid. So I think there, there are, the, 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 the final message on that is that most of the technologies we need to get us to 2030, 20 are already here. Uh, you know, we, we, that's the good news part. Um, yeah, and, and certainly um, think about it from our own perspective at Scottish Power Renewables. Um, yeah. You know, we are delivering technologies that demonstrate the role that renewables can play in uh, managing system stability. And we've taken our Dersalic wind farm trial to show that uh, we can provide those system services um, and that system restoration of the electrical network from, from wind, which is a huge transition from the days of, of um, a, a just um, uh, wind farms producing electricity going straight yeah. onto the grid. We yeah. actually have an active role to play in that that system restoration piece. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious of, of time. Um, there's been some great questions asked. Um, perhaps just if I could ask and indulge slightly with our speakers and, and in the couple of minutes that we've got left, if I could maybe ask of you to each think of three words to sum up, you know, thinking about the title of our, our session here, Energy Supply and the Net Zero Future, what are the three words 
that you either think need to happen or, or sum up the actions um, from your presentations um, as part of that net zero transition. Um, I'll pick on someone to go first. So mm -hmm. uh, Tristan, do you want to go first? Yeah, I think uh, mine would be, um, clearly the first would be acceleration, uh, because I think that that's really the key, uh, the key challenge we have ahead. Uh, the second one would be opportunity. Uh, for the reasons I've mentioned, I think the, 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 uh, the, the, the acceleration and the net zero challenge uh, should be viewed as an opportunity in many ways to create jobs, to create um, economic growth, to, to create also more um, energy independence. And um, I would say finally, uh, enablers uh, is the last word I would like to, to highlight, which is about, uh, yes, we can get there, uh, but we, we're not going to get there unless some, some of the critical enablers are lifted. And I think the, 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 uh, on the grid side, uh, I think Hamid has very elo eloquently described the, the situation, but I think that that's, that's a very good example of that. Thank you, Tristan. Um, Caroline, from your perspective, three keywords. Oh, you're on mute, sorry. But any words then. <laughs> um, I was struggling to do the three key words, but really in terms of nuclear and its ability to uh, deliver on those non-electric energy vectors, I think uh, my key points are, are starting now. Is, there's no nothing wrong with using existing technology to start the path of accelerated learning going forward to start to get market demand moving, get those skills built up and the infrastructure built, um, and then, then move on to those technologies where you have the increasing efficiencies. So starting, starting now um, uh, is probably my, my, my key one. Thank you, Caroline. And Harmeet? Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Kate. Um, you know, I would, Obviously, if I would pick three words, it would be stronger, smarter, and greener energy system. But I mean, at the end of the day, I think just to kind of conceptualize that, in order to get that, we need to, to deploy the enablers and catalysts, uh, technology being the critical one. We need to achieve speed and scale, and we need to ensure it's done through collaboration and just transition. Thank you. All great points. Um, so I'm sure we could carry on for much longer. Um, and I know I would certainly enjoy that, but I, I'm also conscious that people are probably keen to get their, their lunch break in. Um, so for the audience, um, just to let you know, we have a 60 minute break now. Um, you can navigate back to the RD mobile platform um, or the app and network with attendees and speakers. Um, and I, I believe you maybe already know how to do this, but to, to chat to people perform, um, click directory and find the person that you want to chat to and do take the opportunity to take advantage of the experts that we have at the session today. And then last but not least, just to thank the three speakers, um, excellent presentation. It's great to have that range of perspectives showing us what needs to happen um, to transition to that net zero future across the energy mix and the infrastructure investment and the pace of deployment and the challenges that, that sit alongside that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kate, for moderating the, the session. It was great. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Hello and welcome back to the conference. I uh, hope you uh, had a good uh, lunch break. My name is Fintan Sly. I am the executive director of the Electricity System Operator, and I'm delighted to be hosting uh, this panel entitled An Integrated Energy System Approach to Decarbonization. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be hosting it for, for three reasons, I suppose. Firstly, uh, it's about decarbonization, something I'm hugely passionate about and believe that we need to, to get on and deliver as a society and an economy. Secondly, it's all about how to do that in an integrated, joined up way, which I think is just so essential uh, if we are to hit the hugely ambitious targets that we've set ourselves. But I suppose thirdly and most importantly, uh, I have uh, with me a really great panel uh, who can uh, answer your questions and who can give uh, great insights uh, into this core topic. Uh, and before I introduce uh, Andy, Lynn and Benjamin, who are going to uh, talk to you, just to outline how the logistics of this will work. Each of them uh, has a very short presentation uh, and they'll come on screen and they'll give their, their talk for maybe seven to 10 minutes. And we'll run through each of them from Andy, who will hand over to Lynn, who will hand over to Benjamin. And then after that, we're going to open it up uh, to Q&A. So any questions you have uh, for any of our panelists, please do uh, put them in the Q&A. If I ask you just to please put them in the Q&A and not in the, in the chat, that will make it uh, so much better. So I'm going to introduce the, the three panelists that we have uh, first before I hand over to, to Andy, who's going to do the first one. So first up on our panel, we have Andy Hadland, who is Chief Product Officer at Arenco. Andy, as, as I'm sure we'll, you'll see come through his presentation, is absolutely passionate about net zero. He's passionate about developing young professionals in the, in the industry and about startups and about diversity and inclusion. He's a member of the founding team and he's the Chief Product Officer at Arenco, uh, looking at energy storage and automated uh, artificial intelligence trading. He's also a member of the ESO's Technology Advisory Council, for which I and all of the team are, are hugely grateful for him giving his time and his expertise to that. But he also is a guest lecturer at Imperial College London, at the Energy Futures Lab. He's an EI Council member and a trustee as well. Second up on our panel, we have Lynn MacDonald. Lynn is a DSO Readiness Program Manager at UK Power Networks. She joined uh, UKPN in 2010 and has 11 years utility experience within UKPN innovation and smart grid development teams. She holds a, a Master's of Engineering degree in Electrical and Electronic Engineering from the University of Strathclyde. And Lynn is responsible for overseeing the strategic change program, transitioning the business to a distribution system operator, to a DSO. And this includes overseeing the low voltage visibility program that's installing targeted LV monitoring in distribution substations, in particular to facilitate uh, the take up of EVs. Lynn also oversees UK Power Network smart grid activities in support of Singapore Power's Global Smart Grid Index. And that's an independent study that currently ranks UK, UKPN as the number one uh, smart grid in the world. So great to have uh, Lynn here talking to us about these th things and these issues and getting her perspective. She also uh, chairs UK Power Network's uh, Empower community. And that is a staff network covering all aspects of diversity and inclusivity. And UKPN was awarded third place in the 2020 UK top 50 most inclusive companies uh, to work for. It's a really, really terrific achievement and something I'm sure Lynn is hugely, hugely proud of. Thirdly, uh, on our panel this afternoon, we have Benjamin Cott, who is CEO of LightSource BP Labs. And that, that's BP, LightSource BP's technology division that's working on scaling smart, smart grid digital energy solutions across residential and commercial applications. Uh, previously, Benjamin was founder and CEO of Fabrique, an award-winning online platform that helps optimize building operations, reducing energy consumption, and increasing health and well-being of the, of the tenants. Benjamin holds an MEng, a Master's of Engineering in Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering from a Technical University of Munich, and an MBA from ENSIAD in France. 
He's a member of the Sustainability Advisory Panel of the BBC and the Sustainability Council of the Urban Land Institute. So as you can see, a great uh, panel of, of experts with, with a huge amount of insights makes me feel uh, a little bit out of place, uh, I have to say, among such august uh, company. Uh, but I will do my best to chair uh, the discussion at the end. And as I say, if you have any questions as we go through this, if you could please put them in the Q&A and then we can put them to the panelists at the end uh, of the session. So with that, I'm going to turn you over to our first uh, presenter. Uh, that's Andy. So Andy, if I could ask you to, to come on screen and, and share your content, that would be great. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you, Andy. Yeah. Great stuff. And can you see the presentation, Pinto? Uh, yes, if you could put it in present presentation mode, it'd probably work better for people. Amazing. Right. Hopefully, we are there now. Yep. Perfect. All right. Um, thank you very much uh, for that welcome. Um, Great to be here and um, thanks to the Energy Institute as well for bringing together such an awesome panel. It's great to see them uh, reaching across into the clean power sector um, as well. Um, I'm going to take you through something a little bit more specific than uh, we've been talking about so far and focus on sort of one particular area of this transition to net zero. Um, before I do, I'm just going to give you a tiny introduction to Orenco in case you don't know us. Um, so we've got a uh, market leading software platform called Nimbus that uses automation and AI to unlock flexibility, essentially, uh, worldwide. We can control across um, spot markets, centrally dispatched markets and local control markets. And we essentially have this automated uh, trading platform solution that we've used on our own batteries in the past to, to realize value. But since we developed it, we've started to actually share that and we've, uh, we've now uh, enabling other companies to use our trading software on their platforms as well, which will hopefully accelerate this transition to net zero. Anyway, enough about that, onto problems that we can solve. Wind, it's great, but it's also a problem. Um, and I think something that Brian uh, from Google alluded to a little earlier was, was matching time. Um, and if you look at wind over time here, this is on the transmission system, um, we can see that you know, over the last decade or so, it's grown from not a lot on the left-hand side to quite a lot uh, on the right-hand side. It often gets reported that we're getting you know, 46, I think, percent from renewables last year. But some of the time, it's up at almost 80%. And some of the time, particularly recently, it's down at not very much at all. And that presents a huge challenge if you're trying to balance uh, supply and demand in real time, which is uh, part of Finton's job. Um, so renewables are great, but they present problems. One particular problem that I'm going to focus on among, amongst many is reserve. So for uh, the uninitiated, um, reserve is essentially the excess generation flexibility that National Grid or the system operator maintains so that they can increase or decrease generation in response to system changes if something goes wrong. Availability is paid for as well as paying to adjust um, the generation level. Um, and this is really important. This is one of those like bits in the middle of this transition. It's not just about generating it, but it's about making sure that you can generate it um, and deliver it uh, in match demand. At the moment, roughly, we need two to five gigawatts of reserve available to manage, say, 15 to 45 gigawatts of transmission system demand in the UK. And this need is actually increasing. During the COVID pandemic last year, we saw um, this even more as renewables became the dominant generating class at times, um, particularly during the summer. Um, currently, um, the ESO procures reserve mostly from power plants because um, they don't have many other options at the moment. However, this can cause a bit of a problem because if we have more and more of the generation mix coming from renewables, then there's less power plants 
to get reserved from. Um, and also just sort of stating the obvious, but we can't hit net zero if we're using fossil fuels to provide reserves. So there's a couple of problems here. Um, let's go through in sl slightly more detail about how reserve is currently uh, procured. So if you focus on the left-hand uh, chart here, what happens is if there is not enough reserve on the system, then the system operator has to ask a generator to turn on. Now, most CCDTs um, can turn on to approximately halfway. So they have to be on halfway so that they could then turn up the second half all the way to full to provide reserve. So what happens is you have to pay to turn them on just to be able to access that uh, additional energy at the top. Hopefully that makes sense. But this creates a knock-on effect, a knock-on problem. And um, what if the system is already in balance? What if you haven't got any room for that few hundred megawatts of generation? Where are you going to put it? Well, typically you have to take something else off the system just to get the CCDTs positioned to provide reserve. Um, and typically that's either turning off wind or exporting power on interconnectors because that's all we've got, that's all the options. However, intuitively, I think you can see this is expensive and inefficient, but as I said, there's, there's very few alternatives. What if there was an alternative? Um, well, I'm just gonna, sorry, just before I, I jump onto that, I'm just gonna show you a slide from early on in COVID uh, last year. This is a slide from the transparency forum that National Grid do uh, every week. It's really useful insight into how the system's actually managed. Um, there's a sort of waterfall chart going from left to right that shows where uh, power came from during a particular uh, settlement period uh, on the day. So we got some from nuclear, we had a bit more from CCDT and biomass, we had some from wind, um, and that gave us our transmission system demands, um, which is in blue. Um, and then there was some embedded solar and wind as well to get our full eventual demand on the right hand side of 25 uh, gigawatts. But the charts in the bottom left and right, I think, are the most interesting. In order to balance the system to get enough reserve, they needed four gigawatts of reserve in this instance. Um, they had to, well, the market in the bottom left was giving us three gigawatts of uh, CCDTs, but we needed to create reserve. So it had to bring on five and a half gigawatts of CCDTs to create reserve, which meant on the right hand side, we had to turn off about seven gigawatts of wind just to make sure we had enough reserve. So the system was already balanced, but this was to provide reserve. So to ensure that the lights didn't go off. And um, that's the ESO doing their job. That's all the alternatives they had to, to manage the system. Um, so what happened is during that period, and um, the ESO asked uh, licensed generators if they had any additional flexibility available to help give them more options. Um, in response, I think the day after that call for help went out, um, we proposed, I think, six uh, different options, and one of them uh, had legs, which was a reserve service from battery storage um, that we could code and dispatch autonomously without visiting the site. If you remember back then, it was a bit hard to move around. Um, we worked closely with the ESO and collaborated with them to develop something that would work for them as well. Um, and a one-day trial took place within a month which is pretty impressive uh, all round. Um, and it was successful. It, it proved that you could actually get reserve from uh, storage. So much so that a week long trial then took place in July to test it across a few different market conditions. It's obviously more advantageous in some times than others. And that was successful too. So much so that it was opened up and a three week long trial happened last September with four companies. Um, and that was successful again. And I think um, going on to some of the points from the earlier surveys about cross-industry collaboration, I think this was a fantastic example of the industry coming together under stress um, and enabling different companies to work together to create something new, learning by doing, that happened and was successful during lockdown. The outcome of it was, uh, if I skip to the next slide, I'll explain the graph in a second, um, that you can get reserve from batteries today and it could benefit UK consumers to the tune of a couple of hundred million pounds a year. 
Um, this was based off approximately 100 megawatts of batteries over that three week period, um, saving just short of a million pounds to the end customer, um, and then scaling that up. And this was for one gigawatt of reserve. Obviously, you've seen earlier, we need, might need a bit more than that. Um, and I think it's a you know, fantastic example of innovation under pressure, uh, giving results to customers. Another interesting point here is um, this plot just above is uh, from the live platform. Um, the sort of central line going across uh, the middle is, is sort of zero for a battery. And anything above the middle is the battery discharging or generating, providing power to the grid. And anything below the middle is absorbing power or being a demand or charging up. And this was a one hour duration asset. And what you can see is from about 7.20 in the morning up until about 1.30 in the afternoon, a one hour battery provided about seven hours of full power reserve, positive and negative, as it was needed to the control room. I mean, what a fantastic tool uh, that's cheap, clean, and, and doesn't need to be on to provide reserve. Um, in summary, we managed to prove by working together that, the, uh, that you can secure reserve from flexible sources such as batteries. In fact, you don't have to only procure reserve from um, generators, you can also procure it from demand. Um, and the main thing here is that you don't need to be on to provide reserve. You don't need to leave the engine running in case you're needed. And this fundamental technology difference means significantly cheaper and cleaner reserve, which as I mentioned at the beginning, is essential to being able to achieve net zero and integrate renewables, and it also saves money. Um, what next? Um, so far, batteries have only been allowed to offer reserve in, in trials where they've proved uh, efficient. Um, and what we need to do is we need to evolve markets quickly to unlock customer benefits. But we also need more flexibility to be on the system so that these the pool of choice that the ESO has is big enough that it can be used to actually manage demand. And um, I think, you know, we're not there yet, but this is good to know the solution exists. And if I can take something from last month during the very high prices that everyone knows about, um, the costs of balancing the system um, from the ESO, from that same uh, weekly forum, which is very useful uh, if anyone wants to join it, um, shows that in early September from the 6th to the 12th, uh, the costs, you know, typically it's one to two million a day, um, and it was up at 20 million or even there it says 38. Um, I think when you take into account interconnectors, it was more like 27 million um, on the 9th of September. But the orange bar is the cost of reserve. And that's the thing that this flexibility can help change. So the problem still exists. As I mentioned at the beginning, it's increasing. We've got a solution here, uh, and I think it's great to see us working together to prove it. Um, and hopefully we can uh, all work together to accelerate this. Uh, that's me and looking forward to questions later. I think I'm handing over to Lynn. Thank you, Andy. Just to check, is that coming up for everyone? Yes. Brilliant, thank you very much. My full screen there, if you wanna go full screen. Full screen. Is that now working? Got your presenter view. Um. Apologies, let me just work out which way to extend. I think if you just try swap, um, then just what you had at the top. This one and here? You had the same thing, yep. Is that better? Yeah, excellent. And you actually had the same thing, you just didn't know. <laughs> okay, is that now working how it should? But I would, um, then I would probably just minimize the home. If you click on home, you minimize the top layer and then it's a pretty good resolution. Oh, thank you. Let me just click on home. Yeah, just the top bar goes away. No, go back. Yeah, 
we there. Thank Excellent. you for your patience. You've got it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate everyone's patience without just getting that set up. It's a good afternoon, everyone, and I very much would like to extend my gratitude to Fintan, the rest of my panelists, and the Energy Institute. Um, so briefly, um, I work at UKPR Networks. We're the biggest electricity distributor in the UK, serving 8.3 million homes and businesses across London, the southeast and east of England. Um, and certainly, and this goes for all of the colleagues in the panel and, and those we've heard earlier in today, our customers and communities' needs are changing. Uh, so we are keeping the lights on for about 19 million people. And those everyday habits and choices are forever evolving. And it's important we remain a facilitator. So certainly the next decade ahead of us, decarbonisation is bringing about major change in how our people and communities are actually interacting with the energy market, from the way that we run vehicles, how we heat our homes, use energy, and also there'll be more of us producing our own local energy closer to home. And to give you an example of what we're seeing at UK Power Networks, if I focus briefly on electric vehicles, the extensive modelling that we've been carrying out, building bottom-up in conjunction with local authorities and also with technology experts, we're forecasting within the region of about 1.6 million electric vehicles to 2.7 million electric vehicles connecting to our network by 2028. Now, that's significant if you put that into the backdrop of the fact that today, across our regions, we have about 175,000 electric vehicles. So that's very ambitious, but one that we must facilitate these new choices and particularly greener choices uh, through many of the sectors that our customers are engaging with. What we also have to keep in mind is that whilst our customers are choosing newer uh, evolving daily habits, keeping an eye and thought leadership on new forms of exclusion and inequality. We must ensure that this net zero includes all and basically everyone has the opportunity to participate. Uh, this is most evident taking the COVID pandemic that we've unfortunately all experienced. We learned that 38% of our customers had reduced disposable income. Another feature of the pandemic is the disproportionate effect it has had where it's uneven across households. It has had a larger impact on low income households. So it's imperative that we facilitate and enable uh, net zero whilst ensuring that we keep bills as low as possible due to the economic uncertainties that our customers face. What we also need to consider in that journey is if we spot any inequalities, we must all step up and work together beyond traditional silos, working beyond our sector with our regulators and government to manage these issues, to ensure that everyone can continually to participate through that journey. So we need to communicate, listen and engage with consumer groups and address those all collectively together. Another area that we need to kind of decipher and keep an eye on is that certainly Customers' habits do evolve, they're uncertain. Certainly the net zero target is extremely clear, but there are several pathways to achieve it. So we need to ensure that we are nimble, we build in flexibility, but we ensure that we don't build in overinvestment or mistargeted investment. So we must create a net zero that meets our customer and stakeholder wants, ensure that any exclusion or inequality is addressed promptly, to sustain trust within the zero transition. And also we need to make sure that we look beyond the default position of just building networks. So that's where we must basically look at the full potential of enabling a net zero uh, market that's basically built on a smarter, flexible system. Ultimately, making sure that we first maximise the utilisation of our existing network. Thereafter, then employing flexibility and market-based solutions. We at UK Per Networks have done a distribution network operator first, contracting 310 megawatts of flexibility across our regions, 
namely from electric vehicles and batteries. Also with one of my colleagues on, on the panelists today, Light Source Labs, they're one of our uh, partners in our flexibility community, providing domestic demand side response. Ultimately, by building in flexibility, it makes sure that we can manage the network and also ensure that we look to defer reinforcement costs as far as possible. And only when we've exhausted all those solutions, then we build in a more targeted, deliberate fashion. Another area that we're focusing on across sort of system boundaries is working with the electricity system operator with Finton and his colleagues, where we basically undertook a trial together on power potential. And that really proved the market for reactive services and how that can support sustained reliability support across the distribution and transmission system. And we're gonna to continue to work together to look to roll that trial out to business as usual, out to our Eastern and Southeastern regions by 2028. A key part of maximizing network utilization, supporting us to understand the demand on our network, the specific days and time periods, and also the utilization of the network requires that certainly greater network visibility of our local networks is needed. What I mean by visibility is understanding better what's happening on the network. So what we're doing is there's two main streams. One is using the traditional approach of physical monitoring, so rolling out sensors. And the second also is employing advanced data analytics and tools bringing basically the great work that's happening in the telecoms industry and startup industry and applying that into the electricity sector, looking to better use the data that we have, the new data that we collect from the monitoring devices that we're rolling out. Therefore, we will start to operate in a world where we have measured data and modeled data, and that will help us to understand what is the network utilization of our network. It means we can intervene at the correct time with the correct solution, mixed with forecasting first, understanding where we should care most uh, to basically to uh, manage the network. Second, deploying monitoring to better inform our decisions. Third, through flexibility and also with reinforcement as well. The key things that we're doing under greater visibility of our lo local networks is through this process is actually looking at improving and putting strong pace into the development of advanced sensors. Part of that is looking at how we can advance the factory acceptance testing, site acceptance testing, now employing even digital communications like Zoom and Skype to communicate with manufacturers and vendors across the world to review and approve and design uh, technology together. The second also is we need to actually introduce a lot of digital improvements in the processes for our field staff. How can we make it most safe and efficient for them to install and commissioning monitoring devices on site? And then beyond that, getting that data back in to drive really good informed decisions. So we can basically achieve 100% network visibility coverage so that we can understand what's happening in the network also specifically answering, answering our customers and stakeholders asks where they want us to invest in monitoring. They wish for us to open up data because importantly, by opening up data, we open up new novel, innovative markets and services. For us to achieve net zero, that can only be done if we work through many different companies to create novel services that basically encourages and, and excites customers to basically use energy when it's cheaper and greener. So in summary, my key messages would be for net zero to be achieved, customers and communities must remain central. We have to work beyond traditional silos to address any inequalities or exclusions. Also, we need to ensure that we act with enabling a smart, flexible system to drive efficiencies so that net zero is delivered at the lowest possible cost. And we must invest in greater visibility at the lower voltage networks for us to unlock the flexibility opportunities for those to participate in this next journey. So I'll pause there and then pass on to my next panelist. So thank you very much.
Thanks, Lynn. Uh, I'm trying to get this set up. So I think you've already heard me earlier, uh, which is which is great. Um, you should be able to see my screen now. Someone just heads up, thumbs up. Benton, was that a yes? So we can see it, but we can still see the uh, slide sorter on the on the side. Yeah, that's. Um, I, I can't really get rid of this um, when I go into oh, full screen there. and it messes up my screen. Hopefully, it works. Uh, uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ben Benjamin Cott. I'm CEO of Lightsource Labs. Um, you find me in what looks like a nice sunny office background, but I'm actually perched way in the in a corridor on a bridge at Intersolar in Munich. Um, but don't, it seems to have a lot of exhibition space, but not many tables or anything where you can have a a conference call from and on my 4G modem. So, so far, so so good. Um, only needs to hold up for the next 10 minutes. Fintan, um, thanks for the amazing introduction. I, I tend to think I like my I like my profile. I tend to think it it reads pretty well, has some good names on it. But then when I hear other people on the panel, I, I realize it's actually pretty average and especially yours is yours is quite some some way ahead of that. But but appreciate the um appreciate the nice introduction. Uh, I think um, what, what we're talking about or what I wanted to talk to you about is actually pretty good complement to what we heard from, um, from, from the other presenters because we're with Lysos Labs really on the consumer side of uh, energy flexibility. Um, first of all, just 30 seconds on Labs itself. Labs is part of Lysos. Lysos BP is one of the largest uh, global developers of solar PV. Uh, from 20 solar PV power plants, 20 to 200 megawatt, overall two gigawatt today developed. And as you've recently seen, they want to build 25 gigawatt by 2025. So quite um, quite, quite some, some work still to do in a short amount of time. And Lightsource, as the name uh, indicates, Lightsource BP is 49% owned by BP. So we're a small um, part of this. We're only 30, 35 people who sit in London and three other countries working on next generation technology for residential energy flexibility. And that's also our mission, as you can see here. Um, when we say grid, grid edge assets, um, we're actually, interestingly, not really talking about the um, large scale power plants that we have with, we, we have access to through Lysos BP or, or, or be it that might come in the future. But we're actually really looking at the residential side, imagine homes, um, EV charges, batteries, storage, PV, and so on, but also small scale CNI, small scale commercial and industrial uh, qualifies as well. Uh, a little bit of context, and I'm going to spend exactly 15 and a half seconds on this because you know it all and you've seen it all many times probably today. Why are we doing this? Clearly because this is the decade of change. Um, I think many of us have been around the block a few times with this. I speak to many suppliers here at InterSolar who've been at it for 10, 15 years, and everybody agrees it's now kicking in, it's now starting post-COVID, but also by 20. 2020, 2030, by the end of this decade, we have to essentially solve climate change or, um, or we're going to be in trouble. Um, and on the, uh, on the technical side, it means massive decentralization, massive prosumer, massive bi-directional and, and peak generation. And especially on the consumer side, we hear a lot about large scale batteries, large scale power plants, but this is kicking in on the consumer side and eventually every home will be, will be like that. Um, how does, uh, how does Tribe, how does Lightsource Labs um, uh, come into this and where does Lightsource Labs sit in the picture? What Labs really does is we provide a full, fully integrated and a full-fledged or complete uh, stack of solutions for residential smart energy management, if you will, or grid flexibility, starting with what you see at the bottom here, hardware going all the way to consumer apps, um, which and, and covering everything in between. So for instance, on the hardware side, we have our own gateway our own compute unit um, that is installed on the customer's premises with meters as well. Uh, it can be multiple meters, so you can support up to maybe 30, 50 meter feet with the new generation. Uh, but then on top of that, we have um, quite a deep uh, software stack, first of all, an IoT platform uh, that runs both on the gateway as well as in the cloud in, in real time, um, making, making use of the sub-second meter, meter data coming in. We have a, um, and lots of connectors to different equipment because we need to integrate with different devices uh, uh, in terms of the DPV inverters, batteries, EV charges, and so on. On top of that, we have what we call the Internet of Energy layer, which is really where the smart algorithms sit, um, forecasting, prediction, weather analysis, and so on. 
um, and also enabling peer-to-peer -peer trading. Uh, we had a, a pilot we ran with Tonic Energy and BP on this a couple of years ago. And at the very top, as you see, we have the consumer-facing side of this, which is the tribe or managing management system, or rather the, um, the, the consumer app as well as the fleet management solution. And I have a, a view here, just three short examples, um, and then I'm, I'm, I'm finished, as you can see here, and uh, one heads up on how we work in the market. So three short examples. This is where the hardware sits in the home. Uh, so it's between the inverter and the distribution board, and you can manage, uh, monitor and manage all the devices you see on the left-hand side, but also on the right-hand side, you can actually integrate with wirelessly or through, through wired connection with pretty much everything you have in the home and that has a data output or that is manageable, be that HVAC, um, uh, plug loads, the washing machines, and of course, all the way to the, um, to the EV chargers. Uh, on the uh, on the middle middleware side or the asset management, apologies, these aren't fantastic screenshots. They, they deserve probably more prominence, but we have an asset management system, which you can see on the left. These are some of our installations we have in the UK. Uh, as, as usual, you can dive down to the to the asset level, but then also aggregate it all the way up, um, as, as we said before, all the way into a VPP, a virtual power plant. And then the center, it's not very clear from the screenshot at all, but uh, Lynn has just said the importance, has just mentioned the importance of sensors, data, and algorithms and forecasting. That's exactly what we do at the residential level, where we look into where the data, we look into predictions on the power demand, we look into the preferences of the homeowner, um, and we look at the cap capabilities and the um, capacities of the devices that are connected and build uh, 24, 48 hours ahead, the optimum load profile, uh, charging and discharging load profile, for, load profile for the home. And as we said before, and as we heard from, from Greco as well, um, it's the important thing is to optimize each individual asset or home rather site for us, but then obviously to aggregate this up at the UKPN level and in between really at the microgrid level, be that a new development, be that a, um, a fleet uh, a fleet operation or be that just, just a street and a postcode with a few homes. And then on top of it, not to go into too much detail here, but just to flash um, some sort of views on what this looks like. We have the consumer app, which can be white labeled by our partners, which uh, on the one hand allows the consumer to view what's really happening in the homes, to see the typical sort of flow chart there in the middle, but then they can see how much they spend, how much they save. They can go, they can geek out on the right hand side, see a bunch of charts and see what's happening, but then also set every individual device either automatic, so either manually. I want my washing done, my laundry done at 6 a.m. and my EV to have 50 miles. Thank you very much. Everything else just optimized, or they just leave it all to the device and to try to optimize everything for for cost or for carbon, for instance. Last but not least, um, just to wrap up um, in terms of go to market, we've been going for quite a while, I think four or five years. I've only been around for 18, 21 months at, um, at Labs, but the big challenge for us, uh, one of there's lots of challenges. One of the key challenges was actually the technology is great. The technology is there. We can, we will always work on improving the technology, but how do we go to market? How do we distribute that? And how does it scale? And um, we have sort of the three, three pronged approach on the one hand, we work with OEMs, be that inverter manufacturers, charge point manufacturers to make their devices smart or potentially smarter and or integrate them in the DPP context that I described earlier. Secondly, uh, as Lynn just mentioned, we work, uh, we look to work directly with grid operators, network operators to help them on the flexibility side of things. That requires not just the technology we have, but also assets. And that's what everybody is struggling with. So watch the space. And on the right hand side, uh, as you can see there, that's a, a relationship that uh, has been working for a few weeks. We're looking to work with utilities and uh, retail operators to provide them with a better way of managing their customers' assets, but actually just managing their customers and getting more, more insights into them. And potentially now with all the challenges that we're seeing on much more fluctuation management, hedging or the lack of it, and grid management, we need even more of that going forward and not less. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here and um, thank you very much for the uh, for the bandwidth and for the attention, I'll hand over back to Fenton at this point. Super, thank you very much. So Ben, if you uh, keep your camera on and we'll ask uh, Lynn and um, Andy as well to, to come back on uh, and join us and we'll uh, ask some questions. So just to remind people, if you want uh, to pose a question, if you just please put it in the, in the Q&A uh, as part of the, on the screen, then, then we can pose that to uh, the panel here. But just in advance, that I might uh, just kick off with a with a with a question. Really, I suppose picking up something, Lynn, that you said towards the end around customers and consumers needing to be 
central to all of this and maybe just to ask each of you sort of what are the key things we need to do as an industry in order to ensure that we engage consumers and our customers and bring them with us um lynn i might start with you since you're the one that you, it was your comment that provoked the question no th thank you very much i think the first thing is um we have to take a sort of market and services activity um i think when we're doing any form of design we first have to think of what customers will require of that service so i think it's really starting from the design principles having that customer at the heart of it ensuring and i think certainly in the last sort of five years we're, we're seeing that engagement and focus group activity that co-design and collaboration a great example uh, uh, from uk Pro networks is our flexibility program is very much designed with the flexibility community um, being humble to be sort of disrupting and trialing out externally similar to the likes of amazon and others i think inherently as engineers we used to just wait till things were near perfect um, i think we've, we've started to be braver and that's something where we have to continue that boldness it's uh, similar to an activity we've done recently where, where we're opening up our data and um, so i think we've now opened up about 200 data points um, across our assets neighboring with uh, the electricity system operator opening up sort of 2.5 gigawatts view um, and i think ultimately really it, we put that out in beta form and continually to basically improve and advance in time so i think in short one is start customer and communities have to be at the start second of all be brave and bold testing the market in production and third is always doing that feedback loop did we meet the expectations could we go further or could we do something differently thanks and maybe same question to, to andy do do you have a perspective on that yeah i think we're a little bit more focused on the kind of uh large-scale markets but something we're interested in is sort of partnership so um markets are really complicated they're really, really, really complicated. Um, so for us, initially, it made sense to sort of go big uh, or go home. So you could put the same amount of effort and time into coding a platform that controlled, say, a 50 megawatt battery as a five kilowatt battery. And actually, you're able to access bigger markets, which is generally the theme of aggregation. Like, it allows you to aggregate something up so you can be big enough to participate. Um, but the neat thing about being you know, a cloud-based uh, platform that, that integrates well is that we could partner with aggregators and then we have we take that complexity from different markets, use those different forecasts, and then plug into uh, other aspects um, because there's a lot of difference, uh, I think, um, when you're you know, at domestic level, you're a very, very small level. And I think maybe you know, some massive companies could do it. But I think it's collaborating and knowing your bit that you do well, which is we automate and do it quickly, and then partnering with someone else to create something uh, better together. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. We'll, we'll ask Ben. But I, I thought I, I was uh, captivated by those pictures of the app. I was like, I have to go out and get that. But anyway, uh, Ben, just your perspective on how do we make sure that we engage consumers and bring them with us? Yeah, thanks, Fenton. It's actually really, really uh, poignant, um, uh, relevant point because. It's, I'm, a, I'm an engineer by training, as you as you mentioned. I love engineering. I love technology, and technology isn't the problem. The problem is value proposition, and you see this all the time. And I saw it in the presentation we had here, and we probably still have it too much when I came in two years ago. You ask an engineer about the value proposition, they come back with with features and with technical capabilities, and the end consumer, they don't understand any of it. I understand maybe 70% on a good day of the stuff that I'm talking about, and I've been at this for a little while. So it's really about, and, and this is called, is a practice called design thinking, and I think we have we're much more used to this now especially software development it's called agile but if you look at industrial design in the valley in the late 90s it happened to be there it's it's, it's, it's how old i'm i am um, it was called design thinking at the time you really work backwards from the impact you want to achieve both at the global level and climate change but also from the impact you want to achieve at the consumer level and that is really about value proposition how can i make your life better how can i make your life easier how can i help you save money how can i make you more comfortable or probably greener or something like that the features are what makes it happen and i can show you a list of 120 features we have in this app and the box and all these other things but it doesn't matter so as an industry as a company as a person as, a, as an individual as a company as an industry i think always we need to get much better at communicating that on the one hand and also better at delivering it and there's a corollary question to that which is 
why hasn't it scaled, which is we need to connect the dots and get much better. As Andy just said, and then as well, it's about partnerships and ideally providing a turnkey solution, not just to big B2B customers, but also to the end customer that ideally just works. And fingers crossed, because in the Wi-Fi space and in the internet space, it took 10, 20 years to get there. And it doesn't just, it doesn't still just work, but that's exactly where we have to go. Uh, hopefully it, it, it doesn't take as long, right? I mean, I think technology adoption, there, there, there is a curve I've seen, right, that, that shows that, that it accelerates dramatically. Um, if I might sort of turn a little bit back to the title of, the, of this session, which was around uh, an integrated energy system approach, and just ask each of you, you know, from your perspective, what do we need to do to make sure that, you know, maybe looking at the UK or, or if you want more globally, what do we need to do to ensure that we do have that integrated approach across the different energy vectors, that new term that we've, we've come up with uh, recently, energy vectors? Uh, Andy, do you want to kick us off there, if that's OK? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're just talking about design thinking is spot on. Uh, I completely agree. And I think um, I'll kind of keep it to power for now just to leave a bit of room. Um, but a lot of the way that we design services have an intrinsic assumption that you have a generator uh, or a demand. And from there, if you build up um, solutions with that fundamental assumption, it's very difficult to um, go, you know, storage has had this for years. Like, is it a generator or a demand? And it's like, that's the wrong question. Um, it's both. And actually, like with any good design, if you design for the extreme case, you then find that the complicated cases um, uh, can be handled um, because you've designed for the extreme case. And that trial I mentioned was a, a really good example. You know, is it positive or negative reserve? It was both. And, um, and actually, it's more valuable if it's both because you can change your mind. You don't know which way you're going to be wrong. If you did, you'd correct for it. Mm. Um, and, and so I think um, questioning our most fundamental assumptions um, I think is the starting point and, and that might reveal new insight. And I suppose that the main one um, that I'd encourage everyone to think about is time. Um, we, we think very much about megawatt hours uh, and we don't think uh, from the perspective of time. And if you sort of, instead of looking like this, if you look at it side on, if the world looks very, very different and it becomes solvable. So Great point, Andy. We always need to examine, you know, from what perspective are we looking at these problems to make sure that we're looking at them robustly. Uh, Lynn, uh, can I ask you the, the, the same question? Is what are those uh, key things to ensure that we're taking a whole system approach? I'd almost think that the first starting point is probably starting off at the local authorities and the regional areas. I think with from a net zero perspective, I think we're all got a common goal to reach that net zero carbon emissions target by 2050. Um, but I think we acknowledge the sort of difference of uptake and maybe the, the different consequences different communities may face, urban, rural, the different makeup. So I think really it's having those close discussions across industries with local authorities and their regional planning, understanding their plans and building that into our own forecasting. And I think that forecasting discussion doesn't sit in one vector like electricity, it's looking across. Because what we also need to look at is in terms of that planning and development, how we can make least disruption. Because in, in the activities that we do that's non-reinforcement or reinforcement, that involves a form of capital expenditure and operational expenditure across all vectors. So if we can be more coordinated, uh, which I think that's been demonstrated quite well in past street works, uh, looking at multi-utility activities, then really we need to consider that. So really, it, when I'm looking at that whole systems approach, first is having that local lens, looking at how we can best serve their needs as an industry. And then beyond that area is, is really starting to consider around making sure innovation is start, still part of the discussion. Um, I think there's we've got a lot of answers, and I think but I think through this journey we'll have continual positive uh, le lessons to learn, and we still need to have an, an open environment to innovation uh, where we can trial to best inform knowledge, where we can have successful successfuls and successful failures, um, but making sure that, that that innovation failure is not to the detriment of our customers, and we, and we do that in a very isolated fashion. But the, the anything that comes through success will we scale fast. Um, and I think uh, certainly across all the network operator 
communities across all vectors, there's a big innovation hub. I think UK is unique in that space. Um, and certainly I'd love to see continued innovation amongst all collaborators. Super. Uh, thanks, Lynn. And I, I'll pass over to Ben, but maybe before I do, just say thank you to Emily, who put in a, a, a comment there around, uh, and your comment around time and pointing out that if we if we looked at the problem slightly differently, we might get some some really interesting answers. Thanks for that, Emily. But Ben, maybe just the, the same question then to you, just around that joined up thinking or cross vector thinking. Yeah, that's really, I like the name cross vector. I need to, I need to add that to my repertoire. I haven't had this one yet. So I mentioned connecting the dots earlier and which is exactly what, what you were saying. And when, when we think about connecting the, the, the dots or, or when, when I think about it rather, it's, it's often a, you start with, with the technical side again, you think about, you know, integrating devices, it's literally drivers, it's protocols, it's standards. That all helps and that's really good. And we need more of that. And, um, the, the, the idea is because also here at InterSolar, you've got 20 charge point suppliers that all look very similar, right? And the battery guys, it's the same thing, be that commercial, be that, be that consumer level, the same with inverters for years, already, right? So how do you how do you differentiate on the one and then how do you integrate it on the other hand? That's kind of where we come in with, with, with labs. But the, the correlate, the complement to that is that I wanted to mention here is really business models. So what ultimately drives this is the business model is how do you make money out of this? And, I don't mean this in a bad way, I mean this in a good way, because you don't just have the software stack and, and the different layers and the hardware components and the silos and the industries, but you also have the partners in the supply chain working together. And there must be enough money to go around. There is enough money to go around, but right now everybody just looks at their thing, maybe one interface to the next one, but there's no holistic view. There's no systems thinking other than, than, than Lynn who has to provide and, and you and have to provide systems thinking at the systems level, but more technical. But in the industry, I think it's a really, we just changed our business model, our own, from selling hardware with a margin and praying for customers to sign up to our app after 12 months to the premium version. And we changed this to a SaaS model where we have the baseline, you know, for, for, for the service, for the, for the software stack, then we have a user, a sort of user, user level that goes up with users. What happens on the other side in terms of grid flexibility services, balancing capacity in terms of consumers, that's all the side of the part, right? So we're hoping that that business model, for instance, it helps our partners make more money. And that's what needs to happen across the stack, otherwise, or the, or the chain, otherwise it won't work. And once we have it, then it drives everything else. Business models always drive technology. The technology is kind of already there. Super, really, really interesting. And I wonder, you know, I think we, we mentioned that, you know, 2050 and, and driving towards next year is hugely ambitious, but absolutely the right thing to do. I think there's probably unanimity about that. So I suppose, what's stopping us though? So what are, what are the key things that if, you know, you had a wish that say, I wish I could get rid of this thing that's in the way. So what are, are either the key enablers or the, are currently the key blockers that need to, to be got out of the way? Um, ben, I see you sort of staring up thoughtfully there do you want to do you want to have a go at answering that first then yeah i sort of um it, it's a good one i i, I can i sort of pre-answered it um in in a way but actually i'm let me just let me just take half a step back and go back to as you said earlier google and when i left google in 2011 exactly 10 years ago i think this month to start my own company fabric which i ran for eight years and um which took eight years to sort of become profitable and, and it's now growing nicely um, while well, I took up a new challenge, but I left Google because I wanted to figure out a way to bring Google scale to uh, to the outside world, you know, and the way that Google approaches internet and a billion unique active users per month and so on. I wanted to see is there a way with the right business model to bring that to to the outside world and to everything else. And I I can say I can say with with a high level of certainty that so far I've completely failed at that. I was ten years in and I've clearly not managed to do it by 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 some token. No one has really managed, but I also think, and I'm also convinced about this with some less certainty because I don't have full visibility, but that in this, this decade it will happen. And uh, because the market, the market is right, the market conditions are there, the market needs are there. You see exactly what's happening with supplies in the UK now. Um, that is actually, it's, it's not a good thing for a lot of people and obviously uh, costs and so on, but actually that means you need even more flexibility services. You need even more storage, you need even more systems thinking to solve. All of this and there will be people who will be making a lot of money out of this but it's also um everybody's now at the level where you start having significant assets in the market be that uh inverters be that batteries home batteries more large scale be that evs with vehicle to grid starting to become really interesting and people are thinking across you know beyond their sort of own own uh, event horizon and thinking about how they can can connect the dots but i go back to the business model i think 
it took me 18 months to get my head around here that there is a business model for us and for everybody to be happy. But now it's about rolling this out and scaling this out and talking in groups like we are here today, really with everybody in the room and figuring out how can we all make this happen if we connect the dots. Right. A bit of business model, a bit of system thinking there. Andy, any... Uh, and, of... and time, and time. It's taken us 10, 15 years to get here. So that, that comment earlier is very... <laughs> Excellent. And Andy, your perspective on sort of key enablers or, or key blockers that we just need to, to, if you like, blow through in order to, to get on with 2050? Yeah. I mean, apart from just get on and do it, um, which is like usually, <laughs> right. usually the answer. But um, I think uh, I'm also an engineer by training and, and quite often, you know, we want, you know, we like complicated things. And so we try and plan everything out ahead of time. But it's a really complicated system. It's getting so complicated that it's not solvable. And we can almost get this sort of analysis paralysis type thing where we, we just spend so much time in the go policy, et cetera. Whereas, you know, what uh, the ESO did with some battery providers as I mentioned last year was great. It was a good step forward. We learned a lot more than we would have done modeling it. And I think if we can get more of that, um, how do you solve any problem? It's what your parents told you. It's a big, complicated problem. Break it down into little chunks, <laughs> learn something, crack on. Um, so I think if we can move maybe away a little bit from engineering thinking and towards more design or product thinking, um, I think, you know, the software industry has scaled massively because of that. And um, we're technology enabled now. So, yeah, let's shift to that. Brilliant. Cool. And Lynn, on, on this particular topic, we'll give you the last word. <laughs> I think it, I probably echo some of my panellists. I think I put it into the context of my nana, eh, God rest her soul. We as an industry are trying to have conversations with humans and people and we each are people and we've all got different interests, likes and behaviours. So, so really where I see the key enabler as well as the key barrier, if, if we don't all work together and collaborate across all silos and sectors, is really making that compelling, attractive incentive of why people should care how we make it as easy as possible for them to use energy when it's cheaper and greener. Um, so I'm thinking if I had to have that conversation with my Nana, what that looks like and feels, um, it's for, in our interest to Andy's point to keep it simple. And to Ben said, in terms of getting all the systems and architecture in place. So really what I love to, to see is similar to the switch over to broadband, which was a significant unprecedented step we're going through that same industry transformation with them because we also need digital communications and transformation as part of this journey. So we really need to have that one message. I remember seeing the adverts on TV. Um, so really it's around that compelling community and customer proposition. Um, and I think it is changing. I will always remain the optimist. Um, I, I recently got an EV black cab journey or a green EV journey. And for me, having those conversations with taxi drivers that have chosen that electric car. And my brother was recently in Ikea getting some tables for his house. And you can go in, buy your stools and get your Swedish meatballs for lunch and pick up a uh, basically battery and solar solutions. So I, I do think at the moment it's a very topical discussion. But I think we need to convert that into something where, to Ben's point earlier, that value proposition is really felt and seen. And through that, we need to maintain trust. That comes down to identifying those inequalities or exclusions. We cannot lose trust through this journey because that will actually only uh, go in, in no favour for us to continue to those steps uh, to 2050. Brilliant. Thanks, Lynn. I, I think I'm going to, uh, might be on here later. I think I might go out and uh, offer your Nana a job, actually. I mean, it sounds like an eminently sensible person that we should have around. And listen, we're almost out of time, but I might just ask each of you for like, just your 10 second view on, on the recent pledge to go 100% renewables by 2035 in the electricity system. Your perspective on how achievable it is. Is it a good thing? How achievable it is? So just really, really quickly, because we're nearly out of time, we'll start, we'll start with Andy. Let's make it 2030, um, would be <laughs> my view. Um, and uh, we will, when, then if you look at 2030, we'll have put things in place better and we'll end up um, further ahead than, than if, we, uh, if we didn't do that. So, yeah, that's my Brilliant. view. Excellent. Lynn? Targets always get everyone together and with focus. So I think stronger the pace 
uh, and it's good to keep the mind focused. So, you know, all for it. And if we can get it sooner to Andy's point, then let's let's go for it. Excellent. Ben, you had the final word on this. I saw you giving Andy a big thumbs up there. So I think I know where you stand on it. JF, more. I only say one one word, one name, JF Kennedy. Um, think about going to the moon. You know, when he did his speech in 1961, it's not that they, they didn't have him in aerospace scientists, I can say this. It's not that they didn't have the rockets, they didn't have the propulsion system, they didn't have the launches, they didn't have anything. They didn't have the tools to build the product that they needed to take into the moon. That was 1961, 1961, we had people on the moon. It is absolutely doable. Just just, just have a target, make sure everybody's aligned and, and it will happen. And the whole, the whole 2050, I don't buy it. 2050 is way too late. Everything has to be 2030. Just stop talking about 2050. So crack on and just do it, I think is the, is the overwhelming message. From, the, from this panel fed back to, uh, to the prime minister and, and the government. So that's excellent. Listen, so it just falls to me to, to, uh, to, to thank uh, such an excellent panel that I've had. So Andy, Lynn, Ben, thank you so much for your presentation, your engagement and, and your insight. It's been really, really interesting and really do appreciate you making the time available uh, to, to join us here today. So at that point for everyone else, uh, we now, the conference comes to a break. So you have a break until 3.30. Uh, and if you could, navigate, I believe, to the RD Mobile Platform uh, webpage. Uh, we'll be back on at 3.30 where uh, Melissa is going to uh, lead a talk around enabling conditions uh, to reach net zero. So thank you all very much. Enjoy the break. And thank you once again to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, welcome back to the final session of Powering Net Zero, um, Enabling Conditions to Reach Net Zero. My name is Melissa Stark, and I look after renewables and energy transition services for Accenture. Um, throughout the day, we've heard um, through about enablers uh, mentioned in multiple sessions. In demand, we, we saw that um, demand is stepping up to, to play a bigger role in transforming our energy systems. We heard about the massive growth in renewables and infrastructure required. Um, we heard about the transformation of the um, integrated, the, the electricity system into an integrated energy system. Throughout all of those sessions, we heard that enablers are important. The right policies, the right incentives, the right environment, the technology and innovation required for that investment that was mentioned in that opening keynote, the almost doubling of um, the investment in the transition to flow. So the enablers are critical to provide the right environment for that investment to flow. So we're very fortunate to have three speakers, three distinguished speakers whose organizations are driving a lot of the enablers and making sure that they're in place. We have Geraldine Newton-Cross. Um, Geraldine, do you wanna turn on your video? who is the commercial director for the Energy Systems Catapult, who will talk to us about innovation and in R&D needed for net zero. For those of you who are not uh, familiar with Catapult, they have been a partner to the energy transition for more than a decade across the multiple catapults. Um, and the, um, the innovation and the technology development, as we all know, will be critical going forward. We have Sam Kimmins. Um, Sam, do you wanna turn on your video? Who um, is the head of the RE100. So this is the organization of more than 330 um, companies, grows every day. Every day I go on, that number grows. Um, of the leading corporates who are driving that energy transition, um, that climate group. So we'll hear from him on what they need to unlock the investment that they're willing to make as they've committed to 100% to, to renewables. And then we heard from Rana, Rana Adib. We'll also hear from Rana. Hi, Rana. Um, she is the executive director of REN21. This is the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st century. And Rana will talk about how we need renewables for a lot more than just the power um, and to be used in multiple other sectors and what needs to be in place for that to happen. So, so with that, let's kick off. I'm going to go to Geraldine first. So um, Geraldine, why don't you go ahead and share some of your views with us? Thank you very much, Melissa, for the introduction and good afternoon, uh, everyone in the audience. Um, so as Melissa said, I'm from the Energy Systems Catapult and just a couple of points for anyone um, who uh, doesn't know us. We work with businesses, academia, industry and government to help transition the UK's energy system to net zero. We do this by helping businesses develop, test and launch new low carbon products and services. We help public and private sector clients uh, decarbonize complex sites. Um, and we support local authorities and network operators like uh, Lynn we heard from, uh, transition places to net zero through local energy, um, local area energy planning uh, and associated tools. And we use a whole systems approach to identify the integrated changes required to create the vibrant markets we all need uh, for energy innovation. So it's from this perspective, uh, I'm gonna talk through um, three key enabling conditions I believe are needed to help us collectively accelerate innovation towards net zero. Um, and I think it strongly uh, continues to build along the theme from previous speakers we've heard. Uh, and actually I was reflecting that the um, downside uh, of speaking in the last session is that you actually find that most people have covered a lot of your points that you were planning to make. So I don't know whether Rana, Sam and I will all be in that, in that boat. But actually, I'm, I'm very heartened by that uh, because it shows me that we're all uh, very much moving in the same direction um, uh, towards common goals. So just to uh, move, move on. Um, firstly, uh, in terms of first enabling condition, I'm actually going to start by saying I don't think it's necessarily about asking for more uh, innovation funding. Uh, although I do recognize we're awaiting the outcome of the current spending review. Uh, so I may reserve my, my judgment on that, depending on what comes out. Um, but currently, key funding pots uh, look reasonable. We know that government has committed to uh, increasing public sector R&D budgets to 22 billion in the next few years. We know the Bayes uh, SICE innovation budget is over a billion pounds for, for the next four years. And Ofgem, working with Innovate UK, has also committed to transform 
its approach to innovation funding through the Strategic Innovation Fund. So instead of actually asking for uh, more funding, I think the, the one of the key enabling conditions uh, is actually to help research organizations and industry collaborate and coordinate to maximize the impact of the funding available. And again, this, this is a very similar theme to was uh, previously raised by uh, Harmeet uh, earlier. Now, whilst the total size of the funding pot uh, looks quite large, uh, there is a risk it gets sliced and diced uh, in delivery. Therefore, I believe uh, bodies like the Net Zero Innovation Board will play an important role in setting priorities across the innovation ecosystem to really help us minimize gaps and avoid unnecessary duplication. One of the areas that I think is often overlooked, uh, actually is a key enabler, but uh, it's an area I'm very passionate about, is the adoption of comparable and common evaluation uh, metrics and approaches. I think this is needed uh, both to accelerate learning and insight and sharing uh, the lessons from different innovation programs, but really importantly to also de-risk the private investment that we know is required for scale up and wider implementation. It's also going to help us understand the combinations, systems, integrations and interactions, and crucially the trade-offs that, that, that we're facing uh, of competing decarbonisation approaches. Lastly on this slide, I just flag a key enabler will also be around open data. Uh, ESC led the Energy Data Task Force a couple of years ago, which has led on to the Digitalisation Task Force, uh, chaired by Laura Sandis, and this delivered recommendations around two key principles. Firstly, we need better quality data to fill some of the existing data gaps. And secondly, we need to maximize the value of that data by making it open and accessible to innovators. And, and indeed, we actually heard from Lynn earlier uh, uh, that UKPN are already starting to make uh, some of their data open. And we believe these two principles will start to unlock the opportunities that a modern, decarbonized and decentralized energy system uh, will deliver for the benefit of consumers. So secondly, we need to recognize net zero is a whole system challenge. Uh, and by that, I mean, we consider physical factors like infrastructure and technology alongside economic, behavioral and social uh, issues. And again, what's really heartening is it's a, it's a term that has been phrased um, or, or used uh, considerably over the course of uh, the day today. Now we know that meeting the UK's net zero targets uh, by 2050, or even the 78% uh, reduction set in uh, law by the sixth carbon budget by 2035, is gonna require unprecedented levels of innovation across the economy, not just in developing new technologies, but in uh, new ways of deploying existing technologies, new business models, um, new consumer offerings, and new policy regulation and market design. However, the one thing to flag is we haven't yet seen an energy system transition strategy uh, published by government. Instead, certainly over the last few months, we've, we've had separate strategies and plans published around hydrogen, innovation, flexibility, digitalization, industrial decarbonization, uh, and transport, to name a few. Um, and the, the, the worry with that is that you can't actually really create policy in silos. It must be coherent and it must reflect interacting risks and opportunities. So there is a risk that that clear overarching view of how different elements fit together um, could risk confusing investors and, and hampering innovation progress. But uh, we know that the net zero strategy is uh, expected. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, that will help. For this reason, uh, we advocate for a living roadmap from government to provide a common vision and um, priorities, innovation priorities and clear timeframes for whole system innovation investments and outcomes. And in parallel to this, we believe that we need a robust and en enduring set of carbon policies and regulation um, in order to build the necessary confidence with innovators to invest in low carbon products and services and to ensure that market structures and market incentives are sufficient to pull through innovation uh, to adoption. Specifically, zero carbon choices need to be placed on a level playing field with their fossil fueled uh, equivalents. Now we produced this graph last year to show the relative effective carbon prices, so i.e. the price that results from indirect and direct carbon policies for various activities and sectors in the UK. And it highlights that current effective carbon price isn't always directly linked to associated emissions. Um, it's a bit difficult to see on the slide, so uh, you can find it on our, our website if you want to look at it in more detail. 
It also shows that most incumbent options are underpriced from an emissions perspective. And so again, this doesn't do anything to encourage users to transition to low or zero carbon alternatives. Finally, my third enabling uh, condition priority uh, is, is again, a very common one we've heard throughout today, which is really to ensure that innovation activities embed consumer perspectives across the whole value chain. Now, much of the decarbonisation efforts that we've seen to date have been what I call blind to the consumer. So all of the uh, efforts to decarbonise our power sector, uh, electricity is still electricity when it comes down the plug, or even if you look at uh, efforts to transform food production, Again, a lettuce is still a lettuce uh, when, when a consumer is buying it from a supermarket. However, we know that um, the average uh, UK household, the biggest challenge for a net zero future uh, actually relates to how people are going to heat their houses um, and it could result in significant disruption uh, in people's homes. Now, as you can see from uh, the, the couple of uh, graphs on the right hand side, uh, the solid line shows that the pace at which residential heat decarbonisation needs to occur uh, increased significantly with the adoption of the sixth carbon budget. So uh, decarbonisation of residential heat is shown on the right hand side, right hand graph, uh, and on the uh, left one it's uh, transport. So that pace of uh, change again means we need to massively ramp up our engagement with consumers to understand their needs and preferences. Um, and drive it back up the value chain into product design and installation. New solutions need to be good or as good, if not better, uh, than existing options. Um, so, for example, you know, people want to have heat pumps which look good and run quietly. And again, I was really heartened to hear just in the last uh, session the points around we need to get design thinking, um, uh, you know, more at the forefront than uh, some of the traditional energy uh, engineering thinking. I loved Stephanie's session earlier in the day and thought the poll uh, that was run was really interesting uh, that showed uh, we collectively on the call, at least today, believe consumer awareness and lack of transparency about real costs and benefits were the biggest barriers. Um, I agree, and this was a point I was hoping to also raise, uh, a survey we, we ran last year also flagged the need for quite a significant consumer awareness programme, uh, given that of the people we surveyed, 48% uh, were not aware that their gas boilers were actually a source of carbon emissions. They hadn't made that basic link um, with, with uh, carbon. So we, we feel very much that we need to ensure innovative businesses and industry can um, access rapid feedback from real consumers in real environments uh, through test facilities like ESE's Living Lab. This is a network of 500 plus instrumented homes um, across the UK which yields insights on how consumers you know, actually use uh, different uh, new technologies and uh, products and services and actually how the product uh, performs itself. Now, like uh, we've heard from uh, Joanne and actually uh, Lynn and others uh, today, um, we also need to ensure that innovation uh, focuses on a rapid and equitable or sometimes called a just transition for all through the, the development of standards and codes that uh, ensure consumer protection uh, or through the uh, development of products, services and business models for all consumers, including vulnerable consumers, such as the 13 million um, people living in the UK with a disability or the 2.5 million um, households living in fuel poverty. So that's it for me, just to kind of recap the three enabling conditions I would uh, definitely look to accelerate and advocate for is we make it easier to coordinate and collaborate on net zero innovation. We need a living roadmap um, to identify key priorities and timelines supported by appropriate market structures and market incentives. And we need an urgent need to put consumers at the heart of all innovation and R&D activities. Thank you very much. And I believe I'm now handing over to Sam. Or we could go to Rana next and then go back to Sam, just in case Sam is having um, some technical difficulties. Or oh, there he is. Okay, there he is. Great. Right. Hi there. Sorry about that. I was uh, confusion in Zoom on uh, on where the buttons were. <laughs> so thank you, Jerry. 
Um, so I shall quickly share my screen, show you the uh, um, So where are what can we see on the sh on the screen here? Sam, right now it's a blank white screen. That's yeah. good. Okay. <laughs> I shall press go there on this go. exciting and slightly um, uh, hypnosis-inducing slide. But uh, this is to introduce RE100, which brings together three hundred and well, currently three hundred and thirty, soon to be three hundred and forty-five of the world's largest corporations all committed to 100% renewable electricity. Um, we have to keep adding to this slide and working out new formats to, uh, to actually show how uh, to display all the members in one place. Um, I should go on to something a little bit less mind bending here, but to, together the electricity demand of those companies exceeds that of the UK. Uh, we're, we're currently topping 340 terawatt hours uh, combined electricity demand, all committed to 100% renewable electricity. And those companies are coming from around the world. Um, initially, RE100 was a movement that was focused around uh, the EU and, um, and US, with founder members being Swiss Re and IKEA. But we're now a, a truly global organization with um, recently joined by Ultratech Cement in India, by ASUS in Taiwan, SK Hynix in South Korea, and indeed the largest, second largest group of RE100 companies comes from Japan. So uh, a, a truly, truly global movement now. Um, so why are companies doing this? What does it all mean? Um, well, it's more than a sort of a big shout out by companies uh, looking for a leadership position. These companies for a start are putting their money where their mouths are and investing in renewable electricity. Um, initially, the reason they were doing this was because it was the right thing to do, but members are increasingly telling us that it's the right thing to do for their businesses, because quite simply, the, the cost of renewable electricity is coming down so rapidly that businesses see this as the future of their businesses to be powered by renewable electricity. They're not just saying it's the future of their own businesses, they're asking their suppliers in many cases to go renewable. So in turn, those suppliers are seeing it as an essential part of their, their future viability and future competitive, competitiveness. And increasingly countries are, uh, country governments are seeing this as both a benefit and a risk with President Tsai of the Taiwanese authorities recently declaring in her industrial policy keynote that the ability of Taiwanese companies to achieve RE100 is a critical factor in industrial, uh, in industrial policy. And the South Korean government included a pledge to allow, enable uh, uh, Korean companies to achieve RE100 as part of their manifesto and as part of the Korean New Green New Deal. And those policies are coming through. This is because renewable electricity is a win-win. Companies are investing in renewables because they see them as good for their business, they're saving them money, they're providing with them with cost surety. Governments are seeing this corporate investment as a great way of actually uh, you know, working in partnership with business to increase their renewables capacity. There is great progress, but we need to move a lot faster. We know that uh, we need around 12,800 gigawatts of capacity, renewable capacity by 2050 in order to reach our climate goals in all, in, according to IRENA. Um, last year, the record for installations was, I, I believe last year, 220 gigawatts of installed capacity. So year on year, we need to at least quadruple our year on year additions of renewable electricity in order to achieve that, that goal. And while a lot of countries have set broad targets, um, you know, around 50% of the global economy has set a net zero target, we need to look at what that means in detail to actually enable that target to be met. And in terms of renewable electricity, the RE100 members have set out six policy areas um, 
that uh, that governments need to take note of in order to unlock their markets for investment by corporates. Most of these deal with actually opening up of a basic market, introducing a system of, of tracking and tracing renewable electricity so that a company knows that they are buying renewables and that they have a unique claim to the renewability of that electricity. And measures to enable direct trade with renewable electricity providers, for example, through power purchase agreements and through uh, trade with utilities, through green tariffs, etc. And this message really is getting getting through. Um, the South Korean government has promised to bring in a, a system of power purchase agreements uh, to meet the demands of to, to meet the needs of RE100 members. And PPAs are becoming the dominant way that RE100 companies are buying renewable electricity around the world as markets open up. But also these measures look at improving markets that, that already have ways of trading renewable electricity, but need to be improved. And um, if, in order to achieve the pace we, we want to achieve, you can't just have a market, it needs to be a good market. And the UK, for example, you can engage in all these, uh, all of these activities, green tariffs, PPAs, uh, there's a great system of credible guarantees of origin for renewable electricity, but there's room for improvement. Um, and these improvements are things like, you know, reducing the, the time it takes to get a permit to, uh, to connect to your renewable installation to the grid, um, improving the, the, um, the permitting uh, processes, et cetera, to really accelerate the pace at which uh, these, um, these deals can happen. We're also working with the Indian government to look at how they can increase the pace at which, uh, at which companies can invest in rooftop solar, power purchase agreements, and all the other methods by which they're really helping to accelerate the renewable electricity transition. We're also working with the World Economic Forum on uh, uh, looking at a power purchase agreement system along with Accenture, how to improve the, um, the access to power purchase agreements and opening up markets to enable a huge acceleration in the deployment of renewable electricity infrastructure. So that's a quick gallop through the, the universe of, of RE100, it really is a huge opportunity to accelerate our, um, our renewable electricity future through governments working in partnership with business to really let the market um, drive forward this transition at the pace that it can if a level, level playing field is provided and a clear transparent market provided for renewable electricity. Thank you. Great. And for our third lightning talk, let's move to Rana and then we'll go into a Q&A. Rana? Um, Did you potentially stop sharing your screen? Then I, can... I am about to find, I'm trying to get my <laughs> Zoom back on. Hello, everybody. Very happy to be here. Excellent, thank you. Go on. So thank you very much. Um, I think it's perfect because Gary and Sam have really uh, built a key pillars on which we can uh, start on a positive note and learn lots of things. I would now like to step back a bit to underline how big the change and transformation is we need to handle and manage and address. And um, that basically these good experiences really show the way how to do this. And it's more about deploying basically those solutions. So um, I'm leading Region 1, which is the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st century, and is a community of players from industry, NGOs, research, and governments and intergovernmental organizations working together to make the shift to renewable energy happen now. So really making renewable energy the norm. Uh, we're doing this by providing crowdsourced information and evidence 
to inform the dialogue, the debates, and um, decision makers. And um, this is one of the slides uh, or the figures uh, we have shown or developed this year in the Renewables Global Status Report. And that had lots of attention because it shows very much that we have some myths that are out there. Um, renewable energy, and I think in particular the renewable power, has really shown how successful it can be. And this is exactly why the corporations are engaging here. If you have the right market framework, the technologies are there. It's very, sorry, very often a least cost option, et cetera. And this is the positive part you can see. The reality, unfortunately, is when we're looking at the overall energy system, and let's be honest, it's not only an energy system, it's a whole society and economy. This society and economy is centered around fossil fuels. And uh, from 2009 to 2019, basically the share and the consumption of fossil fuel and the total final energy demand has not moved apart of from 80.3% to 80.2%. And this today clearly means that the transformations we need to engage are much more radical than the ones, um, than what we thought. It's about obviously energy saving efficiency and renewable energy, but it is clearly also about moving away from fossil fuel. Now, why is this important? And I think this brings me to this next point, which is um, very important to keep in mind that electricity power is not energy. Energy is actually much more. We clearly see that there is um, a big trend of electrification of the energy sectors, of the energy demand. And this is a very good trend and uh, certainly a strategy to pursue. Um, now, the power sector, however, has been very much discussed from the supply side. And when we're looking at the demand side, we see that we're consuming more than 80% for heating, cooling, and transportation. And in the power sector, where we have a share of 27.1%, and where we know that more than 80% of the new install capacities for power production is renewable-based because it is least cost. Um, because it's resilient, uh, because the solutions are there, because the markets exist in many countries. Um, when we're looking at these other energy services or energy needs, unfortunately, the reality is not as beautiful. And even so, in transfer, we're at 3.4% of uh, renewable energy, in heating and cooling at 10%. Why are we in such a situation? This is really a result of lacking policy attention. And I think this is uh, why um, hopefully very soon we'll see uh, AWI, AWI 100 basically for electricity uh, and for energy um, because the right policy and regulatory frameworks are put in place. Um, because there is not only a price on electricity, but there is a, a price or levelized cost basically on heat on um, a kilometer of road transportation, whatsoever. So really the shift needs to happen from the supply thinking to demand thinking. And um, what is important here is basically something um, Gary has, uh, has very much highlighted. This, and, and which has been discussed today also, is really the center around the customers. So, when we are speaking about this transition, it's very clear that uh, renewable energy needs to become the new norm. And this requires building a societal support. And actually, this is like the equivalent of what we saw before on the energy demand and the energy services. Building societal, um, societal support means that there is a policy attention and the policy attention needs not only to be on making the transition happen in the energy sector, but in all energy consuming sectors. So this is one aspect. The other one is um, the market acceptance. Again, not only from the energy market players, but from all market players, from the finance world. And I think here are key levers, um, which can be activated even more strategically to accelerate the transition. And then clearly the community acceptance. Um, so the involvement of citizens, and I think what is really important here is that citizens are very supportive of the transition uh, globally, but locally we see a lot of pushback, and this can ultimately lead 
to um, key challenges in, in driving the transition, key delays in building the necessary infrastructure. I think only in the electricity sector, as, as Sam mentioned, was about uh, 1, uh, 12,800 gigawatt. Um, but this is only the electricity sector. Um, so it doesn't speak about uh, the non-electricity based heat and uh, um, also the non-electricity based uh, transportation. Now, what this means is clearly that there are many, many players who are today still very often not around the table when we're defining energy strategies. And I think uh, I'm really joining, uh, joining uh, some of the messages before. It is really about collaboration. It is about collaboration between the sectors. It is collaboration between the government levels, because when we are speaking, for instance, about driving the transition in the building sector, um, partly in industry uh, or for SMEs and, um, and in road transportation, municipal governments have a key role to play and the collaboration between national governments and municipal governments is fundamental so that they are really building on each other's strengths. It's also fundamental because um, it allows to really en embark basically the citizens in those transitions. Now, um, one of the challenges I think we still encounter is that we end up continuously speaking in bubbles. Um, the energy bubble is broadening, so this is a very, very good, uh, good news. Uh, we see the energy bias discussions, uh, strong demand side signals, um, industrialization, the role of renewable energy, for instance, in industry, et cetera. There is much movement here, but ultimately we find ourselves still in discussing basically the conditions, market design, et cetera, infrastructure, technical solutions, um, and so on. If we're serious about really broadening this transition um, into the broader society, and I think this is something which is fundamental because energy is everywhere, we really need to make sure that A, those players are participating in the discussion, but that we also really don't miss out on what is driving them or is potentially driving them in moving to renewable energy and supporting this. And I think this is something which I would say, uh, we're speaking about net zero here. Um, obviously, the climate context is a key driver for moving to efficient renewable energy based uh, systems and economies. Um, what we also see, however, is that making basically climate a driver for many decision makers is not that easy. So um, here's really the drivers we have identified clearly from the renewable side and where I think there are key levers is um, the clean air and healthy environment discussion. So WHO has just uh, defined new standards on, uh, on air pollution and uh, they are very, very um, restrictive. So it is also about using basically other regulated frameworks, discussions, political agendas ongoing to position basically the solutions we are striving for for climate reasons. Obviously, local economic developments, and again, I'm underlining the role of cities here, but they have a key role to play because 75% of the energy consumed, 75% of, um, of uh, the uh, CO2 emissions, 80% um, of the population is located in cities, and they are highly vulnerable to climate, uh, climate um, change. Um, and then discussions we have at the energy and or at the government levels, but about stable and secure energy supply. This is something which clearly also applies, for instance, to the energy consumers, corporations, industry are really looking into this. And it also echoes another part, which is about reducing expenses and managing energy costs. And when we're talking about the developing countries, um, clearly also the question of energy access and positioning renewable energy in the discussion of um, development, economic development and industrialization. So when we're thinking about what are key levers and probably also some challenges is how do we manage to understand what the agenda is of different decision makers that might actually not even engage or think that they need to engage in the energy discussion to um, see how we can position renewable energy here. But also the other question is how do we make sure that um, the shift and the energy transition is really becoming 
um, part of their own agendas. And this is clearly why Renton One is calling for, for making um, renewable energy, in particular the renewable energy share, a key performance indicator, not only in the energy sector, but in all economic and financial decisions, because ultimately um, it is important to put a price on pollution. It is important to also support positive impact. So there is really the underlying economic system that uh, values uh, or, or other values that need to be addressed. But it is clearly about driving the attention to the role energy and the energy transition plays in meeting broader sustainable development goals. And that's from my side. Great, thanks, Arna. I wanna pick up on your point about the KPIs, the KPIs in making renewables. Um, commonplace or incentivizing that in heat and in transport. So can you give us a couple of examples where you're starting to see that um, happen? So um, I can give you examples where we see that there is still a disconnect uh, to start <laughs> with, uh, because I think it's a, it, we are always astonished about this. For us, it's very clear the link between climate and, uh, and climate change and emissions, and basically the use of fossil fuel is so obvious. Um, and that we need to move to sustainable energy seems so obvious. And still we realize in so many NDCs, for instance, that energy is not at the heart of the transition. We can look at transport, um, at, at transport transitions, for instance, and um, we will see that the fuel switch part, which is, which is only one of the approaches and the strategies, but it's not really put at the heart of, uh, of the discussions or is. So as an example, the International Transfer Forum, the coming get together of uh, transfer players, renewable energy does not appear once in the program, not one time. And um, so what needs to happen is, uh, so we have two countries worldwide um, that for instance, link the electrification of the transport sector to the use of renewable electricity. So two countries. Um, this is uh, one possibility um, where you can clearly see that in the transport transition, uh, the use of renewable energy is integrated. I think it was um, Austria and Germany, and it's currently being discussed at the European level. Um, when we're looking into, into, and I think this is where, where, where are entry points? And I think there is a very clearly um, the energy bias community, ESG is a clear entry point where we also see that there is uh, main levers. So basically, yeah, there is a reporting about, uh, about climate. There is a reporting about energy. And uh, there is a very good uh, possibility to integrate this in, in economic thinking and a responsibility thinking here. Um, so this is very clearly uh, one of the next steps to come to streamline this and make it a norm in such frameworks. Um, what about for buildings? I think there's a question here from, from Mike about with buildings absorbing so much energy and the cost of retrofit, is there significant engagement in the building industry? Mm -hmm. um, and the policy and regulation of that sector, because that's one where you would think that the KPIs for renewable energy could be put in as part of some building targets or building standards. For instance, I, I, and I, so I, I, I think there are obviously there are examples um, where we're speaking about uh, uh, renewable energy targets with regard to this, but um, I think in, in the building sector, we have this, uh, we have different approaches here um, where we see that the approach can be like efficiency standards, uh, net zero standards or specific renewable energy targets. So I think there is, uh, there are approaches. However, we see that uh, only um, two thirds of new buildings basically are built uh, in countries with no uh, regulated mm -hmm. works on uh, energy. So I think there is, a, there is um, a, a real need to change this. Why is a target different than a KPI? And I think this is probably the part. A target is a good start, um, but it's only a start because it feels like we're going that direction. We need the strategy to go there and we clearly need uh, the implementing uh, frameworks to go there. When we're speaking about a performance indicator, it means that we are really continuously tracking whether we are on the right track or not. 
And uh, so it's uh, to avoid basically that in 10 years time, we'll look at a figure where the share of fossil fuel is still remaining the same. And this is something which is great to do at the global level, but it needs to be done at uh, a building level, uh, at the district level, at the city level, at the country's level, at the corporations, uh, et cetera. So I think it's, uh, there is a, a huge potential in doing this. But um, I think we can collectively basically kick this off as a movement and something to do to be on track. And, and with that, maybe let's go to Sam. And Sam, um, if you could turn on your video, I think I want to put this question to you because the RE100 and the 330 or 350 companies um, are a force for change. I mean, they have absolutely transformed the PPA market in renewable electricity. Is there discussion on their buildings and their transport and how they grow renewables? And what is the discussion? What is the discussion today? Where are they on that? Yeah, so I, the Climate Group runs uh, parallel initiatives, EV100 and EP100. EV100 is a commitment to move towards um, electric vehicles, as the, the name suggests, and dramatically increasing uh, electric vehicle fleets and infrastructure. And the EP100 programme is looking at energy, uh, dramatically increasing energy productivity, productivity. And a large uh, amount of that, the work in EP100 is led by the um, World Green Building Council looking at buildings. And there's a huge crossover between the membership of RE100 and the membership <laughs> of, um, of those two uh, those two sister initiatives. So, so yes, those companies are doing a lot in this area. I have to say, it it is a steeper climb on um, on energy productivity and buildings. It, it's slower going. It's more one by one rather than um, you know mass market. But yes, certainly there is there is work going on there. Electric vehicles again. It's simply about opening up the really about opening up the policy opportunities to drive forward what the market will be inevitably drive, be driving forward anyway. So, so Jerry, on building on what Sam and Rana were talking about, you mentioned that you were a little bit concerned about the lack of an integrated energy system living roadmap. So given this whole discussion about the integrated energy system, your thoughts, your thoughts on, on that and um, what we need to do to bring this all in the mix. Yeah, I think I think it's a, a key uh, risk, if if I'm honest, because I think, uh, as I said, you can't really uh, go forward with implementation to net zero in silos. Um, and to that reason, that's why uh, we particularly believe Pathfinder programs are going to be absolutely key to this. You know, we we have, as many people have said, we've, we've got a lot of the technologies, we've got a lot of the know-how, but we've actually got to, uh, I think Andy said to use the phrase, get on with it. Um, and I think we've really got to try and now start implementing this in one place uh, concurrently. Um, you know, partly, uh, as we've heard, uh, to protect consumers, to minimize disruption. Uh, again, you know, there's no point trying to tackle um, buildings separately from trying to tackle uh, transportation if it's actually gonna result in the same streets being uh, uh, dug up and all of that sort of stuff at the same time. So, so systems integration and having an integrated approach to not only um, the innovation that's required to deliver net zero, but the implementation of it is going to be really important. And, and you know, to that uh, end, really excited at the, at the establishment of the Green Finance Institute, because, you know, one of the key challenges is going to be bringing private investment in to this. Uh, it's, it's always interesting to try and raise finance for first of a kind um, technology implementation, let alone trying to do multiple in multiple uh, areas uh, in a particular place. So I think um, their focus on bringing global finance to uh, local solutions is, is really important. But government will also have a role to play here uh, in, in helping to de-risk some of these uh, Pathfinder implementations because you've we've got to get on with it. If we're going to do anything um, uh, in time for 2050 targets, uh, we have to do things uh, in parallel uh, at the same time uh, to, to, to really make sure that things work together and you don't have one uh, set of initiatives to reach net zero undermining or uh, disrupting another. You know, maybe building on that, we have another um, question from the audience and a super important one actually on industrial, let's say industrial. So it said industrial heat demand. 
but I can expand it to industrial electrification, industrial, because we, we're talking about buildings, we're talking about EVs, but you know, industrial um, consumption is also pretty huge, right? It's about 25, 30% of our global energy consumption. Can you add that vector or that segment into the mix of the discussion? Your thoughts on that? Maybe I'll go to Sam first because you're sm you're smiling because obviously <laughs> a lot of those 330 companies have plants. Um, your thoughts? And it's, it's very it's a hot topic. No pun intended for me at the moment. In that we we've, we've <laughs> actually just finished a workshop looking at exactly this. There is a um, this is the big gap. Um, at, as as Rana pointed out, I believe it was seventy percent in your um uh, of the the problem is is heat. I believe in your in your graph. Ten percent renewable. Mm. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's a huge huge untapped section, and it's incredibly complex. And you know the in the US there's the renewable thermal collaborative. Uh, we're establishing a a renewable renewable heat alliance between uh, over the climate group, uh, WBCSD and um, BSR, looking at how we can bring companies together on this. Uh, so the Renewable Thermal Collaborative, led by WWF in the US, uh, had their conference last week that we, we spoke at as well. There is a growing movement to build the RE100 um, type initiatives around renewable heat at the moment, but it is early days. And the reason it's early days is because it's incredibly difficult and it's incredibly diverse. And the climate group is currently working on um, on uh, steel zero and concrete zero, looking at how do you how do we use consumer demand to drive down the um, you know two of these key hard to abate sectors. There's a lot of disparate pieces of work. What we're looking to do is bring that together under umbrella initiatives, so we can actually track progress and really show how progress is. Um, you know, demonstrate that we're being impactful on the global scale that we need to be. And when I say we, I mean NGOs and business and governments. And, and Jerry, Rana, your thoughts on the same question, just to add, yeah. there was one more question added on to just from the, from the audience, is if you could broaden it just not on industrial heat, but actually all the hard debate sectors. So Malcolm said, can we like get their thoughts or ideas on Hard to, so marine, all of the other hard to abate sectors. Sam started to touch on that. So Ron and Jerry, your comments on that. Thank you. Just to build on what Sam said, mm -hmm. I think uh, he mentioned the word diverse, uh, diverse solutions, diversity, and I think this is really something to put at put at the heart of the complexity we're handling here. We're not speaking about one type of electricity, and obviously there are different grids and different standards, etc. But ultimately. Um, it is quite easy. The electric system is quite easy. And the electricity or the power generating renewable energy technologies are, so there, there is a complexity here, but ultimately, when you have the technology, um, it can be put everywhere where you have the resources uh, that allow to run this. And I think this is explaining why there is such a um, why the streamlining or the mainstreaming basically already took place in the power sector and is much more difficult to integrate in, uh, for instance, the heating sector and industrial solutions. Why we also see another complexity when we're speaking about energy efficiency, because the energy efficiency solutions are uh, much more diverse and will depend on, uh, on the local conditions, etc. Now, what do we see here? And I think um, it, it's really, so a, a first, a first uh, statement, I think it's great to see that the industry comes together and builds heating alliances because this will start giving a voice to the sector, a voice mm -hmm. to this energy demand, and also to the fact that we need to drive the transition here. Um, we, um, we're clearly working from right on one side very much with our transport colleagues to link things together more. And interestingly, um, there is good discussions, approaches on policy integration here um, in the transport sector. Obviously, it's easier in road transportation, where we see, however, that electrification plays a key role. Um, it's different on um, maritime, so shipping and aviation. That's also clear. For aviation, um, it's more about um, uh, synthetic fuels. When it comes to shipping, um, obviously, um, so renewable energy, hydrogen plays a role here, but again, 
Uh, it's very clear if we speak about hydrogen, then it's about renewable based hydrogen. And um, I think I would just like to say we cannot build a roof without the foundation. So it also means that if we are moving to a hydrogen economy for those difficult or sectors that are difficult to, uh, to transition, which, which we need to, uh, hydrogen clearly is an opportunity here. We need to build the renewable power capacities and the infrastructure to go with it. And, um, and um, then we clearly also see that the whole ammonia um, solution is something which is really an approach for, uh, for industries and also for some difficult transport sectors. Um, on the other questions, is I'm, I'm going to use this on the biomass part because we also see that biomass to some extent plays a big role when we're speaking about heating and also when we're speaking about some biofuels. Um, it is very clear that, uh, and I think that's something which will come for all renewable energy sectors more and more. If we're speaking about making renewable energy the norm, any technology does have an impact. It has an impact on human beings, it has an impact on the mm. environment, etc. So we will need to address sustainability criteria more and more for all sectors, because it will not only be about some uh, wind generating capacities, but massive infrastructure. So on the biomass part, is it renewable, yes or no? Yes, under certain conditions, it can be considered uh, being renewable. Now, there are clearly a global sustainability um, framework that are being um, have been defined because it is a, uh, a sector which has been struggling with sustainability a lot in the past. Um, but it's not a global answer. It's a local response uh, that needs basically an assessment that is important. Thoughts? Your third on the topic of the integrated energy system, the role of hard to abate sectors, and, and what are some of the, the, the challenges or considerations that we need to think about as we transition? I, I'm guessing that was to me. Sorry, I think you slightly cut out. Yeah, Jerry, that's you. Yeah, that's you. But, Sorry. No worries. Yeah. Um, so, so absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, work that we did through our innovating to net zero um, modeling uh, showed that, you know, one of the big challenges from going from our previous 90% uh, decarbonisation targets to net zero means that you absolutely have to tackle the harder to decarbonise uh, sectors. Um, uh, similar to what's already been said, you know, uh, looking at similar things for shipping like hydrogen or ammonia. Um, we know that obviously you've got to decarbonise industrial uh, sites. Um, and again, it's it, interestingly on that one, it could be electrification, it could be hydrogen, it could be a variety. I think there is a real role to play around uh, clustering industries to maximise uh, efficiency at particular sites. Um, and actually on that one, we're working with uh, Catapult colleagues, because again, you actually want to not just uh, look at decarbonising the input source, but you obviously want to make sure you're decarbonising um, uh, or, or improving the efficiency of the processes uh, that, are, that are going on in industrial sites. Um, but, you know, the real challenge is, is going to net zero. Um, and uh, our, our, our work showed that, you know, you do have to tackle lifestyle uh, changes uh, with consumers, such as diet, such as uh, aviation uh, reduction in, in, in kind of travel use and stuff. Um, but really interestingly, uh, we, you know, we've, we've gone into the discussion around uh, biomass, you know, with net zero, that's, that is one of the options that uh, I, I uh, truly believe should still be on the table with looking at how we reach net zero, because some of these harder to decarbonize uh, decarbonize sectors, you know, may never get to uh, uh, zero carbon um, emissions in their own right. We know, we know that's unlikely. And so um, the importance of BECS to deliver negative emissions is actually still going to be really key. And there's been a huge amount of work uh, done by uh, existing stakeholders and, and previous people to look at uh, emissions associated with different biomass production in different areas with different supply chains and, and, and all this stuff. And again, similar, Ron, I think, as you, as you indicated, you know, uh, if biomass is grown in the right place, uh, if it's the right biomass feedstock type um, and it's treated in the right way, then if you actually do use that to uh, uh, combine with carbon capture and storage, you genuinely can get um, uh, negative emissions delivered into the system, which allows us at a system level to, to, to reach net zero. So I, I think all of these things are really important. My worry is it, it still sort of sits in a quite hard to uh, progress box. And, and, you know, if you look at the importance of it for 2050, we really should be doing more to progress it now. 
I think your point on the industrial clusters is a really good one because it brings in the local point, the point on Rana's diversity, the mix of technologies, the systemic efficiency, and the ability to make kind of different technologies work together and find kind of the sum of the parts and actually just start, just start versus trying to do you know something really big. But it does definitely, this conversation highlights the integrated energy system, energy system challenge. Rana, you're jumping in. Yes, actually, I just thought like uh, this biomass discussion, I think also underlined that. Uh, so for instance, we, we rarely speak in the conference here about geothermal energy, even though, for instance, oil and gas players really see this as a transition possibility for their economies and uh, or economic activities. And it clearly can play a role uh, when we're speaking about industrial heat. Um, it's the same when we even speak about solar thermal uh, solutions. And I think this is probably a call for, we would not be where we are in the power sector um, had there not been uh, support for innovation, technology developments, um, market uh, creation, feed-in tariffs, auctions, et cetera, um, for a long time linked to industrial economic strategies. And I think when we're speaking about those sectors that are clearly lagging behind, that are highly dependent on fossil fuel and are struggling with, uh, with regard to the level playing field, um, this clearly requires a strategic policy attention. And uh, when we're speaking about technology innovation, I think there is uh, still a lot of potential for technology innovation in those sectors. We see, for instance, that solar thermal has started uh, finding lots of new applications, um, bigger sizes uh, for commercial and uh, medium term heat, for instance, which were not existing five years ago. And I think this is exactly where um, we also have different maturities of technology that need to be tackled differently. Right. And you know, we started the day with the customer. So I definitely want to ask my last question and to finish with, with the customer. Um, you know, it's come up throughout the day. The customer has to be at the heart of the transition. We need to be speaking to the customer in the customer's words. We need to be, you know, that that came up almost virtually every session, irrespective of what the session was. Final words, final words on what we can do better to make sure the customer understands the transition and really buys into it um, and embraces it and is part of it. So maybe two, three sentences, one sentence. Um, Ron, I'll start with you. Just one sentence. Uh, make sure that the customer, who is a citizen, economically benefits from the transition too. And uh, we have many countries, um, so I always like this quote of somebody in Denmark who said, like, in the beginning, a farmer was really critical about having uh, the wind park across the street from the moment um, there was a financial uh, support, basically, or he was financially um, involved in the benefits. He was really happy when the wind was blowing. <laughs> and she would probably also be. So just a bit <laughs> more gender balance here. <laughs> Gary, your sentence? Uh, my sentence would probably be uh, that, uh, to my mind, essentially, we have to increase the market pool from consumers. Um, and I think to be able to do that, we need to raise their awareness of the need for individual action. Uh, as I said, up to now, it's been a bit blind. I think we've got to make it much more desirable for them. I, I often wish that we had Apple or Johnny Ive kind of uh, helping design low carbon heating solutions for, for homes. Um, so I think I think that's really important. And we've got to make it easy. Uh, so I, I, I think there's a whole host, a, a link there to actually skills, um, especially when you look at uh, home decarbonisation. Um, we need turnkey solutions, not individual technology solutions. And, and we need people who are skilled to actually go in and, and, and help consumers make make transitions. So so I think lots of things need to be done to, to, to increase that market pool from consumers. And Sam, you represent 330 plus and growing companies yeah, or as so, closer to the consumer than, than all of us. Well, what would your sentence well, be? We are for, um, for us, the consumer of electricity is the company. Mm -hmm. And the companies are, I, I, I'm, I'm very nervous when we put the onus for change on the consumer because it's actually a small number of very, very large companies that are creating the problem and a larger number of slightly smaller companies who are the solution uh, to this. Um, uh, of course, there is consumer action as well. We need to make it easy for, easy for consumers to participate. But in order for, th there are a lot of leading companies who really, really want to be part of the solution here, really leading solutions. And we need to engage that ambition, what we call the ambition loop. 
we need to provide very clear KPIs that, that governments are going for, that companies are going for. Companies are setting their targets, you know, 100% renewables, 100% electric vehicles, et cetera. There needs to be a better conversation with between those companies and with governments to understand what will unlock the opportunities to enable to, them to invest in scale, at, sorry, at scale, in country, internationally, encourage their supply chains to move forward. Just making sure that that conversation is working well, because in the countries where we're working, where there is a conversation, a direct conversation between companies saying, we want to invest in renewable electricity, we'd like this. Government saying, well, okay, we can do this, so long as you act. And then you get this loop, this virtuous cycle of, of improvement. We need to really engage in that with the leading companies who really want to drive change. We I also need we to shut down the voices of those companies that are stopping change. Well, and I think COP is going to be a lot about that. So I think in COP, it's going to be really important that we hear the voice of those companies. I think we started, and if I thank our speakers here, and I'll wrap up the, the conference today. So thanks to Rana, to Sam, to Jerry for a fantastic closing session. We just go through the day and what we covered. We started with demand. And to Sam's challenge, we heard from Heathrow Airport and Glasgow City and Google about what the customer is willing to do. 24 seven carbon free, the green print, et cetera, right? So we heard we heard that the customers are willing. Harmeet just turned on his video. We also heard, we do not want the grid to be a bottleneck. We saw the massive amount of renewables in Tristan's slide. And then we heard Harmeet talk about, you know, 10 years is yesterday or today in grid time. So then we got a little bit worried. I think in the integrated energy system session, actually there was a lot of emphasis on enabling that distribution and that customer end. So that was heartening again, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we heard about st storage and batteries, but we also heard about the DSO changing, enabling EVs, enabling that customer change, and the tools that we're gonna give the customer to be able to, to automate it. Um, Jerry brought us back to reality, lack of an integrated live green print, which kind of worried, uh, worried us. Rana showed that we've got a lot to go in terms of transport and heating. But then Sam comes on an upbeat 330, we're ready to lead. So, so and I want to finish with that 330 and we're ready to lead. And I think that the COP26 is going to be really important because certainly, um, Harmeet, I don't know if you want to add some last words because I know you turned on your video, but I think the industry is ready if, if the, the demand side is also positive. Uh, no, just to, just to comment to, to the, the one that you picked up on, the idea was, of course, to, to one extent to, on the one hand, to kind of raise the alarm that it is, uh, it, it really isn't that long. If we talk about 2030 targets, mm -hmm. we practically know uh, more or less, you know, what kind of uh, large infrastructure grid projects are uh, coming. And, and the other thing to, 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 to make a mention is that I did emphasize that the technologies are there. So that's the good news. I mean, the question is how fast we can actually deploy. Um, and at the same time, you know, what is happening is the world is moving, which is why I brought really a global perspective. I mean, it's only yesterday that we announced that we will now connect Saudi and Egypt. Uh, so, you know, even the Middle East now started to, uh, to build long distance um, interconnections. And of course, this has been in the offing for some time, but it's now, uh, been awarded. So uh, all theaters around the world are now active. Um, and it's just a question of seeing how fast we can get things going. Right, right, right. And so with, the, with that, I'll close the Powering Net Zero conference. Um, thank all of our speakers that we had today. Um, and um, I'll let you all go. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Good Melissa. Job, Thanks, Melissa. Thank you. Well done, guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.